Semi-truck production at its Coolidge, Arizona plant says it started manufacturing its battery version of the tray on Monday, something they had talked about in the 4Q print. It's very exciting because if you remember initially they had that problem with the, um, the pushing the truck down the hill. But there were people on the board who always insisted to me that wait till you see what's finally happening. And they're very smart, good people. It's a, a really good board. So this is really positive to see. I mean, obviously we need uh, EV whatever. And uh, this in Rivian, we got some positive t uh, chatter about. Now we just need to find enough uh, of the materials that make batteries. That's true. There's actually a ton of EV news today, uh, mostly centered around the seven-day move in Tesla. 30% is more than a two-standard deviation move in Tesla last seven days. All I can think of is, is that I think they're going to crush uh, Mercedes and BMW in Europe. And it's it's the return of America as, a, as the power. Uh, I, I do think, by the way, that they, if you got enough of these, it would actually impact uh, Russia, but we're nowhere near. In terms of oil demand? Yeah. Yeah, energy demand. There's Tesla, though, hanging above a 1,000. Tesla's going much higher because this German plant is going to, I'm not kidding. I, you this German this. plant is right in the face of the so-called greatest, greatest country for autos. Forget it. Musk is doing it. He's dancing. Musk is dancing again. There's a look at the opening bell and the CNBC real-time exchange at the big board, natural gas producer Archaea Energy, at the NASDAQ, Alpha Tau medical developer of Alpha Radiation Cancer Therapy, celebrating its recent listing via SPAC. Overall indice indices and their movement this week, Jim, why this sort of moderate chop, uh, sort of indecisive, low VIX, right? In the I, face I, of a 10-year at uh, near 2-4. The low VIX is so intriguing given the fact that you have a NATO meeting with complete wild cards. You got people talking about weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons that might even waft over to Poland. Uh, and at the same time, it's kind of, um, it's a halcyon moment. It's very hard to understand. Uh, but I do say that there's just an upward bias that a lot of people find to be incredible. But I say, we have, we've had a terrible bear market in the NASDAQ. And now some of these stocks are inching their way back and people want to be in them. I mean, I was just looking at Blade. We were talking about Blade being coming into the summer where uh, they've got more airports and they're doing fine. Like, that stock is moving. A lot of the SPACs are moving up. So it's kind of like, hey, let's look at the detritus and see what's down a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, by the way, NVIDIA is going to be your leader. Watch NVIDIA. Because they really did tell you a lot about the total adjustable market being much better. And if NVIDIA keeps going up, that will be the bellwether for the group. Right. So mega cap tech, memes, and SPACs. Yes. Making, you think, somewhat of a stand here. Absolutely. I mean, look at Apple. It has not come in. Uh, Tesla is a mega, mega cap. Tesla's another bellwether. But uh, watch, you know, Metaverse, Facebook. If they uh, are able to do what I would like them to do with Jensen Wong, it, it, uh, I know that that's a, you know, kind of a world's collide situation uh, at NVIDIA, but they could have, the meta platform could be gigantic for them because that's what, that's exactly what Jensen showed off in his speech. Yep. So I like Mega Cap. I really do. Meanwhile, you got Google and Spotify uh. trying to work out this alternative payment plan through Google Play, which uh, JP Morgan today says could have positive implications for Match and Bumble and some of those names. Well, I think that they Spotify got what they, everyone was hoping to get from Apple. I thought it was very good for Google. That's another stock, Google. That stock, uh, Alphabet, is so undervalued. Uh, on a basis of just pure earnings back out cash. So I look at, at the NASDAQ and I think it may be
much more on top of the president would become more confident and, and, and comfortable with speaking to business people, because business people are much more of a force of change than he may realize. Uh, they're trying to do what's right on ESG. They don't fe they feel snubbed. They feel very snubbed by the president uh, and don't understand why the president doesn't want to sit down with them and talk about how to do good things. Right. Yep. That's definitely a, it's, it is a, a sea change from yes, the days really of is. the prior administration where you had uh, roundtables almost uh, weekly. Oh, uh, my, well, the pre that president yeah. was, you know, he, he was telling people that he's my best friend is my best friend is sure. and uh, people who didn't even know. Right. That's good. Uh, Darden today, uh, another miss along with KBH, comps miss, revenue miss. Uh, I guess, what, what do we make of some of these uh, consumer names that are less than stellar quarters? Well, you know, I, I thought that Darden actually, given the circumstances, did a pretty good job. I think that pe what people are afraid of is, is that these were the last good numbers now that uh, gasoline's going up. And D Darden used to, uh, when Mr. Otis was, was CEO, it correlated very well with gasoline. But I've got to tell you, ever since Gene Lee came in, if you're selling these stocks with gasoline, Gene Lee's very smart. And it, there's not been a big correlation with gasoline since Gene Lee became, became CEO. Yeah. Meanwhile, the, the futures curve for gasoline implies a return to three bucks by Labor Day, which I know nobody believes. And who knows, maybe it is folly. Well, look, it's like when you go and speak to these oil people about how, why aren't you drilling more? The first is, is they want to turn capital. But the second is they say, well, you look at the futures. They're saying by the time the oil comes to the market, we'll have ruined our, 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 our margins. So, look, I'm telling you, if, I'm so glad at this very moment that I do not run an oil company because those people, their heads are spinning worse than Reagan in the exorcist. And then, no so, green vomit. So though. what does it mean when California now is considering stimulus packages of $11 billion, rebates of 400 bucks per registered car, uh, free public transit, uh, postponing diesel ta taxes? <laughs> uh, a mad scramble to be able to, to uh, please appease uh, 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 any voter uh, look uh, the pump price is high uh, but the, have you been to the supermarket hey give me a give me a rebate on flank steak will you? <laughs> how about bacon if I can find some bacon I'm willing to pay higher prices you know there's a huge bacon shortage bacon shortage yeah, eggs are a problem now eggs yes. are pro We're going into geez. Easter it's true it's when true. I go to the supermarket I am grateful that there are still things on the shelves I went to a, you know, the dollar stores don't have as much on the shelves as they used to. Yeah. Candy aisle's still very good. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we're, we're getting used to a little scarcity, but we're nowhere near with the rest of the well, world. Well, I mean, you know, when you see, a friend of mine sent me a picture, didn't want to disclose, they sent me a picture of a Russian supermarket. Uh, nothing. I mean, it was in the, and it was in like the woman's hygiene aisle. I know, it's tragic. It's tragic what's happening to the supply of all no, kinds of No, it's like when gum. gum. Remember gum? Yep. There's super, supermarkets where they tended to have nothing. Well, nothing at Stalingrad. But, you know, I think Russia, at a certain point, will the people rebel? I don't know. You know, we get a lot of polls about how Putin's doing it. Not that, like, you know, who else is against him? But people keep saying he's doing well. But if you were, like, someone called you and said, how's, how's Putin doing? Would you say, look, I think he's not doing a good job? Or he probably kill you well i mean uh arguably the bulls take heart in reports of resignations of the climate envoy right. or that the central bank chief wanted to resign and they wouldn't let her well, that was very or some of the state tv anchors who were going rogue on air or quitting i know at the same time when you go and look when uh again i like to refer to when putin destroyed Gazni, uh the capital of uh, of chechnya because uh there were a lot of russians there too but he was he, he didn't mind killing everyone God, that sounds horrible, but it's true. And, and, you know, so you get into this, there were a lot of generals that disappeared who were ineffective. So there's, you know, you might want to leave if you disagree with Putin. You might want to take your yacht and go home. Right, before it's too late. Yeah. yeah. We didn't really mention the eco data. Uh, durables were a surprise drop, X-Trans. Yes. Um, we've, but we've had four straight months of durable gains, so we gave back 2% this month. Right. And, I, then, and then jobless claims... 187. Uh, it's just crazy. No, we did. I mean, someone was saying this morning on Brian Sullivan's excellent show that if they if a company opens a new battery plant, plant in Arizona, there'll be more jobs. And my first thing was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, please, no more jobs. We, we, please. We come back tomorrow. <laughs>
I mean, we, but, you know, I'm, look, we're in such a shortage that, you know, I'm part of Ollie's Army. I don't know if you guys know Ollie's, but they don't have enough stuff. They don't have supply. Ollie's Army is starving. I, I urge people to go to Ollie's because it's just a, it's a festival of, of mer merchandise from other places, and there isn't any. Yeah, you're referencing some of the price cuts that we've gotten. Oh, well, I mean, Ali, look, I, there's some weird stuff. I mean, Traeger did poorly, too, the uh, grill company. People are selling that right ahead of grill season. I don't know. I kind of like Home Depot here ahead of grill season. Christmas Christmas season for, Christmas. for HD? I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good gardening season. Uh, and I think that Home Depot is able to pass on prices very easily, which is rather amazing. The American people have yet to rebel against higher prices, which is why I think we can keep focusing on gasoline because it's so visible. Right. But when you go to these stores, the prices are the increases are phenomenal and people are still shopping. I mean, Home Depot, I think, is going to have no problem making the numbers. Right. Such That's, a good company. Yeah, still, there's still a well of money. There is a well of money. That, that is well put. The household level. And the, remember, people have big gains in the stock market, and they can sell stock to to finance anything. Yep, yep. Rich people can. I don't right. Know. Uh, by the way, a reminder, you can always get in on the CNBC Investing Club with Jim. Just sign up and find out more at cnbc.com slash join the club, or you can always use the QR code on your screen. As we go to break, got to keep check on the bond market and treasuries. We got commentary this morning from Kashkari. Uh, Waller as well today, Bostic, as we've been getting some of the hawk uh, commentary, especially from Bullard and Mestered yesterday, 10-year, 235. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. Rick Santelli here live at CMEHQ with breaking news. Our March preliminary read on S&P Global PMIs, manufacturing 58.5. That is the best since September of last year. And if we look at the services PMI, 58.9. These are well above expectations, sequentially following 56.5. And finally, the composite PMI, 58.5 sequentially following 55.9, so much higher than expected. And, of course, the preliminary nature of these means they will get upgraded in about two weeks. Now, we're going to go to Carl Quintanilla. Carl? Rick, thank you very much. Uh, Rick Santelli. We are keeping our eye on Brussels this morning as the president there, uh, meeting with some world leaders, I believe, along, uh, in that particular case, some of the leaders of Japan. Uh, the one headline crossing right now, Jim, is that uh, they are trying to prep NATO uh, for a more dangerous future, which is clearly evident. Well, you look, we've for years had a mutually assured deterrence where we just presume that Russia wouldn't do what we now say it might do. Tactical nukes can easily take out a quarter of, uh, of Kyiv, but you would say that the cloud would make it so that it could go to all over NATO. So NATO is... I think really kind of ready to make a statement that just says if you do this, uh, there will be real consequences. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, well, consequences is the exact word uh, that got used in a headline regarding chemical weapons. Yes. Uh, NATO leaders say that chemical weapons would bring consequences. Um, call again on China to refrain from helping Russia, which right. we talked about with Kayla, and then preparing for various scenarios of either a some accidental or intentional nuclear use or some invasion of a territory that truly provokes NATO. They have to do that. They have to do that. I mean, there's some fabulous books. Graham Allison wrote a great book, Essence of Decision, about what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where you know, their very strong president, President Kennedy, said, get those missiles out, or there's going to be consequences like you wouldn't believe. And, and I think that it's a President Kennedy moment, but we don't see that. Were you struck yesterday by some of the reports that sanctions on certain of the oligarchs were requested by Zelensky to be held off because they said they were seen as an avenue to some discussion, I, trying I to keep that. some communications open. I saw that. As, I found it intriguing. I also think that uh, we won't publish the names of the generals. I mean, you know, we publish the names of the generals of Iraq. I mean, these generals arguably are war criminals. Now, when you say stuff like war criminal, what that means is they could be tried because they're uh, attacking, they're destroying hospitals and targeting nursing homes and targeting playgrounds. I mean, these are not, this is not normal times. Most leaders do not engage in this kind of activity, and it is prosecuted. I'd like to know who, who we should prosecute. We talk about oligarchs, but how about generals? How about colonel generals, major generals, who are, who, who are pulling the trigger because you want someone to rebel against Putin? Someone. Uh, you do want to leave uh, some carrot out there and give them right? the hope that if they were to defect or turn tail, that they would be received somehow favorably, worse than, or better than the option they have by staying. Right. I mean, wouldn't you want, if you were a general, to say, you know, to straddle both sides and say, look, I, I have no desire to go to prison for the rest of my life. Let's moderate. But uh, I think there's such fear of Putin that that just doesn't occur. Right. We'll see if that, uh, if that dynamic changes. In the meantime, market's obviously going to try to uh, wrestle with all of this and trade within a certain range. We're still around 
S&P 4480 this morning. Let's get to Bob Pisani. Morning, Bob. Morning, Carl. Um, news out of Europe is still obviously the issue on the markets, but commodity play is still working, so energy generally higher. Those metal stocks generally higher. We've had the S&P materials sector uh, at a new high overall. Uh, tech's okay. The thing to watch is ARC, uh, Kathy Wood's ARC fund, because this is a real indication of general market trends since the Powell presser. Generally, they've been a big winner. If you take a look, uh, and I'm talking about since Wednesday last week uh, and Mr. Powell's press conference, ARC's up about 20%, believe it or not. But consumer discretionary energy technology, all up 6 7 8% as well. Uh, Powell seems to have convinced a lot of people that the Fed is going to be aggressive on inflation without derailing the economy. That's a pretty neat hat trick if he can pull that off. A lot of skeptics. But for now, the market's giving him uh, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, if you look at the market trend, though, there's some very interesting ha things happening in the last few days. So bonds have been down and stocks have been up. There used to be a positive correlation. Now there's not anymore. The volume's a little bit lower in the last few days. I'm not quite sure why. We had the lowest volume in a month yesterday. Institutional activity seems to be very low. There seems to be very low conviction on what to do from the institutions. But I keep hearing that there's higher activity from retail traders, higher activity on buybacks, and higher activity from the CTAs, commodity trading uh, advisors, uh, because they're the ones that buy and sell futures on momentum, essentially. So different people are in the markets for different reasons right now, and very interesting to watch that. Jim had mentioned Darden. Uh, I, I want to remind everyone, costs are a major problem, and I'm afraid uh, margin erosion might be a major issue going into the first quarter earnings season. Did you see, Dar besides they had a big miss, and their, their guidance was poor, restaurant-level margins, 19.4%. For the last quarter, the consensus was 20.7. Most of this miss here was due to much higher labor costs overall. So that's a very big problem. And you're going to hear a lot more about this. I'll say more about this next week. Uh, finally, just want to note, uh, got some questions about the Russian stock market reopening. Unfortunately, this has no impact on us at all. I was asked about these Russian ETFs to trade here in the U.S. Nothing's happening here at all. Those were only a small number that trade over in Moscow. I think 33 securities, and uh, none of them are open to foreign investors. One of the biggest ones, that Vanek Russia ETF, that depends upon Russian stocks that trade in London. They're not open. So the bottom line, in answer to people's questions, nothing is happening at all with these Russian ETFs. MSCI still has the value of all the Russian securities on its indexes, Carl, at zero. So that's going to be a big issue to deal with when and if these ever reopen. Carl, back to you. All right, Bob. Thanks so much. Uh, Bob Pisani. Let's get to Jim and stop trading this I mean, morning. I mean, never talk about Uber. I mean, I tell you, Uber's very interesting because, you know, they're signing up like regular taxi drivers, which is pretty good for their book of business. And I know that this is a company that could make some money. I, I, I talked about it last time on Squawk on, uh, on, on Mad Money. I, I look at this company makes money. The stock's going to go much higher. And this was a very positive move. And I thought the stock would be up even more, up more than 4%, because this shows you to do this nationwide. Uh, and next thing you know, every taxis on Uber, and that's just more money for Uber. Yeah, definitely going to help ease the friction with some of these municipalities, Yes, which has been going on for oh, years. Oh, enough already. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm inclined to think that that's it. When, when I talked about the stocks that are starting to make a bit of a comeback. Now, not everything's coming back. I mean, if you're really losing a fortune, no one's buying your stock. But there are uh, some of these stocks people are looking at again. That's why this NASDAQ's a leader here. Uh, it is the one index that's uh, up for the week. We'll see if it can hold. What are you going to tackle tonight? Well, I tell you, I have Agco, which we're going to talk about. You know, this is the amazing, amazing ag complex. And the Mike Siebert, and your team up, when is he going to start moving again? He's going to hate that I just said that, but I don't care. By the way, Verizon's back to 50. Yeah. It's uh, trading with the long bond. I think it was key yesterday, up Timo on uh, best in class 5G yeah, network. Yeah, some 5G. That was an interesting piece that it mattered. Uh, I, I think that it's the stock could go higher. Uh, and I'm also, I'm really fixated on GME and AMC because not unlike Braveheart, hold! <laughs> we got, there was better action in GME again this morning. They have to come in and buy it. This is ridiculous. How, you, if you don't manipulate a stock every day, what's the point? <laughs> well, we'll see you at 6, Jim. Uh, good hour. Uh, Mad Money, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll go to break here. We'll continue to watch uh, developments in Brussels as the president makes his way around town and to Poland tomorrow. Dow's up 128.
Good Thursday morning. Welcome to another hour of Squawk on the Street. I'm Carl Quintanilla with Morgan Brennan. David Faber has the morning off. Markets uh, trying to ride this wave of news coming out of uh, Brussels in the NATO meeting. More Russian sanctions, uh, halting Russian gold transactions, more humanitarian aid, the U.S. taking in some refugees. Pretty moderate chop here this morning as we continue to tread just south of 4,500, Morgan. Well, we're 30 minutes into the trading session. Here are three big movers that we're watching. We're going to start with Darden restaurants missing on earnings. With revenue and comp store sales also below analyst forecasts, the Olive Garden parents uh, saying that the Omicron variant significantly impacted demand. Shares are up a little bit right now, up about half a percent. Plus, Nigola shares are soaring after announcing that it has begun production of its first battery electric semi-truck. We're going to have a lot more on that story a little bit later this hour, but you can see up about 11 percent right now. Finally, Uber shares getting a boost to reaching an agreement to list all New York City taxis on its app. The company's first citywide partnership in the U.S. Shares of Uber are up 4 percent. I mean, this was like unthinkable just a couple years ago, Carl. It's interesting. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, nice turnaround here from uh, the early morning action on Uber, which we'll talk about in a bit. As we said earlier, the president meeting with world leaders in Brussels amid the Russia-Ukraine conflict. A lot of news regarding humanitarian, economic, military response. Our Kayla Tal, she's there live with the latest. Morning again, Kayla. Good morning, Carl. The G7 leaders are meeting at this moment, gathering just a few minutes ago, discussing new actions against Russia as the White House unveils a new round of sanctions, uh, levying new actions on Russian lawmakers, the chief of its largest bank, and also uh, sanctioning uh, the, the transactions that the Russian central bank uh, was attempting to make in gold. Uh, of course, that is one way that the market had been potentially expecting that Russia could try to evade some of those sanctions. The U.S. today clarifying that those transactions are banned as well. In a press conference just a few minutes ago, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg uh, making some interesting comments uh, about uh, the speech that we heard earlier this morning from Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, his claim that Russia had used phosphorus bombs. Uh, Stoltenberg did not comment on that claim specifically, but he did say that NATO has activated its own defenses against chemical weapons and is providing support to Ukraine. Listen. Allies agreed to supply equipment uh, to help Ukraine protect against uh, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear threats. Uh, this could include um, uh, detection uh, equipment, uh, protection and medical support, as well as training uh, for the uh, contamination and crisis management. President Zelensky has asked the West for military planes, tanks and missiles in his virtual address. He asked NATO leaders for 1% of the thousands of tanks and aircraft the member countries currently possess, equipment many nations have been reluctant to provide because of the potential to be seen as a provocation. A senior administration official says there are discussions ongoing to provide anti-ship missiles to Ukraine. No word on when that could get formally announced. Morgan? We'll be watching for that. I mean, Kayla, the use of phosphor phosphorus weapons, which are illegal on the world stage, very, very worrisome. The calls and concerns around the use of chemical or biological weapons or even potentially nuclear weapons, which have become smaller, less powerful, uh, something that could blur the lines on the battlefield if they were to be deployed by Russia. I, I know that this is a part of the playbook that's being very closely and intensely discussed and negotiated among all of the NATO leaders. Are, are, are you expecting that we're actually going to hear more details about what that playbook could look like? Heaven forbid any of that were to happen. Well, certainly it has been the pattern that the administration, the Biden administration specifically, has been moving quickly to declassify information to be able to share it on the world stage so that there is uh, almost radical transparency about what the Russian regime is trying to plan. So far, when it comes to chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, these weapons of mass destruction, uh, there has not been the same level of detail about those plans, though world leaders continue to say that it remains a very real and grave threat and that just look at uh, the type of actions that Russia has been engaging in of late by uh, essentially accusing Ukraine of using chemical weapons, that all of that uh, essentially is part of the Russian playbook to point the finger at Ukraine uh, and to potentially launch an attack of its own. Kayla Tausche, thank you. Turning back to the markets.
Our senior economics reporter Steve Leisman is monitoring some big speeches from Fed leaders this morning. And Steve, what has been a particularly big week in general full of Fed speak that is just decidedly more hawkish. Uh, yeah, a lot of speeches and, and the speeches today and since the last meeting, uh, Morgan, underscoring that the most endangered monetary policy speeches may be a Fed dove. The former doves have now transmogrified into hawks and the hawks now occupy the center at the Federal Reserve. Uh, case in point, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, he recently penned a piece last week explaining why he was wrong about his benign inflation outlook. He's saying today that his views have shifted dramatically over the past six months. He said he has now penciled in seven rate hikes this year or in line with his colleagues and sort of in line with the market right now. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans also talking today. He was similarly more reluctant to hike rates, saying today that the Fed's recent 25 base point rate hike is the, quote, first of many. He suggested his own forecast is in line with the 275 to 3 percent by year end 23, 2023 of his colleagues, and he supports balance sheet reduction. So let's look at how the market is priced relative to both these Fed officials. You can see they're more or less in line. The Fed's fund rate seen topping 1 percent this summer, rise above 2 percent by year end. So there are actually eight hikes built in if you do the counting by 25 basis points. Another hike is built in for February. That would bring the short rate to 240 or right around the Fed's neutral rate by February 2023. So in a separate speech, Fed Governor Chris Waller, he focused on housing. He's one of the more hawkish Fed governors out there. He told us last week he wants to hike 50 basis points in May. Today, said he sees long-term upward pressure on housing prices and he's watching real estate prices closely to gauge monetary policy. So one way to read that, if housing prices don't behave and cool, Waller might favor even higher rates. Carl? All right, Steve, we'll keep an eye on that. As you said, a lot of Fed speak uh, all week long. That's our Steve Leisman. Uh, before we get to our market panel this morning, just some quick pictures of the president here as uh, the live pictures roll in from uh, NATO meetings, the family photo earlier today, uh, meeting a moment ago with uh, UK Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson, uh, who did say this morning, uh, tried to reiterate that uh, the UK is not dependent on Russian gas, even though they do import about 9% of their fuel uh, from Russia. And we'll continue to keep an eye on the president ahead of uh, a uh, press conference later on today. Let's bring in Wells Fargo Investment Institute's Tracy McMillan and BNY Mellon's Wealth Management, Alicia Levine. It's good to see both of you. Uh, Tracy, I just wonder, you know, Steve comments about uh, the hawkish Fed, how the doves are uh, becoming more hawkish, and yet we continue to chop around here. Um, how long can that last? And, and it, is it earnings that need to come to the rescue? Yeah, so earnings season does start in a couple of weeks in earnest, and so far the forecasts have been pretty stable. Um, obviously, what we're going to be watching for in those earnings commentaries are things like, um, you know, how much pricing power are companies maintaining? Are their margins holding up? And, you know, one thing that we have noted when we look back in history is that the S&P does tend to be positive uh, 12 months after the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates. So that does give some support to continuing to hold equities in allocations here. But we are becoming more cautious. Uh, so, and, and, and so it, becoming more cautious means what? Uh, you're reducing your... So, yeah, what that means is that we're, we're becoming more cautious in both equities and fixed income. Within equities, we are becoming uh, more quality oriented and we're moving away from some of those higher beta asset classes like emerging markets and small caps towards those higher quality asset classes especially in the United States, like large caps and mid caps and within fixed income, you know, staying toward the shorter to intermediate part of the curve and away from the longer part of the curve where, you know, inflation rates um, and interest rates do have more impact. Alicia, I'll put the same question to you, especially given the fact that the S&P has been largely range bound. What is it going to take to see any kind of breakout, by the way, in either direction? Uh, for stocks and the argument that stocks are an inflation hedge. Do you buy into that? So look, l let's just start with the fact that more than half of the trading days this year in 2022 have been moves of 1% or higher. And of those, more than half of those have been to the downside. So it's been a very rocky start to the year. If you compare it to last year, only 20, uh, only 25% of trading days were 1%. So it's a rocky start to the year. We expect the volatility to continue the rest of the year. 
The range is going to hold, we think, unless there's resolution kind of one way or the other, difficult to call. I think that the 6 to 7% bounce that we got in the S&P was largely due to, um, you know, selling out of, of bearish positions in January and February. And I think we really have to take to heart what we're hearing from the Fed this week, starting with Jay Powell on Monday, where he essentially said it's going to be 50 in May. Um, and the question is, how does that reprice the curve if it happens? And does that open other meetings to 50 or even higher? And, and I think the market has not quite reflected that much yet. So we've taken the first blow. It was it was affected by, by Ukraine and Russia. But the stalemate that everybody's talking about means mm. sanctions last longer and oil stays higher longer and food commodity prices stay higher longer. And all that's going to work its way into the inflation number. Yeah. So, so what do you buy here? What do you steer clear of, Alicia? Yeah, so look, we, we, we sold out of our consumer cyclicals several months ago. We're in a rate hiking cycle. We believe the Fed and what they're saying. And, and we like the CapEx cycle here, both on the hard asset and, and, and actually the tech side. So we'd be investing in, te uh, um, in CapEx. We do like energy here still simply because there is a supply shortage, which is not going away anytime soon, even if there's a deal. Even if there's a deal, you know, energy weaken a little bit, and then we think it moves higher. So we think that's okay. And we think industrials, materials here are fine. We like consumer discretionary, but only in services, not in goods. So we'd be very cautious on the good side, as most you know, consumers last year really overbought on the goods, and the payback is here now. But services, we think, are still fine. Yeah, we're going to watch for that wallet shift, which has been slow in coming, but we're hoping this one's real. Finally, uh, Tracy, I, I, on a separate note, your note about women in investing is pretty interesting, especially the degree to which women are having a more active voice at the kitchen table regarding their income and their investment decisions. That's right. Yeah, women are having, um, a, they're taking on a much more active role in family finances. So that, that encompasses everything from being, you know, the major breadwinner in the family to things like having their own investment accounts, managing their own investment accounts, and taking on more responsibility of managing the families. But, finances. Um, and one of the things that it was interesting to find was that even though they are taking on these additional responsibilities, they are um, feeling like they're getting left behind in terms of their um, retirement accounts, so fully funding their retirement accounts. The, and the worry is um, really well-founded because they do earn less on average than men, about 84 cents to every dollar, so they're earning less. They typically start with lower salaries, and they typically take um, some kind of career break, or they're more likely to take a career break for care caregiving um, with family members. And that can have a very significant um, price when it comes to the amount of savings that they have in their retirement account. So we think that's why we're seeing that differential. Yeah, and the, the, the way in which they trade, uh, their level of optimism and risk, uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, Tracy, Alicia, appreciate it very much. Good to talk to you both. Thank you. Some big cap tech stocks like Apple and Tesla continuing to climb higher, and our Dom Chu is tracking those moves for us. Hi, Dom. Hey, so Morgan, so that discussion we just had with Tracy and with Alicia about that kind of intersection, if you will, about consumer discretionary and technology is certainly playing out in some of those mega cap names that you're talking about. If you take a look, though, at some of the trading action that we've seen as of late, one of the things that we are keeping a close eye on is what's happening, first of all, in company-specific headlines, namely with Spotify and Alphabet. We saw headlines coming out yesterday that Alphabet, the parent company of Google, is going to let some app developers, at least in a pilot program like Spotify, try their own in-app kind of payment engines kind of circumventing some of the bigger ones that we've seen from the likes of an Al Alphabet or an Apple as well. So Spotify now down about 2.5% in trading. Alphabet just up fractionally right now. So payments deals, certainly a focus here. You mentioned the uh, uh, Apple and the Tesla trade. Both of those stocks, we'll start with Apple first of all, because the move that we've seen on a year-to-day basis is still negative. But this right here is an eight-day win streak right now with a half a percent gain today. During that span, we're up about roughly 14% during that winning streak. So certainly a dip being bought in Apple shares. We'll see if that continues. On the Tesla side of things, a similar story. 
And I would say with Tesla, it's even more pronounced because we, again, are working on this eight-day winning streak here, and we're up roughly 32% during that winning streak. So as people bought the dip much more intense in places like Tesla, it's up about one quarter of 1%. And by the way, it's not just Tesla, guys. It's all of the electric vehicle space. It's Nikola on headlines today. It's Fisker. It's Lucid. You name it. They're all up higher, so we'll keep an eye on those. And then, by the way, if you take a look at some of the big moves that we've seen over the last week, some of the more volatile spaces that we've checked out, look at what's happening with cybersecurity, cloud computing, and the Chinese internet stocks. Over the last week, they're all up between 4 and 5%, even though some of those big names like Pinduoduo, Netties, and others are taking a break today. So, Morgan, as we talk about some of the moves, keep an eye on cybersecurity, keep an eye on cloud computing, keep an eye on these Chinese internet stocks. They have been some of the bigger movers and swingers over the course of this market volatility. Back yeah, as, as evidenced in that chart right there, Dom Chu, thank you. We're going to head to a quick break. Here's a look at our roadmap for the rest of the hour. Moderna announcing some new developments during its vaccine day. We've got those details. We'll hone in on the housing market amid rising interest rates and, of course, KB Home with that earnings miss. And Rivian and Nikola both on the move, as Dom just mentioned. We're going to tell you why. More Squawk on the Street is straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. Big day for Moderna today, hosting its third annual Vaccines Day, announcing some new developments. Our Meg Terrell caught up with their CEO and joins us with more. Morning, Meg. Hey, Carl. Well, the Vaccines Day is going on now. They're running through this big pipeline of mRNA vaccines uh, that they're working on across disease areas. Uh, a couple different focus areas. One, of course, is respiratory diseases. Obviously, with COVID, what's going on now? The kids uh, vaccine news that we got this week, in addition to what's going to happen with fourth doses and the next generation of COVID shots. Uh, also, some new data on their flu vaccine, which they say could be, quote, potentially superior 
big question there is, is it going to be tolerable? Are people going to want to take this every year? That is still something that investors are asking about, and we're seeing the data emerge on that. Ultimately, they say they want to combine COVID and flu, along with potentially RSV, another respiratory virus, uh, into a sort of trifecta of a vaccine that can protect against all three. They've also announced this week that they are developing a vaccine against four common uh, respiratory viruses, essentially the human coronaviruses that are endemic, uh, this would just sort of be like a common cold vaccine. They note that this does cause a lot of problems for the elderly and the vulnerable, ultimately potentially combining all of these into one big respiratory protection vaccine that folks who want to avoid that uh, could take annually. We talked with Stefan Bunsell, the CEO of Moderna, this morning about the moment we're in right now, what we're seeing with BA2, this Omicron subvariant, and the CDC warning yesterday that we're already starting Starting to see hospitalizations tick slightly higher in the Northeast. Here's what he said about that and the potential need for a fourth shot. Those numbers, I believe, are massively underreported because of home testing. And a lot of people are also asymptomatic. But if somebody at risk that has been uh, vaccinated a long time ago gets now infected with BA2, they are potentially going to be hospitalized. And that's what we all want to avoid. So I think it's very wise to get ready for a fourth dose in this spring for people at high risk. And of course, Moderna has filed with the FDA for that fourth dose for everybody over 18, essentially suggesting the CDC may want to decide for whom it's appropriate. We're going to see the FDA meet uh, not to review any specific application, uh, but to talk about this more broadly on April 6th. Uh, meanwhile, guys, Moderna did raise uh, the expectation for what it's going to bring in in COVID vaccine sales this year in terms of signed agreements now up to $21 billion from $19 billion, they said just a month ago. Still, the U.S. has not placed an order for the fall. That's a big question as well uh, when Congress, of course, has not yet allocated more COVID funding. Morgan? Meg Charles, thank you. As we head to break... Watch shares of Oshkosh Corp higher after the U.S. Postal Service placed a new order for 50,000 next-gen vehicles. This is valued at $3 billion. 20% of that order will be electric vehicles. Shares of Oshkosh are up 1% right now. They're down about 4% so far this year. But keep in mind, Oshkosh is also a defense contractor for things like armored vehicles, as well as an EV play on the commercial vehicle side. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
Time for our ETF spotlight. It's been a slippery slope for the S&P Home Builders ETF, ticker XHB, down more than 20% for the year. Shares are slipping further on that data we got yesterday that new home sales fell in February, second straight month of declines. Now today we got KB Home pulling the group lower after reporting a quarterly miss. The company says it's been dealing with supply and labor issues, obviously, that impacted its ability to complete construction uh, this quarter. Share is currently down about 2.5%, and they did say we... We knew that supply chain wasn't going to get better, Morgan, but we did not expect it to get as worse as it did, especially uh, during Omicron. Mm. Definitely some key comments uh, for investors to, to take note of. Well, we're going to stick with the housing market because new home sales falling yesterday despite high inventory levels, average home prices topping 500000 That's a record. Mortgage rates also up, causing some econo economists to predict a housing slowdown. So joining us now, Realty Holdings CEO and President Ryan Schneider. Ryan, thanks for being with us today. I mean, Realogy oversees quite a portfolio of uh, real estate brands. And so across different price points, across different markets here in the U.S., as you do see mortgage rates climb back above 4% very quickly right now, and home prices continue at these fiery increases, what do you expect in terms of how that scenario evolves through this year? Well, first off, Morgan, thank you for having us. Um, you know, look, when we look across what we're seeing with Sotheby's International Realty, Coldwell Banker, Century 21, and, and many of our other brands, um, what we're actually seeing is demand is still incredibly high for homes. Um, and, uh, you know, and we are seeing the mortgage increase you talked about put a little bit of a damper on home uh, resale purchases and sales. Uh, but the really high demand still seems to have sales higher than they've been for like the past decade or so. So we expect in 2022, there'll be fewer units sold than 21, but the 22 number is probably going to be higher than say 2010 to 2019 was. Um, and then we also expect the increased prices that you continue to see given that supply and demand imbalance. So where do you see that demand continuing to be the most robust? Is it the higher end of the market, given the fact that we know first-time buyers, for example, are getting priced out and there's affordability issues, as well as investors competing for some of these properties? Um, well, you know, the demand's pretty strong across all parts of it, even with some of the issues at the, at the, uh, uh, the first-time buyer level. That's the place also where the inventory is the least and the competition's the highest. And so the supply demand mismatches is, is almost the biggest. What I would say is, you know, the uh, ch the positive trends in the attractive tax and weather destinations show no sign of slowing. You know, the markets of Texas and Florida and Arizona and Idaho and others continue to benefit not just from the demographic demand, but from the remote work and some of the other trends that are going on out there. And then New York City's actually had a nice comeback in the last few months. Clearly, the market hardest hit by COVID from a housing standpoint um, has really come back in the last few months and we're seeing strong demand there. Um, but again, I think units will be below where they were in 2021, but above where they were for the decade before that. I wonder if you think, Ryan, uh, that migration you talk about uh, to some of those growth states is topping out, uh, has any chance of reverting to the mean, especially Maybe employers get a little more aggressive about saying, uh, yeah, sure, you can move to a different town, but we're going to cut your pay. Uh, things like that that might bring us back to somewhat more of a picture that we saw pre-COVID. I don't think it's going to be possible to sustain the momentum we have on this forever, right? But it has been really strong momentum now for literally about two full years, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing in these really attractive markets um, you know, so far here in 2022. I think the employer choice that you talk about is an important one. You know, as a company, we're leaning all in on remote work for our employees. And I think the more companies that do that, the more that trend is going to continue. Um, at some point, it's got to slow down, I would predict, but we sure haven't seen any signs of it slowing down yet. And just finally, uh, your take on inventory and how the mix of inventory is going to I guess, grow and shift over this year. Carl was just talking about the, the sell-off we've seen in home builders and names like KB Homes that are experiencing supply chain issues and labor inflation right now, which is pricing out to those potential home, home buyers. How is that going to affect the mix of, I guess, new homes versus existing homes and what those price points look like coming into the market? Well, let me make two comments for you on this. So the first comment is, keep in mind in, in at least the resale part of the market, you know, inventory and supply are two different things, right? The inventory is incredibly low right now, 
But as I said, we actually sold more homes last year than any time in about the past decade. And so the homes are there, they're actually selling, they're just selling so fast that there's very little inventory mm. because of the supply and demand side. The other thing we're expecting for this year, and we've told our investors this, is a return to seasonality. You know, COVID in 2019 really messed up the housing market. Q1 of 2021, excuse me, COVID in 2020, Q1 of 2021 was a huge quarter for the housing market. That's very atypical. And what we're seeing this year is what we call a return to seasonality. January being probably the smallest month of the year, you know, March being bigger than January and February. Um, you know, more people putting their home on the market in the spring selling season and there being a fall selling season. So the biggest thing we're seeing change here is we think kind of that return to seasonality, hmm. um, which hopefully will actually help a bit on the inventory issue. Interesting. A post pandemic normal or I guess return to normal. Ryan Schneider, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us, Morgan. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk with uh, one of the country's largest private oil field service companies on the spike in crude, although we can see it's down almost 2% today, back to 112, uh, despite some of the inventory data earlier in the week. We're back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. I'm Rahel Solomon, and here is your CNBC News update at this hour. The U.S. and the G7 nations are expanding sanctions on Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine. The new measures target dozens of defense companies and more than 400 Russian elites, including members of its parliament. The G7, meantime, says that it will restrict gold transactions by Russia's central bank. And the U.S. also saying that it will accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees fleeing the war. It's also going to provide a billion dollars worth of food, medicine, water, and other supplies. Ukrainian President Zelensky telling NATO leaders that Russia used phosphorus bombs today to kill both adults and children. He did not, however, provide proof of the bombings, which would be illegal under international law. And while many world leaders meet in Brussels, North Korea has tested an intercontinental ballistic missile, Japan calling it an unacceptable act of violence. It's the first such missile test since 2017. The U.S. and South Korea are calling for a decisive response. Carl, I'll send it back to you. All right, Rahel, thank you very much. As we said before the break, crude oil down about 2% today, but up more than 7.5% for the week. The president, meanwhile, meeting with both NATO and G7 leaders today to discuss additional Russian sanctions. With us this morning is Dan Eberhardt, CEO of Canary, one of the largest private oil field service companies in the United States. It's great to have you, Dan. Thanks for the time today. Uh, thank you for having me. 
you know, everybody's trying to get a sense as to whether or not the EU has the nerve uh, to pull the trigger on a robust ban of Russian energy. But I don't know. I wonder what you think. It's, it seems like the split there is going to be hard to hard to stitch. Yeah, well, I think that they're going to come under increasing pressures as, you know, war, war drags on. That's not my area of expertise. But what, what I will say is, you know, I've, I've looked at this. The, you know, look at what happened when the U.S. banned Russian oil. The, the oil companies in the U.S. were already kind of self-sanctioning Russian oil. And we only import uh, 300,000 barrels a day. But we're talking about, you know, between 2.1 and 3 million barrels a day that uh, Europe imports from Russia. This is 30 percent of their energy consumption. And. I think if they pull the trigger on a ban, you know, we're looking at $200 plus oil. Yeah, that's going to be difficult. I mean, do you have much color to add on our ability to supply them with reliable LNG? Maybe not right away, but to get them through this coming winter and maybe the winter after that? Well, we can, we can definitely do it. I, I will say the administration has been sitting on six, or, or FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has been sitting on six LNG per, uh, export permits and, you know, speeding those up would certainly help. But we do have the capacity in the U.S. to particularly with maybe, you know, six months or so of warning uh, to supply Europe with even more LNG. We, we, you know, the U.S. is the Saudi Arabia of gas, so to speak, right? Uh, we have plenty of supply, but it, all this stuff takes a ramp up period. All this stuff takes time. And, you know, right now we've got, you know, Germany, Italy, uh, other, other European countries that are, you know, feeding Putin's war machine with um, you know, billions of dollars a day in, in energy, in money for energy. And I, I think eventually that will stop as this war drags on. But that's going to be painful for everyone in Europe. And the, we'll see prices spike here in the U.S. too. You know, we import about 20 percent of our crude. And I think we can quickly get back up to where we're energy independent, so to speak. Um, but this is going to be a higher cost for everyone. And I think it's I think it's coming. So with WTI right now at 112, 113 bucks a barrel, Dan, why aren't we already seeing yeah. that ramp up here in the U.S.? And we keep hearing it's a perfect storm from your vantage point. Why hasn't that production actually, that output actually already started to move higher? Well, I, I think the market is trying to test whether this is transitory, whether it's not. And there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, what, when the you know, duck's paddling underwater, a lot of that, uh, and, the, and it looks calm on the surface. There's a lot of that going on right now. People are scrambling to see what rigs are available in the fall. People are looking to ramp up production. But I think that, you know, it's very easy to see the oil the oil price on CNBC, right? And that moves pretty quickly. But in terms of adding rigs in the field and adding production, that takes a lot more time. The other thing is, look, as a service company, you know, we're faced with the same constraints that, that all these other American businesses are. Mm -hmm. uh, time, for, time from China is, to get stuff is six weeks, not three. Labor shortages, our fuel costs are spiking. You know, our insurance costs are spiking. So it's we have these same is supply chain issues that everyone else does too right now. Yeah. So in light of that, do you feel like this administration is working closely enough with the oil and gas sector here in the U.S. to be able to help, I guess, jump some of these hurdles? Uh, n not at all. I mean, I, I would say the administration has been a, a complete headwind to the industry and in, in trying to slow us down with uh, death by a thousand cuts until, you know, maybe a few weeks ago. But, you know, it's only 45 days ago. Biden was calling on OPEC to produce more oil, not you know, Texas or North Dakota or Oklahoma, which boggles my mind. But I think the administration is doing a complete 180 and really focused right now on trying to trying to get in touch with the oil industry and become a tailwind uh, and help us do this. But it's only been ex extremely recently. Their, their policies have not been helpful to us at all, really. It sort of reminds me of the, yesterday's uh, survey from the Dallas Fed, uh, Dan, where they mm -hmm. said, which of the following reasons is the main reason uh, publicly traded oil producers aren't are restraining growth. Uh, they were given choices, mm -hmm. government regulation, lack of access to financing, uh, investor pressure to maintain capital discipline. The overwhelming yeah. response was the last one. Investors demand their returns. Yeah, no, and look, that's that's why you haven't seen, you know, oil production was 13 million barrels a day in 2020. Right now it's about 11.7. There's been an awful lot of talk in the industry the last two years about capital discipline about, you know, a lot of these companies are drilling, you know, to, 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 to uh, channel T. Boone Pickens, they're drilling for oil on Wall Street via mergers and acquisitions, not drilling for oil in the oil patch. And there's a, a focus that we're not going to get back to, you know, this kind of bull run with U.S. shale where people over drilled and there was too much supply. We've also got an industry that there's something called the ducts, the drilled but uncompleted wells. That inventory has shrunk dramatically. And I think that that's another reason why 
uh, we're not seeing the price spike. If you know people aren't prepared, people have been drawing down that inventory. That's another sign of this capital discipline. And a lot of people haven't kind of broken that, broken that, you know, or, or pulled that rubber band off or mm. pulled that bandaid off to, to really uh, try to accelerate right now because they still yeah. are focused on that. No, it's it's amazing. Uh, economic scarring mm -hmm. is sort of is what it is. Uh, Dan, really helpful. Yeah. Uh, great conversation. Hope you'll come back. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Dan Eberhardt. Thanks for having me. Well, speaking of oil, our Philip Bo caught up with the CEO of Alaska Air earlier today to discuss the rise in both travel demand as well as jet fuel costs. Phil. Morgan, those jet fuel costs certainly will be a topic here at Alaska Airlines Investor Day here in New York City. And earlier today when we talked with the CEO of Alaska Airlines, he said, look, it is an impact because they are going to be seeing higher costs per available seat mile. Their guidance, which they just released today, they're still going to be profitable this year, but their growth targets a little bit under pressure because they're going to be having higher costs up 3 to 5 percent versus up 1 to 3 percent. And here's the reason why. Take a look at jet fuel costs. They have essentially doubled in the last year. When we talked with Ben Minicucci, we said, look, how do you offset this? You are clearly hedging at $70 a barrel. The market's at 110. He expects to stay that way through the remainder of this year. And higher ticket prices will be one way that they're going to offset that impact. You can only increase ticket prices so much before demand starts to trail off. So we got to be careful. You know, fortunately, you know, for our business model, you know, we got a low cost business model. We're hedged. So we're going to try and uh, really moderate, you know, the level of ticket prices. A lot of cross currents in the aviation industry and the airline business right now. You do not want to miss our exclusive interview tomorrow morning on Squawk Box. FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. He leaves office next week, but before he does that, he's going to talk with us about the state of the industry. Also, what he thinks about the uh, face mask uh, mandate that is out there through April 18th. And one last note, guys. I want to pivot quickly and show you shares of Nikola. They're up almost 9% today after the company said it has begun production of its electric semi, its first one. Now, they had given guidance last month that they were going to do this. Now that they have begun production, that's the reason shares are up, what, more than 7% today. Guys, back to you. All right. A busy week on your beat, Phil. Thanks, uh, Phil LeBeau. As we go to break, I take a look at the markets this morning. Once again, pretty tight range, 4480 or so. Uh, Morgan Stanley with a note a couple of moments ago, joining Goldman and looking for 50 basis point hikes in both May and June meetings. Stay with us.
The world's second largest cryptocurrency, Ether, is outperforming Bitcoin amid progress on a long-awaited software upgrade. Our Kate Rooney has that story. Hey, Kate. Hey, Carl. Yeah, this upgrade is sometimes called Ethereum 2.0. It hasn't happened yet, but developers are reporting progress in this years-long transition, and that is sparking a new bullish sentiment around the cryptocurrency Ether. A couple big changes underway here. Ethereum, for one, is set to become more efficient, cheaper to create, and it's going to uh, use a lot less energy. That energy part has to do with what they call mining or creating new crypto. It requires a lot of computing power, and its carbon footprint has really been one of the main critiques of Bitcoin over the years and other cryptocurrencies. In order for this software upgrade to happen, Ethereum has to merge onto a test network that's been set up on the side, and the most recent test appears to have gone pretty well. It's also the last test before the actual merge, which is expected later this year. This excitement is happening despite some other potentially bearish news about Ethereum. It, the overall network activity has seen a pretty significant slowdown. That tends to be a leading indicator of prices. Fundstrat points this out and they say, despite what some of those underlying fundamentals are saying, including that slowdown, the Ethereum upgrade will be, quote, universally viewed as a price catalyst. And it is possible that Ethereum can perform what they call remarkably well through the rest of this year, irrespective of the rest of the market. Sentiment, guys, is important, of course, but Ethereum is also maturing. You got to pay attention to some of the other factors, including futures markets. And like Bitcoin, Ether is still pretty rate sensitive. It's trading a lot more like a high growth tech stock than any sort of uncorrelated asset. And it could really be a buy the rumor moment that Ethereum 2.0 upgrade might not happen until the third or fourth quarter of this year. Back to you. All right, Kate Rooney, thank you. BlackRock's Larry Fink noting in a shareholder letter that the Russia-Ukraine crisis could actually accelerate digital currencies, writing, quote, a global digital payment system thoughtfully designed can enhance the settlement of international transactions as we see increasing interest from our clients. BlackRock is studying digital currencies. To discuss, let's bring in Cumberland's global head, Chris Zolke. Chris, great to have you back on the show. I do want to start with the underlying fundamentals and what Kate Rooney just laid out uh, in terms of the price action we've seen in Bitcoin, in Ether, in the cryptocurrency markets overall, as we do see this Ukraine-Russia crisis continue to unfold. Sure. You know, the environment is arguably the most complex macro environment the industry has seen in history. And I think as a result, have a lot of counterparts that are looking to more complex contract structures like options that capture that volatility when it emerges. Now, that all said, what we're starting to notice is that um, the debate around the kind of store value argument versus the risk on argument is becoming a bit contentious. And as a matter of fact, what we believe is happening is there's two camps. And there are those that are deploying assets from a risk on, risk off perspective, and those that are deploying assets from a kind of an inflationary hedge perspective. And we think this is at the core of why we've been trading a fairly tight range, you know, 36,000 to 44,000 over the course of the past couple months. Got it. So I do want to get your thought on BlackRock's Fink's comments uh, in that note, uh, and specifically the role that Russia, Ukraine could actually play in terms of accelerating digital currencies. We know it's been used to get aid to Ukraine, for example. There's been also on the flip side of that a, a lot of speculation, if you will, that it could be uh, used as a, a sanctions dodge uh, in Russia to how does this continue to propel or change the narrative around cryptocurrencies? Uh, you know, I think they're both uh, very important topics to discuss. Uh, first and foremost, the, the response by the crypto industry to the sanctions, I think, has been in full support of applying those uh, rigorously. What's been confusing to me is this perception that transactions in the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are opaque. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're arguably more transparent than what we would see in traditional financial markets, given the transparency of the underlying blockchain, going all the way back to Genesis Block. So that coupled with sound AML and KYC procedures, I think will put the industry in a really good position to prevent and track illicit activity. Now, having said that, I think something that's really important to acknowledge is any time that there is geopolitical uncertainty, there's some amount of concern about uh, fiat assets, fiat currencies, and whether or not they will continue to be able to kind of hold their value. And what we're seeing with the Russia-Ukraine situation is that more and more people in the Western world are starting to acknowledge the fact that a decentralized asset that is not tied to a centralized government has a lot of, kind of 
risk mitigating aspects that are interesting to individuals trying to, let's say, work around the concerns that they have around access to their own financial assets within their country's banking system. Yeah, I think specifically refers to um, the ability to lower cross-border payment costs. And I wonder whether or not you think some of the, if we call this a use case, sadly, uh, if it's going to turn around the views of some people who've been really skeptical and critical of, of crypto. Uh, I'm thinking of a Charlie Munger who called it a disease or Jamie Dimon who uh, had some other choice words for it. I wonder if this changes their mind a bit. You know, I, I think it will. Um, it, it's perfectly natural anytime a new innovation emerges for people to question it. Right? It's new. They don't understand it. But as more industry efforts are put into developing for the underlying technology and as more education takes place, I think it's natural for people to start to see these use cases. We've talked about stable coins as a way to offer uh, access to banking services that the underbanked population don't have access to right now. Mm. That's the same concept that we're talking about for war-torn countries that no longer have a viable financial system. So at its core, I think these cross-border remittances that are afforded through things like stable coins and other crypto assets will absolutely be one of the pillars that this industry grows up around over the course of the next five years. Chris Zolke, always great to get your thoughts. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Coming up this morning on Tech Check, Google, as you may know by now, giving in to Spotify on payment choice. Plus, Uber striking this deal with New York City taxis. We'll talk about both of those stories and a lot more. Begins in about 10 minutes at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. In the meanwhile, Squawk on the Street is back in a moment. A lot of familiar numbers on the tape today. S&P just south of 4,500. VIX around the 23 range. Uh, S&P, though, is positive for the week and will remain so as long as we're above 4,463. 
So about a 20 point cushion right there uh, so far. We'll be right back, stay with us. NASA announcing it will support development of a second commercial lunar lander to carry astronauts to the moon's surface under the Artemis program. NASA had surprised industry and lawmakers last year by awarding a nearly $3 billion single human landing system contract to SpaceX for its next-gen Starship. That had triggered unsuccessful legal protests from competitors, both the team led by Blue Origin and Lighthouse unit Dynetics. Blue Origin in particular had waged a very intense campaign with Jeff Bezos, even offering to cover $2 billion worth of development costs. So no details yet on this new competition, though expectations are that Blue Origin and Dynetics will be back in the bidding. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson also not yet disclosing how much money will be dedicated to this. Expect more on that next Monday when we get President Biden's 2023 budget request, which will be in focus for investors in defense stocks as well. That's going to do it for Squawk on the Street. Tech Check starts now. Good Thursday morning. Welcome to Tech Check. I'm Carl Quintanilla with Deirdre Bosa and John Fort. Today, the battle over in-app payments continues. I get a breakdown of Google's new concessions for Spotify and what that could mean for Apple and millions of small developers. Then globalization's counter-argument as Larry Fink calls for an end to 30 years of globalization. We'll discuss why that may not be as straightforward as you think, at least when it comes to tech. And here to discuss it all, tech investor Dan Niles, who's got thoughts on the Fed, stagflation, and whether growth stocks could still be headed lower from here. Dee? 
Carl, we're going to kick off today's feed with a break in the battle over app store payments. Spotify shares on the move after news that the company reached an agreement with Alphabet's Google to enable subscribers to sign up for the service directly through the Google Play Store. And with investors and regulators alike already watching this space, this could have a ripple effect through a lot of different tech companies. Julia Borston is joining us to break down that impact. Julia, uh, we're seeing moves in stock prices as early as this morning. Yes, and look, Spotify shares did spike about 3.5% after hours yesterday. They are down lower now, but this is important because up until now, Spotify made subscribers leave the app and go to its website to sign up to avoid having to pay Google as much as 30% of Spotify's monthly fee. But now, Spotify allowing subscribers to pay through Google's app store's billing system with Google accepting a lower fee is a significant step towards resolving the battle over app store fees. Now, Google says this is a pilot, that it will expand broadly, and these are concessions in the face of regulatory scrutiny, which KeyBank says create a, quote, soft landing scenario for app stores where Google Play can continue generating significant revenue, consumer safety in stores is not compromised, and large developers and regulators are appeased. Now, a number of analysts this morning pointing out that this will make it easier for consumers to sign up, to subscribe, which could help Spotify's premium subscriber growth. Bumble and Match stocks rose on this news on the expectation that Google could carve out more favorable economic arrangements with certain apps. That's uh, Match is now up, Bumble is now lower, but they, their sign-up workaround on Android to avoid fees does expire next week. So those are two key stocks to watch here. And this Google-Spotify partnership could have wide-ranging app implications across the app ecosystem. Morgan Stanley speculating that Netflix, which forces new subscribers to sign up through a website rather than in-app, could strike a similar deal with Google, noting potential upside for Roblox and Zenga as revenue shifts to direct payments and for PayPal and Stripe to also potentially benefit from alternative payment methods. Meanwhile, KeyBank notes that Duolingo could benefit from direct billing as well. Now the question is whether this new partnership pressures Apple to follow suit. Its app store is much more important for the likes of Mash and Bumble. It also has a track record of not making deals with individual developers, and it's seen as unlikely to cave unless they're really pushed to do so by legislators. Guys? Julia, here's my sort of eh, watch the fine print skepticism coming through. The way I, I understand it, it looks like in South Korea, where Google's done this uh, already, they've only reduced commissions by about 4%, right? So say that flows through and is similar for these other deals. That's not that much. And plus, if you want to extrapolate through to Apple, right? I mean, Google's like Dollar Tree to Apple's target as far as their ability to monetize on the platform and App Store. Won't they figure out other ways to monetize these developers, even if it's not directly through the payment system, through ads, through discovery, because they know that that iOS user base spends more and is more valuable, developers are gonna end up paying up one way or the other, I have a feeling. Yes, yes, you're right. I'm sure Apple will find a way to make developers pay up. And I think it's really important to point out what you just did, John, about the fact that we don't know exactly what kind of fee Spotify is paying Google. But it's, it's lower enough from that 30%. Maybe it's 24%, but it's just low enough to make them feel comfortable striking this deal. Maybe this is to uh, you know spit in the eye of, of, of Apple in light of their ongoing conflict. Um, and because Spotify and Apple have really faced off here. But the fact that they are agreeing to pay a fee, and by the way, even pay a fee if people are paying through their own payment system, does show that they feel like they've made enough progress that this deal is worth it. All right, so what does this news mean for Apple, the other big tech giant coming under scrutiny for in-app payment policies? Steve Kovac joins us with some answers. Steve? Hey, John. Yeah, I mean, to your point, look, I, I saw this news yesterday and I couldn't think of anything, but this is a, a shot across the bow at Apple. That's where all the money is. If you look at the App Store revenues for both Google and Apple from 2021, based on Apple disclosures, it could be up to $85 billion. And based on Google's uh, analysts, it's like 47 or something billion. So look, all the money is happening on iOS in that ecosystem, to your point. And by the way, this is just a way for uh, Spotify to say, look, we're really mad at Apple. Let's partner with Apple's enemy here in this space. 
And then a year from now, we can come out with all this data saying, look, Apple's argument here has been wrong the entire time. We can just mm -hmm. say, uh, you know, th the security hasn't been compromised. People's credit cards aren't being stolen or anything like that. And that puts even more pressure on Apple, plus this looming legislation coming up in the EU, the Digital Markets Act, and then uh, the bills going yeah. through Congress right now here in the U.S. I get that this puts pressure on Apple, but Steve, it's notable that neither company is disclosing what that new commission rate right. is. There's just so many questions that we still have. And then I was thinking about what is this actually going to look like in practice? So Google's product and engineering teams, they're actually going to be building a new experience. And you're ultimately going to see two buttons, pay through the Android store right. or pay through Spotify, for example. So you're still giving customers the option to choose and I guess there's no guarantee that they're going to choose that Spotify option because I know personally like I like to have my subscriptions all in one place this when we talk about sort of creating less friction yes but not in maybe not in the way that we think maybe not in a huge way right and, and this has been the theme for years since these in-app payments uh, have been a thing Deirdre it's like what to the end consumer what does it matter I'm still paying 10 bucks a month for Spotify and and so it doesn't matter who gets the cut. I'm still paying the same amount. So what incentives can a company mm -hmm. like Spotify or Match or Bumble and so forth offer me to click their button instead of the Google or Apple button? Steve, good stuff. Uh, quite, a, quite a day. And we'll see how much of this gets incorporated into uh, the outlooks as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Let's dig into some of these stocks. Uh, joining us this morning, Santori Funds, Dan Niles joins us to help kick off the hour. Dan, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Carl. Um, you'd said a few weeks ago that cash was a position, and I wonder how would you grade yourself in uh, leveraging this recent rally we've had? Um, it, it's gone pretty well. I mean, if you go back and you look at our Twitter posts, we talked about the fact we thought a short-term rally would be coming. We bought some stocks, like in the fintech space, to benefit from that. Markets rallied, um, and we've started putting back on shorts. We actually now have again, as many shorts as we have longs on. And so I think this is kind of the tape we're expecting. You get bear market rallies, you get sell-offs, you get bear market rallies, you get sell-offs. I think it's going to be, you know, one to two years before this is sorted through because for the first time in a long time, the Fed is your enemy and not your friend. And I think people are forgetting that mantra, don't fight the Fed. Work great on the way up. It's unfortunately probably going to work well on the way down as well. How are you determining uh, what the high end of the channel uh, looks like? W what is special about the levels we're at here that, that puts you to, to normalize your shorts and longs? Well, we've got about 17 different technical indicators we use. And you know the, the bottoms are actually a lot easier to pick with technical indicators. Um, but you know when you're looking at prior periods of bear markets, and we've analyzed about 10 of them, where they've gone down about 30% or more, you typically get back about 70% of whatever you lost on the prior leg down. About 20% of those rallies, you get back all of the prior leg down. And so that gives you a starting point of you going, all right, you know what, this is when technically I should start putting those on if nothing about the fundamentals that I'm looking at have changed. And nothing on the fundamentals have gotten better. In fact, they've gotten worse. You've got higher oil prices, higher commodity prices, Guys are starting to cut numbers. You're getting towards the end of the quarter. You're going to see the impacts from Europe. Um, and so from that standpoint, we saw somebody cut their estimates on Amazon this morning by 15% because of oil um, for profits for the year. So you're going to see more of this stuff. And from our perspective, the Fed has just gotten started. So mm -hmm. it makes it a lot easier when you analyzed all the data going back in time. Hey, Dan, it's John. You mentioned Europe. Uh actually the subject of my on the other hand this morning. I uh, hope you can spend some more time there because we just saw uh, Adobe take a dive yesterday post earnings. A big part of that was because of kind of pulling back on revenues out of Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, et cetera. And then I I'm hearing more cautious commentary from the likes of Volkswagen Group, companies that are based in Europe versus just global you know, multinationals who have some business in Europe, the ones who are closer to Europe seem to think that the economic impact in Europe is going to be bigger and flow through to more uh, other places. How much do you think the market is uh, considering that already and how much should investors be thinking about it from here? This is a great question, John, because think about Adobe. They're a category leader 
They make tons of money, very profitable. And the stock was already down 33% going into their earnings release yesterday. And by the way, they'd had two prior quarters that were poor as well. So it wasn't like expectations were that high. Then they reported, said, hey, by the way, now remember, Adobe's quarter ends in February, and Russia invaded the Ukraine on February 24th. Most of these companies are going to report the quarter, you know, their quarter ends in March. So you're going to have an extra month where things are slowing down. Adobe still got hit for 9% yesterday after being down 33% from its all-time high going in with two prior bad quarters. So for the rest of these companies, I think you've got a much bigger issue. You've got an extra month worth of data. Europe's a very important region for a lot of the bigger companies out there. And, you know, I don't think investors are really paying attention to that or oil prices for that matter, because that matters and wages. Don't forget, you know, two thirds, actually close to 80 percent of the U.S. economy is now services based. And we just saw the lowest jobless claim number in 50 years. And there's three million more job openings than there are people unemployed. That's going to keep wage pressure really high as well for a lot of these things. So and multiples are still very high at, at yeah. a 23 times trailing P.E. Right. So Adobe, perhaps as a cautionary tale, uh, Dan, it's Sergio, by the way. Uh, stagflation also, you say, is now your base case for 2023. Uh, some think that perhaps we could avoid a recession because things are maybe different this time. We're coming out of the COVID crisis. Some of those pressures are going to ease. But you're not thinking that way. No, I mean, I love the phrase, it's different this time, right? Because it never is. Um, I, I like the Mark Twain quote, which is, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And, and that's what you have right now, where you've got a lot of wage pressure, and you could get away with stimulating the economy, both central banks as well as governments, as long as there's no inflation. When you get inflation, if you think about the U.S., 35% of people do not own homes. 45% of people don't own stocks. Those people are getting absolutely killed by inflation. If you own stocks or homes, you're doing great because your stocks and homes are up a ton over the last two to three years. But the other portion of the population is getting clobbered. That's why the Fed has talked about moving expeditiously. I'm expecting a 50 basis point rate hike when they um, move in May. And I think they're going to stay aggressive because they let inflation get, get away from them. And now they're dealing with it. And that's why I think stagflation next year is sort of mm -hmm. the base case because you had oil prices double relative to the levels, uh, the average over the prior two years, which is in the low 50s. You've got CPI well over 5%, close to 8% now. And you've got a Fed that's getting aggressive while, while multiples are high. And by the way, estimates are going to be going lower when companies report and guide to John's point earlier on Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dan, I keep coming back to comments that we heard from Jeff Gundlach last week, and he said because of all of these pressures, essentially, that the Nasdaq was no longer a place to be in the longer term. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you, you have to balance risk with reward. The last, I mean, think about it this way, right? You've had a global pandemic the last two years, and the S&P 500 has doubled over the last three years. So, you know, you take, it's paid to take as much risk as possible and buy anything you could, whether it's a boat, a used car, crypto, art, stocks, et cetera. Now you've switched to a, a realm where with rates going up, tech stocks are the most highly valued out there because a lot of those names you're buying on the promise of what profits you're going to produce 10 years from now and try to ignore the amount of money you're losing today. So I call this the Jerry Maguire market, dating myself a bit here, but you've gone from <laughs> sell me the dream of how wonderful things are going to be 10 years from now to show me the money. Can you grow profitably? Are you turning? Uh, are you growing as well as expanding your margins? That's what the market wants to see. And that makes NASDAQ a tough place to be for certain pockets of companies. We still have longs, but we've got as many shorts against those and those shorts are more in the unprofitable, expensive names. And the names we own are the really unsexy names, you know, going back to the 90s. But so, they make a lot of money, cheaply valued. Some have dividends. That's what we want to be in. So then, Dan, given that you see things playing out that way, particularly what you were saying about the portion of the population that doesn't own stocks or homes, is this uh, bullish for companies like Walmart, right, that fare well in tough economic times? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really is because, you know, consumers are getting squeezed really hard. If you're going to the pump, you're going to the grocery store, 
etc. And so, you know, that's creating a lot of pressure on the consumer and those people are going to start to trade down. And you can go back and look in the past when you've gone into a recessionary type environment, you know, the low end like Walmart, they do really well because then people are really focused on saving money. So, you know, from a relative standpoint, they should do a lot better. But, you know, don't forget back to your earlier point, you know, there's a lot of other pressures going on at the same time. Like, you know, how much has shipping costs changed for them? How much has total cost changed for them? Things like that, um, you know, you got to take into consideration. But on a relative basis, I would think Walmart should hang in a whole lot better. Dan, how are you processing uh, the theory that cash freight, for example, is negative year on year? Uh, used car prices are beginning to top out. The, num the wait time for container ships at a nine-month low. Basically, the idea that not only will you have base effects at work, uh, but maybe inflation does go soften in the second half. And the street always overestimates with how aggressive the Fed's going to be. Well, I mean, I think, you know, you, you can think about it this way. We, we kind of talked about this earlier. About 80% of the economy is based on services. So that's based on wages you're paying people. And if you look at the average company in the S&P 500, about two thirds of their cost is tied up to that. Um, you've only got about 20% or so tied up with things like oil, with logistics, et cetera. So that wage price spiral is the thing that you really should be focusing on. And if you've got 50 year lows and jobless claims, the workforce is a lot bigger than it was 50 years ago. You're sitting at you know, sub 4% unemployment, which is one of the, you know, bottom 10% of all reading. Yes, you're going to get help from all this other stuff. Will CPI come down from 7.9%? Well, obviously. But is it still going to be a lot higher than what's comfortable for the average person that maybe doesn't own stocks, doesn't own a home? Yeah, that's going to cause a big problem. And so that's why I go, yeah, well, those things are going to go down. We're actually short oil up at this level. But it's a longer discussion where you need to think about the trends that are going on, plus some of the macro stuff, which is we're building more stuff in the U.S., not in China. That's inflationary. There are less people being born, adding to the workforce. That's inflationary. And green policies are great for the environment, but coal and oil is still cheaper than you know solar and other things, and that's inflationary. Right. So all those long-term trends are also working against you now looking forward. Yeah. Certainly, that's what uh, Howard Marks and Larry Fink and now Dan Niles have been arguing today. Uh, Dan, uh, great stuff. A nice blend of uh, the macro and the micro. We'll talk soon. Dan Thanks Niles. Thanks a lot, Carl. Appreciate it. And coming up, the street's top calls on software and hardware and why names like Microsoft might be priced for disruption. Tech Check is just getting started.
Let's get a gut check on Logitech headed higher this morning. Bank of America initiating the stock with a buy in a $170 price target. Shares are down, however, almost 30% over the last year. Bank of America thinks the accessory maker is well positioned for long term growth with exposure to megatrends like increased video conferencing, the creator economy, and expansion into gaming, of gaming into mainstream entertainment. John, those shares up more than 6% this morning. Indeed. And turning now to software. Our next guest says investors need to walk the line between growth trends, attractive valuations, and macro risks, calling names like Salesforce, Datadog, and Snowflake some of the best entry points in the sector. Joining us now, top-rated analyst Keith Weiss of Morgan Stanley. Uh, Keith, welcome. Let's start with the macro. Uh, we were just talking about this with Dan Niles. How concerned are you about what's going on in Europe, I mean, certainly from a human humanitarian perspective, but when it comes to the broader economy, when it comes to impact on demand and stocks, are we, are we able to assess that yet? I think it's still a little bit early uh, to, to really understand the assessment, but you can screen for risk factors, right? And so um, it, if you think about enterprise software in particular, um, it takes a while for those demand impacts to get into the system, to see it in the pipelines and the close rates. But you can screen the space for what parts of software are going to be most protected and what, what are going to be most at risk uh, of macro disruption potentially. Stuff that's most protected is going to be your security spending. Um, that's not going to change. Uh, people still have to really shore up their defenses there. Your large digital transformations, we think those are going to have uh, solid funding behind them, particularly coming from large enterprises. On the riskier side of the equation would be stuff that has to focus on the consumer, uh, marketing spend uh, is, is going to be more volatile, or uh, stuff like collaboration software, which it tends to be shorter cycle. So we focus on the parts of the equation that are going to be most durable, even if you do have some macro disruption, and then match that with where you see the best valuations. And if you take that perspective, you can still find some really nice risk rewards in the market and, and in software in particular. So how much can valuations contract even in the areas and with the stocks that you like? I mean, if we do, do go through a bumpier time uh, macro-wise, um, is there more risk perhaps than investors are considering at the moment? When, when we look at the, the multiples, multiples have come in uh, a lot in software uh, really since November. If you look at broadly across the group, uh, we look at stuff like EV to sales multiples, uh, your enterprise value divided by your forward sales. Uh, if you look at it on an absolute basis, the group overall has uh, pulled back almost 40%. That's a pretty big correction. Uh, the levels that we've gone to, we think are pretty interesting. We look at those EBITDA sales multiples on a growth adjusted basis. So what are you paying for every percentage point of growth? And the levels that we've pulled back to, if you look at sort of when we bottomed on last Monday, those levels were spot in line with what we saw in uh, late March of 2020 and is in line or actually below uh, the five-year average and, and below even the five-year average before we saw this really nice period of software uh, multiples rising uh, uh, during, during COVID. So the valuations in our perspective have gotten to a point where they're pricing in disruption. Uh, investors think something is going to happen. It's just what level of disruption. I think what you're worried about more is are the forward estimates going to come down? Are, are people going to have to revise down their revenues? And that's what you like about software. Software tends to have very durable fundamentals. A lot of this is recurring revenues, meaning it's already on the balance sheet. It's just going to amortize onto the income statement. So software can prove more durable than a lot of the other spaces out there when it comes to the absolute fundamentals. So you have a good level of, of multiples. You have fundamentals that probably prove more durable than people fear. Mm -hmm. So, Keith, what do you make then of recent deal making in software, particularly Toma Bravo's buyout of Anaplan? This wasn't the cheapest or the most battered cloud name. So what does it tell you about valuations and the rest of the space and appetite, not just from private equity, but perhaps the big tech players? Yeah, I think it's a really good validation point of what we're seeing in terms of attractive valuations. These financial buyers are seeing as good valuations as well. Like you said, Anaplan, it wasn't the, the least expensive or the most beaten up. Um, but if you look at the multiple that they were taken out at, um, that's well above where the average Smith cap software stocks play. So Anaplan got taken out about 11.5 times EV to sales. The average uh, small mid cap stock in our coverage group is trading at about seven times. 
So that shows a lot of potential value in that small and mid-cap space. And I do think there are more acquirers out there than we've seen historically. There's a lot of the, the larger vendors. Um, I, would, I would point to like a VMware or a Cisco or an IBM. We're still trying to buttress their, their software exposure. Obviously, we don't know about any particular deals, but these are vendors that we think will have an appetite for, for more software, as well as some of the cloud vendors. Um, they're, they're looking to go up the stack, if you will, get higher level functionality, and there's a lot of interesting assets in software right now. Um, and, and a lot of big players who are hungry, as you mentioned, Keith, thank you. Keith Wise from Morgan Stanley. Meanwhile, keep your eye on Apple today. We are on pace for eight days in the green from 150 to 171, uh, up double digits since the 15th. And there might even be more upside ahead. Average price target there, one cent shy of 190 as we're at session highs and close to 4,500. Welcome back to Tech Check. I'm John Fort with Carl Quintanilla and Deirdre Bosa. We're at session highs as chip names lead the NASDAQ higher. Top gainers this morning include NVIDIA, Intel, Marvell, and AMD. Plus, we've got the bull case for Roku, as one analyst calls it, quote, the most controversial name, unquote, in their coverage universe. That's later this hour. But first, let's get to a news update with Rahel Solomon. Hi, Rahel. Hi, John. Good morning. And here's what's happening at this hour. Weekly jobless claims falling to just 187,000 last week. That is the lowest level since 1969. Continuing claims also fell to a 52-year low as labor shortages continue. Bond yields, meantime, bouncing higher following yesterday's big decline. The move bringing the 10-year not far from its highest level in nearly three years. 
Oil prices are falling as the U.S. and allies discuss new releases from strategic reserves. But Texas crude dropping as much as 2.5% before rebounding and then going back above $114 a barrel. And the U.S. Postal Service has placed an order for 50,000 new delivery trucks. Price tag is nearly $3 billion. It includes 10,000 electric vehicles, which is actually twice what was initially planned. Shares of Oshkosh, the recipient of the order, are up right now about 1%. I'll send it back to you, John. Rahel, thanks. The end of globalization. Is it here? BlackRock's Larry Fink today writing, quote, The Russian invasion of Ukraine has put an end to the globalization we have experienced over the last three decades. And Oak Tree's Howard Marks has similar sentiments, telling investors in a note yesterday, the recognition of these negative aspects of globalization has now caused the pendulum to swing back toward local sourcing. But making that swing might be harder than we think, particularly when it comes to semiconductors. Here's Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger's thoughts on the supply chain from a wide-ranging chat he and I had on Squawk Box yesterday. We're way too dependent on too few places in the world for something as critical as semiconductors for the future. And uh, the Asian uh, presence here is very significant, you know, as I've uh, talked about before. In uh, 1990, 80% of semiconductors were built in U.S. and Europe. Today, 80% in Asia. But that said, investment in capacity has continued here in the U.S. NVIDIA now says it's considering using Intel as a foundry though CEO Jensen Huang says it is complicated as, quote, it's not just about desire. We're not buying milk here. Carl, uh, <laughs> wow, what a difference 10, 15 years makes. There was a time when, when there, there was talk of Intel crushing uh, not only AMD, but also NVIDIA. Uh, those companies have done well, but now you know, we're talking about this kind of dislocation between the West and the East, and perhaps uh, a move on the on the part of a lot of uh, U.S. and European-based companies, even in the semiconductor industry, to work together. Yeah, to call it the end of globalization uh, is maybe sort of an overreach, I think, D. Uh, we just, for example, uh, lowered tariffs between the U.S. and the U.K. on steel. Uh, mm -hmm. That's you know, We're going we're gonna to find our partners. I was struck by what Ian Bremmer said on Twitter a little while ago, that Russia's invasion is not the end of globalization. It's the end of globalization for Russia. Yeah. I was looking at that exact thing, uh, Carl, right as we were going into this, and it's a good point, but maybe not just Russia. Maybe instead of the end of globalization, we're seeing the splintering, which we talk about, have talked about for years in technology, but maybe on a bigger scale now, right? You have Russia and perhaps China on one side. Um, we talk about this when it comes to payment systems as well, increasingly. So I also would say that Pat Gelsinger's comments, while he did say that there was a need for U.S. leadership, he also said that it wasn't so simple, that they need to continue to have investments in places like China. He said that a quarter, about a quarter of all semis are consumed there, and a quarter or more are manufactured or processed there. So you can't just turn that around. Perhaps more protections in place, but I'm with you, Carl and John, on that sense that maybe not the end of globalization, maybe more splintering. Well, and, and what replaces it, I think, is a question here. Uh, is it back to sort of Cold War era containment policy? And what happens yeah. to places like Australia, places in Southeast Asia, uh, places in Africa that have so much investment from China, for mm -hmm. example, that, that kind of dis taking themselves out of that if that's what the West pressures them to do would be difficult. Well, to learn more about the global supply chain and the role of a European company, uh, ASML, which has become a giant player here in semiconductor, stocks up 400% in the last five years. CNBC's Katie Shula got a rare tour inside ASML's factory clean room, did a ton of original reporting, that full video on CNBC.com and on YouTube, but here's a sneak peek. At the center of this big factory in the Netherlands, in the midst of a months-long assembly process, there's a revolutionary machine that the whole world has come to rely on. You could see an EUV machine right behind me. The size of a city bus, but working with atomic level precision, these EUV lithography machines are the most expensive step in making every advanced microchip that powers the modern digital age. Data centers, cars, and every single iPhone. We are the only provider on the planet of this critical technology. These machines are the only way to print minuscule designs on these chips. They cost up to $200 million, and they're only made by a single company. 
Advanced Semiconductor Materials Lithography, or ASML. Turning to the streaming wars as more content providers warm up to the idea of ads, our next guest says Roku's market opportunity is underappreciated and their ARPU could reach two to three times current levels, which shares almost 75% off their highs of the year and now trading below pre-pandemic levels is now the time to buy. Joining us now, Evercore's ISI's Shweta Kajuria. Shweta, it's great to have you with us. Lay out the case for us. I think you called this one of the most controversial names in the space, especially as we see the industry at large moved back towards an ad-supported model. Where does that leave Roku? Yeah, I, well, the reason, thanks for having me. The reason why I said it's one of the most controversial names is because there's just so much debate that's going on with this name. One On one side, we have supply chain issues uh, where Roku has seen an outsized uh, headwind versus the competition. We also have this macroeconomic inflationary pressure and wage inflation. And we also have uh, you know, the international uh, expansion and investments that Roku is making that that makes uh, investors a little bit more hesitant on what the next growth opportunity is for Roku. That said, we think that long term, it is hard to imagine that Roku will not emerge as one of the leading operating systems globally for TV. And our long pitch here is that one, ARPU is very much underappreciated. If we look at the streets ARPU, uh, it is, it, they are, the street is estimating ARPU growth of around low double digits, so call it 11, 12, 13% three-year K-gear up to 2025. If you actually look at linear TV ARPU, that ranges from $100 to even $150 if you look at Comcast's ARPU. And so we think that Roku's ARPU can actually even exceed linear TV ARPU, and they're not even close to that, $50 probably by the end of this year, and they could triple that if, they, um, if you think about the drivers that could lead ARPU growth. Now the pushback would be, well, what about active account growth? And that, that's mm -hmm. the controversy. Okay, well, Shreda, taking a look at the fundamentals, you mentioned those supply chain issues, and that has led to a loss in market share over the last few quarters. How do we know if there was real demand destruction there, and how do we know that customers didn't go to, say, an Amazon and are now locked into that ecosystem, which is much larger than Roku's? 
Well, first of all, we did our proprietary survey. We surveyed about 2,000 consumers which devices they use, which smart TVs they use. In the U.S., we think that, yes, Roku's share has ticked down from, call it, over 35% to now maybe 30% or somewhere in that range. But it is by far the leading operating system and the leading TV platform here for connected TVs in the United States and in Canada as well. So, yes, maybe there is some at the fringe uh, market share loss to uh, Android as well as Amazon, but they still remain pretty small percentage of the market. The second point is that satisfaction levels, according to our survey, are very high for Roku. They were actually the highest. What, what that tells us is that it's not only the account additions, but it's the net additions, which is the retention rates for Roku um, are likely to be a little bit higher than perhaps some of the competing platforms. And the final thing I'll say is that Roku, at the end of the day, is a TV first operating system. They were built, they built their technology ground up for TVs. That's not the case with Android. That's not the case with Amazon. And when you think about OEMs, they're a little bit more hesitant, arguably, to partner with an Amazon because of the retail partnerships. Mm. Uh, and so really, it's either uh, Google's Android, which has a small market share here in the US, or Roku, which still continues to be the, the leader. Although, you know, Shweta, sometimes, you know, it's interesting to look at some of the strategic adjustments some of these players have made. Roku used to shun original content, then they got in with the Quibi library. Netflix used to say that password sharing was fun, maybe not so much anymore. Doesn't that suggest that maybe the low-hanging fruit has been picked? Some of the low-hanging fruit, yes, I think so. I mean, the one that I, I would point to is the streaming sticks. I mean, it started with being able to stream TV. We all had non-smart TVs, and now we can't find a non-smart TV in the market. And so all of us just made our TV smart with a sticks or a dongle, and that is pretty much very well penetrated in the U.S., maybe not so globally. So, so yes, that low-hanging fruit is picked, and so there's this shift um, of going from sticks to the TVs. But the Roku, to, to back to your point on uh, the Roku channel and this, this shift across the different companies, I think that the Roku channel brings, it, Roku channel is not directly, the idea is not to compete directly with Netflix. I don't think Roku can afford to do that, and I don't think they're trying to do that. I think the idea there is that the Roku channel itself is it monetizes better than anything else on the platform that they have control and inventory for. So Roku channel, they have full inventory control. They're trying to drive engagement, and they've done a great job. Uh, in five years, in about five years since when Roku channel was launched, it's now a top five app. And you think about the top apps that there could be, um, including Amazon Prime, YouTube, et cetera. There are seven that I can think of, and Roku is in you know, top five of them. So they've mm. certainly done a good job driving engagement, which really is driving their monetization engine uh, because they control that inventory. Shweta, for me, this is the core question, which is, is Roku the iPhone and iOS of streaming, right? Purpose-built exactly. operating system for streaming the way uh, iOS really was first for mobile. Um, the best gateway, kind of similar to the App Store for monetizing for all of these other services that want to do that. High loyalty, uh, discovery potential, all of that. Do you think it is? I think so. I think that it is, and that is exactly what Anthony is trying to do. First of all, we look uh, at founder-led companies uh, favorably, and uh, on, in terms of execution, they've done a great job. It is not a self-inflicted issue for them. These macro headwinds are not something they created. They've been executing fairly well, so they should get credit for it. Juries, the, the big debate, if, if they want to be the operating system for TVs, the biggest debate is how will they do in international markets? They, they are the mm -hmm. clear leaders here. How are they going to do in international markets? Arguably, Google has a better brand name. Samsung and LG have very good penetration. So how will they penetrate international markets and what will they need to do in order to gain market share there? And the reason why I think that um, Roku could do a good job is because they've done a great job in Mexico. They have about 20% market share there. They did a great job in Canada, about one in three TVs there are Roku. Um, and I think that <clears throat> they should get credit for that and mm -hmm. that their execution has been good. Finally, I think why I think they could be the operating system is because it is a TV first platform. No other uh, operating system is. And so yes, Android phones, Google makes their own phones, but Samsung still uses Android uh, operating yeah. system. Same thing can happen with uh, TVs. Well, Shreda, you laid out the case well there. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Well, the latest to jump into 15 minute delivery, not some startups, but grocery stores like Kroger and Aldi with the help of some new tools from Instacart. We've got an exclusive interview with CEO Fiji Simo up next. Stay with us.
Let's get a gut check on EVs. A lot of news. Take a look at Nikola. Shares surging after announcing electric semi-truck uh, productions up and running at their Arizona factory. Company expects to start delivering those trucks in the second quarter, and that means it'll beat Tesla semi to the market as well. Meanwhile, Tesla itself jumping back above $1,000 a share this morning, back to a trillion dollar market cap. Hertz now adding the Model Y as a rental option on top of the 100,000 Model 3s that it committed to buy last year. That's according to Electric. And in the Chinese EV space, NIO set to report after the bell tonight, expected to post a loss, but having an awfully big run over the last week, up about 15%. Tech Check is back after this. Instacart announcing a big push into quick commerce. It's unveiling plans to build out a network of micro or nano fulfillment warehouses to enable 15 minute delivery for its grocery partners. The instant delivery space, as we've been talking about a lot here on Tech Check, has really been heating up. Venture capital pouring funds into startups like GoPuff, Gorillas, Joker, and Gatier. At the same time, competition in grocery delivery, that's Instacart's core, has been intensifying with DoorDash's and Uber's push. I caught up with CEO Fiji Simo and asked her about the decision to get into this crowded field. Our approach to quick commerce is completely different from the approach that quick commerce players are taking. Uh, quick commerce players are disintermediating our grocers. They are owning their own inventory. We are not doing that. We are enabling our grocers. We are going to run these nano fulfillment centers on behalf of our grocers so that they can offer 15-minute delivery. So so it is a different strategy, and this is essentially CMO's first big move since coming over from Meta. The idea here is to turn Instacart into more of a platform for its retail customers with the things like expanded ad and analytic tools. And key here is to keep them loyal amid this increasing competition. I also asked her about inflation's impact on consumers. A recent survey from Morning Consult Report says that fewer Americans are ordering takeout for delivery. Have a listen. We're definitely tracking that closely, and we are seeing uh, definitely price increases. As you know, on Instacart, the model is that our grocers set the price, and we reflect them on our marketplace, and our grocers are definitely 
be uh, you know, selling higher prices. And um, what we're seeing is that people are kind of adjusting their, their habits as a result of these uh, price increases. And we see our job as providing them with more opportunities to save, which is why we've rolled out a deal stab so that they see all of the discounts that are available to them on Instacart and many other options like bringing dollar stores onto the platform. Yeah, so she said that consumers are increasingly sensitive to prices. So some of the features she mentioned, like that deal tab, are part of a strategy to make the app more accessible. Finally, guys, I had to ask her about IPO plans. As I always do, she said that current market volatility is not affecting their timing, though it may be affecting their valuation in private markets. She said they don't need to raise money anytime soon, but that she wants to be able to show that expanded vision for the platform. So in that sense, John, this is... A step closer to that. When we will see that, uh, you know, reportedly been delayed a number of times. And so there are some concerns that perhaps Instacart has missed the window. Great. Yet uh, talking to her again, Dee, but I, I got to wonder about the capital outlay that's going to be yeah. necessary to enable 15 minute delivery. And that delivery seems to be a local game, kind of not only MSA by MSA, but also suburb and, and urban area by urban area. We'll see how they do it. Meanwhile, there's a new Bitcoin bull on the street, and we'll tell you who after the break. Don't go away. One more thing before we go, and that's another Bitcoin bear biting the dust. Larry Fink telling shareholders in his annual letter that, quote, the war will prompt countries to reevaluate their currency dependencies. A bullish sign, he says, for global digital payment systems like crypto that are able to bring down the cost of cross-border payments. Pretty big step for Fink, who told Squawk Box last November that he wasn't, a, quote, a student of Bitcoin and where it's going to go. Sounds like school may be back in session, <laughs> D, as he says yeah. the acceleration uh, from the invasion of Ukraine is going to have multiple effects.
Yeah, it was another what I've come to call a red pill moment. You see more of these business leaders at least show a curiosity and what a change that is from a few years ago when you saw more of them willing to sort of write off crypto as a whole. You don't see that as much these days. Instead, you see more come over to the side. One more more thing, guys, and that is uh, restlessness at Google. CNBC's Jennifer Elias reporting that executives were bombarded with questions from employees over their pay at a recent all hands meeting. An internal survey revealed that a growing number of Googlers don't view their compensation package as competitive. Keep in mind, Alphabet is coming off a record year, vastly outperforming their peers in 2021, up more than 65 percent. You can read CEO Sundar Pichai's response and more on this exclusive story on CNBC.com. Carl. Uh, meanwhile, guys, we are back to 4,500, uh, which we crossed earlier in the week for the first time in about a month. And oil below 112 is interesting, too. Let's get to the half. Carl, thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wagner, front and center this hour, the state of stocks, whether it is time to be cautious or bullish. Simple question, difficult answer, though, and in large part depends who you ask, as we have learned right here, even with our investment committee. Joining me for the hour today to continue that conversation, Bryn Talkington, Jason Snipe, Jim Labenthal, and Josh Brown. Let's check the uh, markets. Carl just said S&P back above 4,500, right at that spot now. So we took a break yesterday, and we're bouncing back today after that sell-off. Dow is up 257, 233 is the yield on the 10-year note. We're still pacing for a weekly loss for the Dow, but we'll see what happens between today and tomorrow and whether this momentum that we thought we had can actually stick around. Here's what I want to do. I ask you all this question. Is it time to be cautious? Is it time to be bullish? And I want you to listen to two pieces of sound, one with our very own Josh Brown, the other with Tom Lee, from conversations I had yesterday on overtime. Then we can react on the other side. What does history tell us about year three of a bull market? It's not great. It's an average return of about 5%. That's not the end of the world either. So if this is the year that we have to digest a double in the S&P for most investors who have been around, that's okay. I don't think you could rule out new highs later this year. If I have to bet, I think we revisit those lows from, from late February. And quite frankly, very good chance that we take them out. If we avoid recession, which is our belief, then stocks have discounted more than a recession. Because when we look at investor positioning, uh, institutionally, they have more cash than they did in 2009. Uh, consumer confidence is as low as it was in 2009. And then if you look at retail sentiment, it's as bad as 2009. So people are pricing in, uh, I think, a calamitous scenario. And that's when stocks can start to rally. Mr. All In, Farmer Jim, whose points do you agree with more? Well, it's not going to surprise you that I agree with Tom's, and it's, it's not because Josh is wrong. There's no way to say that Josh is wrong. Um, you know, I think about what you had with Carl Icahn two days ago on overtime where he said short-term predictions, nobody can make them. So, of course, there's a chance we retest the lows, but here's the main point. Think about what the market's done over the last two weeks. It has absolutely ripped higher by nine percentage points as the Fed has twice gotten more hawkish. First, last week when they raised rates and they raised the dot plot significantly, and then again Monday, I think it was Monday, when Bullard went to 3% and Powell said 50 basis points. I mean, he kind of said 50 basis points is what's coming, right? And the market is ripping in the face of that. I have learned to respect what the market is telling me, and I believe what the market is telling me. And I can't say this with certainty, but Tom Lee will tell you that inflation was rolling over before Ukraine. He'll point to the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. He'll point to freight indexes like the cash freight index. And I think he's right, and I think the market gets that. I think the market gets that while West Texas Intermediate is at $114 a barrel, a lot of other inflation numbers are rolling over. And last thing I'll say on this, 2011 to 2014, West Texas Intermediate comfortably hung out above $100 a barrel, and the economy expanded. So I'm with Tom Lee, economic expansion, and I really don't think we're going to go back to those lows of February 24th. So, Josh, are we ripping in the face of all of that news about rates and how aggressive we think the Fed is going to be, or were we simply oversold, we simply have short covering, and at some point it's going to run out of steam, uh, out of steam when reality smacks us in the face? Well, we were massively we were massively oversold in the short term. And I'm not using oversold the way a lot of people use it on TV as like a descriptive adjective. It's actually a statistic. When you look at relative strength, we were statistically 
oversold on any time frame, any way that you want to view that metric. And so the bounce itself isn't shocking. I do think the degree to which we've bounced, it's almost like a vertical line straight up, is what, what is surprising. And that seems to be continuing today. And again, for most investors, that's great. However, there are two worlds ahead of us. And if you tell me you have high conviction in, in, in which of these two worlds we're about to see, well, then I would tell you you're, you're kidding yourself. In one world, uh, the Ukrainians continue to drive the Russians back, which they have been doing, and there are peace talks, and those peace talks go well, and Vladimir gets enough to say that he won and pulls out, and there's a little bit of normalization and commodity stuff, maybe a little bit of an ease in supply chain, a big boost for sentiment, and we go back to taking out new highs. That's one world, and that definitely could happen. So you don't want to get too bearish here because that has been the resolution of a lot of these types of conflicts historically. There's another universe, another world, and I, I shudder to consider the possibility, uh, but let's all be very honest with ourselves. There are trading algorithms right now, um, if then, being written in the event that the words dirty bomb comes across the tape, in the event that the words chemical attack comes across the tape. I'm not a geopolitical expert, you shouldn't listen to my opinion of whether or not that's possible. But I would tell you that the experts think not only is it possible, they interviewed Joe Biden on the White House lawn about his opinion of whether it's possible. And he said, yes. So that is a universe that also exists. And I don't know which one of those we're headed for. I just know there is no reason whatsoever right now for the, the average investor to be acting as though they have all the conviction in the world in either one of those so cases. So let's do what we be do. Be smart, preserve flexibility, preserve optionality, don't be a hero. So let, let's, let's do what, what we do, what investors do, Jason Snipe. They play the probabilities. They place their bets based on what probability they see to an outcome that they think could happen. Everything Josh said is right. At the end of the day, this entire conversation really just boils down to where earnings are going to be. They're either going to be good, they're either not going to be good. They're either going to justify valuations in stocks or they're going to justify the fact that valuations need to reset even further. I point to a note today. Barclays Global Outlook, for the first time in two years, we are not overweight global equities over fixed income. One of the reasons they say... U.S. and European equities are unlikely to report sharp earnings upside surprises for the next few quarters. Is that a fact? Yeah. So obviously there's, there's great points on both sides. And I think where I reside in terms of just the earnings story and just, just the macro backdrop going forward, I'm more cautious than I'm bullish. I think Josh makes a great point in just overall conviction. It's hard to be convicted in a market where we're facing raging inflation, QT is underway. Obviously, they're trying to front load um, a lot of the rate hikes here. And we have a consumer that is strong, but I think it could potentially be heading on a collision course to demand destruction, where, you know, the consumer is just saying, pushing back and saying, we're no longer going to absorb uh, <clears throat> some of the pricing pressures and the input costs that we have over the last couple quarters, uh, really over the last year. And, and I know there's pent up demand, and we talk about that a lot, and there's trillions of dollars on the sideline, but I am concerned about, and also the geopolitical events, I'm, I'm concerned about that as well. We, there is no real off-ramp that is in clear view at this point. And I do think earnings revisions will come back in. Obviously, GDP revisions have come in. So there, there's concern uh, across the tape, but I think obviously with concern, there's also opportunities that are starting to present themselves. So I'm, I'm more cautious than I am bearish, and I think it's important to distinguish the difference between the two. Understood. So, Bryn, you know, one of the other things that Barclays says today in that provocative note is that valuations are also likely to be challenged by central banks tightening aggressively. Jim would make the argument that, no, they're not. They're, they're going to, they may tighten aggressively, but that doesn't mean that valuations necessarily need to reset further because the economy is going to be strong enough to withstand whatever the Fed is going to do and he's made that case on numerous occasions pointing to various metrics that he's witnessed today in his own eyes and he thinks they're going to hold up over a period of weeks if not months which needs to happen to be supportive of his idea is he going to be right so i think you know barclays and i've talked about this before about valuations 
um, valuations have zero predictive power over the following one year return. So I, I think you put that to the side and ign ignore that data point. I think that also on the Barclays point, it's interesting that their, their overweight bonds are going more to a bond positioning. The Barclays Ag, or the Bloomberg Barclays Ag, from high to low, peak to trough right now is down a little over 8%. The S&P, I think, is down around 6%. And so bonds have not been a friend to investors, longer duration bonds. And Scott, we've only had one rate hike. <coughs> so if I have to choose between stocks, and we'll talk about which kind of stocks in a second, versus longer duration bonds, I totally disagree with Barclays. I'll take the volatility and uncertainty of stocks right now for that known, I think, known downside of long duration bonds. And, you know, energy is still the only sector up for the year. So it's been challenging across the board. I think energy is up around 40 percent, while every other sector is down, you know. For a good reason. Between single and double for digits. For a reason, right? Yeah, total, absolutely. Oil prices have gone so, parabolic. So I'm, yeah, yeah, they have. They have for, for the right reason. I'm in, like, as an asset allocator, I'm in, I'm in Josh's camp that, you know, over the last three years, you've seen annual returns of, you know, plus 30, plus 18, plus, what, 28. And the, the five-year and 10-year returns for both the S&P and NASDAQ have been stellar. And so I try to manage our clients' expectations that if the market was flat this year, I think that would be a win. Because we have so many, not just possibilities, but probabilities of really bad things that can happen. And I continue to think through, we are 70% consumer-driven economy. And right, looking in the hindsight, the consumer is strong. But we have this trifecta of, high housing or rental rates, pick your poison. We have high food inflation, that's getting higher, and we have high energy cost. And then on top of that, you've got Fed tightening and QT, and then 10 other things. So I agree with Josh, you know, don't be a hero. Pick your allocation that you can stick with, be diversified. Because I don't think you can have a caveat if, and say, the caveat is if we don't have a recession, I think that we're in just really precarious times. And so I would be more defensive um, in my equity, or I am more defensive in my mm -hmm. equity positioning, and just manage your expectations that this year could be a down year, and that's okay. But I, which is why, Jim, some question about how you can be so positive, if not bullish, in the face of everything that Bryn just mentioned, that Jason Snipe just mentioned, the risk that Josh Brown brings to the table, and have such a level of confidence that what is today is going to still be tomorrow that a strong consumer today is going to be a strong consumer tomorrow, that corporate earnings, which are strong today, are still going to be strong tomorrow, that inflation, which is raging today, is not going to be raging tomorrow, and that the Fed is going to be aggressive, but we can absorb all of it. Yeah. Well, look, these are good points that are people are making. I'm, I, I can't dismiss them. That's not what I'm trying to do here. What I'm saying is that there are positive forces out there as well. And to me, they seem stronger than the negatives. OK, so let me be more specific. You know, if I were to take the guy who's most uh, antagonistic to me or opposite to me, not antagonistic, it's Mike Wilson. And he was on two days ago and he said, well, we might get a recession in 2023. You know what? It's March 24th of 2022. Initial jobless claims today were the lowest they've been since 1969. You got factories popping up all over the place. You got people traveling all over the country. I, I, I just I don't see the evidence. I'm not convinced on that negative case. And I already said to you that there are indications that inflation was rolling over. And those indications, like supply chain bottlenecks, continue outside of the Russia-Ukraine impact. So. Uh, let me let me also say one other thing, because this name or this term hero has come up a lot and you once or twice have labeled me with it. Let me be clear. I'm not trying to be anybody's hero. I don't care if anybody thinks I'm their hero. What I am doing is finding opportunities in the stock market. And I don't care if it's Qualcomm, uh, you know, Paramount. I can go through a long list of names where I see the earnings much better than what the estimates are. And the stock prices have come down already reflecting the negatives that people see out there. So you, you got you to gotta combine the price with these negatives and positives. That whole balance comes out and makes me very enthusiastic about the I understand, but when you declare yourself as you did, back to being Mr. All-In, you want to bake that cake, you're going to eat it. 
I, I, I like the way it tastes, Scott. I do think we should retire Mr. All In. I think it's getting a little old, but I'm not backing away from the fact that if I wanted to buy a new stock today, I would have to sell a stock. There's nothing in what I'm doing or saying that's backing away from being fully invested right now. So as far as eating my own cake, yum, yum, yum. Okay. Jason Snipe, I, 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 I see your caution in a stock move that you've made, and I want you to, to discuss it for our viewers. Um, you sold Disney, which, you know, is a really interesting move to make at, at this particular time. And I think it plays into your overall view of how you see the world right now. Tell us more. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I got impatient with Disney. I, I bought it, admittedly, at kind of 175, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's been a loss. I've, I've only been in it for eight months. Um, you know, they were consolidating much of last year. It was down 14%. Uh, it's obviously down this year some as well. Uh, they had a nice quarter, nice print Q4. You know, revenue was up 34%. You know, they had a triple in EPS growth. You know, but my concern around Disney is going forward, I think there's some margin headwinds here. Uh, there's some spending that they're going to be doing on Disney Plus. And, you know, guess what? The, the subs were great, you know, in the last quarter, but it's a fragmented industry. It's very difficult uh, to, to grow there. And, and I just think that there's places, there's other places in the market uh, for me to take that capital and spend. So I decided to get out and uh, unload it. Yeah. Josh, what do you think of that move? Getting out of Disney, even you get in at 175, you get out at one, I mean, let's just say today's price, even though today's price may not be the exact price in which Jason Snipe got out, but 175 to 140, we'll call it. I'll give him a couple bucks on the upside. Yeah, I, well, listen, I could see the argument for, I could see the argument for making either case here. Disney's tough right now. I actually have a, a buy limit order in for Disney, but at a lower price than where it is and where it's been. We'll see if I ever get filled. Um, one way to think about Disney is people at the park last week reported that it's the most crowded uh, Disney has ever been in park history. Um, but you have to remind yourself that has nothing to do with the future. What that's about is two years worth of canceled trips. When you promise an eight-year-old that they're going to Disney and then you can't take them, uh, two years later, they're 10. They still want to go. So <laughs> I wouldn't look at that and say, oh, that's a sign that, you know, Disney's going to have blockbuster numbers going forward. I think they're getting a lot of catch-up business. Um, and then on the streaming side, look, we know from the way analysts are now valuing and looking at Netflix, it's only going to get harder from here. It's not going to get easier. The honeymoon is now over for all of these streaming plays. The multiples on what each user is worth in on Wall Street, uh, that's changing. And the amount of competition and what that's going to mean in terms of marketing spend, content spend, discounting, that that piece is changing too. So if those are the two drivers uh, for Disney, and we know movie theater box office is going to stay hit or miss maybe for the rest of our lives, it makes it a more challenging, high conviction play. So I get what Jason's doing. Um, I'm not in it currently. I might end up in the stock at lower prices. We'll see. You give us, um, can you give us a more specific idea at the price that you, you have? No. You just won't. Remember the uh, you remember National Lampoons when they go to uh, uh, Vegas downtown? They start playing games like flip a coin and which hand is the? Uh, it, it's not what we're doing here. So I'm at, I'm at the tables, Judge. Okay, I understand. You tell us after the fact, then. At least keep us up to date on if it happens and when and and and, and what price you ended up getting Disney at. Um, I want to talk about some moves that Bryn made as well. Um, you've been in the Jeppy before. You bought more of Jeppy. You bought more of the uranium mining uh, ETF. You bought Archer Daniels calls, which has been uh, a focus on our show, as Joe bought uh, that yesterday. Let's start with Archer Daniels. The, if you look, if you pull up the chart, I mean, the stock has just done exceptional. I was late to this, late to this trade. Um, I bought the calls. I bought it when the stock was at 85. I bought in the money leaps. And so, because I know I was late to the game, I wanted some more, some more juice, and so I bought bought the calls. But I think with Archer Daniels, that really plays into my my commodity bucket with lithium, uranium, my energy stocks. That I think that we're going to be in this like tight agriculture market for quite a while. You know, Archer Daniels is is a wonderful company in that space. They're the full vertical. 
their dividends should be 30 to 35 percent of earnings. They're doing share buybacks. So I think it's the right kind of company at the right price. I think it hit an all time high today. So it may pull back a couple points, but technically it looks really strong. And I think the space they're in. Uranium, you know, I talk about covered calls. Uh, we've been in uranium for a year, the, the ETF. It has a lot of volatility. And so I bought some more uranium at 80. And then I sold the 90 April calls like one month from now and got 4%. And I still have about 12% upside on the stock. So I continue to try to make you know, our clients' money with covered calls and my money sweat for me. And when you can find names that you like that have good call premium, I think this is just a wonderful, wonderful, rich opportunity to do that. Okay, and give me the, um, the equity premium ETF from JP Morgan, the JEPI, which you've talked about before, but just remind people why you like it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's one of our biggest positions, uh, me personally, as well as with our clients. And we run covered calls ourselves, but what, J what JP Morgan does is they buy a basket of really equally weighted, um, about 100 high quality dividend yielding names in the S&P, and then they sell, they sell like three to 5% out of the money S&P calls. And what's interesting is I just looked at the 30 day SEC yield yesterday, it was around 11%. And so as volatility has gone up, they're able to sell higher premiums, which then we in turn collect. So to me, it's just a wonderful dividend um, pre, you know, premium strategy that gives clients multiple ways to make money, especially in this kind of market that's down. They're still generating that 9, 10, 11, 12% income per year, which is wonderful. Two stocks we need to discuss, um, Alaska Air Group, Pharma Gym is up uh, two and three quarters percent today. The company is uh, hosting its investor day today. CEO was on Squawk with, with Phil LeBeau. You continue to love this name? Yeah, I do. Um, now it's part of the overall theme here, which I'm trying to illustrate that things are going pretty well in the economy here in the US. This, this economy is expanding. And because of that, Alaska Airlines is increasing its capacity. It's gonna be above 2019 levels very soon. And this, this now caps about two weeks worth of airlines pre-announcing well into the Russia-Ukraine war, okay? Pre-announcing much better than expected demand. Uh, and they're handling, uh, they're handling fuel prices very well because they're raising prices and passengers are paying for it. So, I mean, I get everything that we're talking about from a big picture point of view. When you come down to the microscopic point of view of Alaska Airlines, a stock in my portfolio, it is benefiting very well in this environment. And I see that across a lot of my stocks. But That's see, why I, I'm positive. I feel like, of course, you're, you're, you're positive and you have reason to, to be so. But I do have some sense that you're dismissive of some of the issues that exist potentially tomorrow and, and not I'm glad, today. I'm glad you're saying this. Like I'm margins. I'm glad you're saying this, like Scott. Mar you point to margins. No, no. Scott, I'm not being dismissive. I want to make this clear. I'm not being dismissive. I completely see them. I see what Josh, I was, I was watching you yesterday when Josh talked about, hey, the Fed is raising rates aggressively into a slowing environment. I get it. I'm not being dismissive of it. I recognize it. I also recognize the positives that I'm talking about. And what I'm saying is when you put these together, for me, the weight is heavier on the positives than the negatives. I promise you, I'm not being dismissive. No, but I mean, it's not factoring, the negatives are not factoring in, in any way, it seems, into the decision making of why you like certain stocks today. If I tell you, well, Jim, what happens if margins uh, aren't the same tomorrow? You're like, yes, yeah, Scott, but they're great today. If I say, yeah, Jim, but what if okay, earnings Scott, are, well, if, um, let me finish. If I say, but yeah, Jim, but earnings uh, are likely to fall from here, it's like, yes, yeah, Scott, but they're great today. I see everything great today. Tomorrow doesn't seem to matter. Scott, I, 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 I have not made myself clear. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. If Alaska Airlines is raising its capacity, if all of the airlines are raising their capacity and their prices in the face of rising fuel, it implies to me that their margins are gonna be just fine for the future. I mean, this is the, these data points coming out of the airlines are unmitigatedly positive for the future. Yes, things could get bad, but the evidence to me indicates that things are getting better, not worse in the airlines. Josh Brown, your, your, your perspective is what? And then I want to talk to you, Josh, about Uber and the big announcement they make today. But take this issue on first. 
the issue of airlines and fuel no, prices I mean, it's a, or it's just not airlines. It's, I'm not trying to even be as so specific to the airlines, even though we're discussing that issue now. I'm talking about a lot of the positive catalysts that Jim cites, whether that story holds up, as I think you think is suspect. Margins, earnings, look, input look, costs. Yeah, look. Look, this could be, to me, this could be one of those years where the economy outperforms the stock market. What do I mean by that? It's really hard to have a recession with 10 million open jobs. Like, very, very, very hard. Um, however, it's not hard for there to be multiple contraction and negative earnings revisions for the next three quarters because the Fed decides it needs to continue to push down on what, what are known as financial conditions. And that's meaningful. So I don't think it's an emergency situation. You're going to have a trillion dollars in stock buybacks. The Fortune 500 will be just fine in that scenario. Um, but you could end up in a situation where, for the average person, the economy is much better than whatever happens in their 401k. And as I've said repeatedly, I would, I would take that trade 10 times out of 10. We're coming off of 100% returns off the March 2020 lows which was just two years ago yesterday. So if we have to take a time out and allow for the labor market to stay tight and, and, and the economy to continue to heal, if stocks need to take a break, I'm cool with that. If bond returns need to suffer because rates are going up uh, and, and yields are going higher, prices are going lower, I'm cool with that too. Okay. Most of my clients are cool with that. Give They're me wealthy people. So I'm just talking about expectations maybe need to get under control given all of the work the Fed has okay. to try to do here to normalize the Give environment. Give me 30 seconds and no more, not 30 minutes. 30 seconds on Uber, this move today. What's the significance of the news today and more news that may come down the road elsewhere? Well, it's one of the better performing stocks in the market today, so I guess that's a good thing. I'm not sure that this really solves uh, the issues that they're going to have long term. This is really a company that needs automation and driverless to come sooner rather than later. Um, you know, in order for this platform to really realize its full potential. And we're still years away from that. Okay. We'll take a quick break. Up next, we have trades on some of the biggest analyst stock calls of the day, including a bullish note on one of Farmer Jim's favorites. It's up 10% just today. We're back in two minutes.
Welcome back. I'm Rahel Solomon, and here is our CNBC News update at this hour. NATO leaders are extending the term of Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for an extra year due to the security crisis sparked by Russia's war on Ukraine. The news comes as he and President Biden met in Brussels today ahead of the emergency summit between NATO leaders and the G7. A former New York prosecutor who was leading a criminal investigation into former President Trump stated that he believes Trump is, quote, guilty of numerous felony violations. In the resignation letter of Mark Pomerantz, published by The New York Times, he voiced his displeasure towards the new Manhattan district attorney for not pursuing an indictment of Trump. New York Mayor, meantime, Eric Adams is rolling back the city's vaccine mandate for athletes and local performers. Individuals no longer need to be vaccinated to play in city venues and stadiums, although the mandate will remain in place for private workers and also government employees. And for in-depth coverage of the mayor's decision, tune into the news with Shepard Smith tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. And an industrial fire at a potato factory in Maine forced the evacuations of schools and nursing homes in the nearby area. The fire destroyed part of the processor. Officials now have the fire under control and no one was hurt. Scott, I'll send it back to you. Appreciate that very much, Rahel Solomon. All right, shares of Cleveland Cliffs surging almost 10% today as J.P. Morgan reiterates it as their top pick. It's one of our calls of the day. Um, Jim Labenthal, obviously, it's yours. I'm not going to mention who sold it recently and provoke an outburst on Twitter <laughs> or anywhere else. We know who we're talking about. We're not even going to mention his name. We're not even going to mention his name. Voldemort. Okay. Because he generally watches this I, show. I, agree. I just don't want to deal with it. I agree. I agree. It's been a rough go for that guy anyway. Um, $44 look, this, is before, their price target now. They raise it from 37 yeah. They say it's a clear top. Let's pick. do a little. Let's do a little tutorial on stock analysis and stock picking. OK, you go back a week ago and they presented at the J.P. Morgan Industrials Conference and they told you something there. They told you they did 588 million of EBITDA in January. The analyst estimates for the first quarter EBITDA are $1.3 million, $1.3 billion. So they almost did half of that estimate in January when steel prices were depressed. And now you're post Ukraine when steel prices are surging. They're going to blow these estimates out of the water. And you could have picked that up last week. And if you didn't go to the conference, you could have picked it up on Monday when JP Morgan put it in published research. This is all public data. You can do this work if you're a stock picker. Now, you can do more stock picker work. You can go back to the fourth quarter earnings report. After that report, stock was down 10%, okay? And that was about 35 percentage points ago. Everybody got down on the stock because they did some maintenance in the fourth quarter, which was the smartest thing to do because all of their orders are coming in in the first quarter. So get the maintenance done so you can produce at a breakneck speed when prices are going up. It all comes down to excellent management. Lorenzo Gonzalez is truly a genius. But if you are a stock picker and you're doing more than just licking your finger and putting it in the wind, but you're looking at 10 cues and you're talking to management, you can find these things out. Well, I mean, obviously not everybody can talk to management and have some of the access that people like you have. Let me ask you this. Stock I, have no, I have no material non-public information. I this is important. I, I, I have I'm no material non-public information. I, I'm not suggesting in any way that, that you did, and um, I didn't mean it to be portrayed okay. that way at all. Just, just I'm saying that not everybody yep. has access to be able to talk to the CEO. That, that's just a fact. Uh, yes, but through Reg FD, anything that management says to me has to be publicly disseminated. Let me let me be more helpful here, Scott. There is nothing that indicates these results are going to turn down in the future. Okay, not which, with the amount of infrastructure and factories being built. Which then answers my next question: thirty-two dollars forty-nine cents. That's what the stock hit today. Uh, a new fifty-two week high. You're comfortable telling people today to buy this stock fresh here. Well, remember, I hold this, and this is my largest position. Haven't sold a share, even though it's up something like 800% over the last two years. Would I add more today? No, I'd wait for a pullback. But okay. I'm not selling today. I think this is a mid to high 30s stock before I sell a share. Two totally different questions. Um, whether you would sell it today versus whether somebody who's watching you today, as much conviction as you have, should buy it today. Those are two entirely different conversations. Now. Let's if move. you don't own it, you should nibble. I thought you just said you should wait till it pulls back. Yeah, well, you know what? Nibble a little bit. Let it pull back and add to it. If I'm not selling a share and I think it's going to the mid to high 30s at 31.95, which is where it is right now, if you do not own shares, you can buy it right here. 
Okay. I knew this dude was a nibbler. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about other calls that J.P. Morgan made today. Um, they lower their estimates on Ford and GM. They lower their uh, estimates on lower production, higher commodities, and greater reimbursement of supplier costs. They still maintain overweight on both Ford and General Motors. They cut the price target in Ford uh, by a buck. No big whoop. Uh, on General Motors, they cut it by five bucks to 75 from 80. Josh, you first. We know that Jim uh, owns this stock, but so do you in terms of General Motors. Yeah, this feels late-ish. This stock's down 20 points from its January 4th high. I don't really understand uh, what they think has already been priced in, if not exactly what they're saying today. None of this is a secret. The whole world understands that the cost structure has gone up. We're all clear on that. I think that's been more than discounted um, into the share price in just the last three months. I, I'm assuming Jim agrees. Maybe. I know Jim is going to be yeah, positive. Well, on. He's well, going to tell you all the 55 reasons as to why you should own General Motors. Jason Snipe, you don't own any of these automakers. Why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to own auto parts uh, last summer, you know, so obviously that was kind of on the on the play of, you know, everything had been shut down. Well, actually, two summers ago when everything was shut down and everyone's kind of working on their cars. But generally speaking, I could agree with this call. You know, with with input costs going up on, on obviously all the the intimate uh, you know parts that go into these cars, you know, and, and and raising the price of them, you know, yeah, I mean, I I could totally see how this might not work, and you know, we we just haven't been in autos for almost two years now, so okay. that's really our play there. Fair enough, and I, look, I, I know one of the reasons why Jim is positive is because of the EV play that especially General Motors provides. So I'm looking at these comments today to our producer from one Bryn Talkington, who said, and I quote, these companies are not delivering any electric vehicles. Tesla is actually making them and selling them. That's why I don't own Ford or GM. I own a Tesla car, and Jim is still waiting for his caddy. Those are her words <laughs> to the producer, word for word. Bryn, I'll let you expand <laughs> on that, and then I'll let Jim have a crack at this apple. Yeah, we're, we're a multi-car family, but I definitely love the technology uh, that Elon Musk has. I think GM, Jim will correct me or Josh if I'm wrong, I think GM delivered 26, e 26 like 26 EVs in the fourth quarter of 2021. And I don't know if Ford delivered any. I know GM delivered one Hummer. So they are talking about this and they're going to do it eventually. But they're not, and I think investors are investing, waiting for that to happen. But you don't go from delivering 26 in one quarter to 200,000 in the next quarter. And so the way we are playing this is through LIT, which is a Global X lithium ETF that invests not only in companies like Albemarle and the other lithium miners, but you also get the battery producers. And so to me, I want to buy what's under the hood that is in high demand versus I think what's going to be a low margin business that is yet to even play out. I also want to correct something. It says GM target on your screen cut to 22. It's Ford that was cut to 22. Um, GM was cut to 75 uh, from 80. So I just want to make sure we uh, we're all on the same page there. All right, Jim. Ball's yours. I'll give you the keys. How about that? Go ahead. Well, based on today's performance from everyone i think the only person who's going to go for a ride with me in my new lyric when it gets delivered is jason snipe okay so jason you and i will go out we'll have a good time um but actually bryn makes a fabulous point i am still waiting on my lyric and that does bother me in the meantime the legacy uh, internal combustion business is going strong now there's a big problem with production we know that right because of semiconductors and palladiums but the last several quarters have shown that you can generate record earnings at these companies even at these low production levels because people need cars the demand is there and they need pickup trucks for all the factories that are being built out there so earnings are going to hang in there because of higher prices that offset lower volumes. Okay, coming up, Pete Najarian, not on the show today, doesn't matter. He's calling in to reveal unusual activity. Maybe we'll even see him. I don't know if he's calling or not. But he is coming on with his latest trades, and we'll do that next.
I mentioned Pete was going to be here with unusual activity, and in fact, there he is, and he's not on the phone. I can see his face right there. Hey, Pete, what do you got? <laughs> hey, it's great to see you, Scott. I will tell you, uh, the first one I've got for you is Schlumberger. Now, you know how much oil exposure I have. It's really probably by far now the most exposure I've ever had in oil, and when I look at what I've got in terms of right now, in terms of all my option positions, by far it stands out the very most. It's incredible how much there's been. Schlumberger was hitting back at the start of March. Stock was trading about 38.30 at the time. Now up at uh, close to $43 a share. We're seeing some huge buyers, but they're also buying a little bit of time, Scott. They bought 9,200 of the June 45 calls, paying close to $3 for these calls. That's a pretty big trade. This name has hit four separate times so far in the month of March. So still looking for a little bit more energy to go to the upside. And obviously we've been watching crude. Everybody's been watching it every single day. Secondly, I've got a pretty interesting one that I think Jim will probably like as well, Intel. And what we're seeing in there is we're, we're seeing some really big positive moves in the last month, but we're also seeing some big option positioning as well. They were in the April 52 and a half calls. They've rolled out of those and now buying the April 22nd 55 calls. 10,000 of those were bought today. Fairly inexpensive, talking about just a 30 cent option. I've already owned the stock, but I added these calls today as well. I like what we're seeing here, and I really like what we heard from the NVIDIA CEO talking about, hey, they would use uh, Intel to actually get the source of where they're getting their chips from in the future. So that was, uh, I think, a pretty good endorsement for Intel as well. All right, good stuff, Pete. Thanks for coming on today. I appreciate Thanks. it, as always. Farmer Jim, I'll give you a word on Intel if you want to take it. Stock's up 5% today. I think you deserve it. Well, th yeah, you know, I, I don't own the stock. I keep looking at it. I talk to my team, and every time I present it to my team, they say, well, why not NVIDIA? Why not NVIDIA? And again, this news that NVIDIA is going to outsource the manufacturing to Intel, I'd rather be in NVIDIA, which is where I am. Every time I try to make the case, uh, just the logic points me to NVIDIA. Wow. Got to give a hat tip to Josh, man. This has been his baby. Oh, oh, how times have changed for one Jim Lady They call. have. It was painful. Did you guys Those cover days this, were painful. Did you guys, Judge, did you guys cover this NVIDIA uh, GTC conference, <laughs> the highlights? Like, are we even going to get to this? Give me, a, because, give, me, give me a thought on it. Honestly, well, <laughs> they're, they're guiding us toward a software business. Software business. That could be like a $300 billion market. And... They rolled out three AI chips. One of them is a chipset. But the, the transformation that's about to take place in every single industry on Earth related to AI, honestly, feels it feels like we're in the first inning of the Internet all over again, like another Internet-esque opportunity. And NVIDIA is sitting in the center of the entirety of the whole thing. Whether it's whether it's uh, data center or or AI, like all of these applications that have to be built, they're really like a one stop shop, and they dominate every version that you could imagine might happen. And it's it's scary what the potential is. So yeah, it's an expensive stock. It always has been. It never will. It never won't be. Um, but this is a company where the fundamentals have been catching up to the, the valuation pretty much every year okay so i just i thought that this was a remark if you don't know the nvidia story go on youtube and and look at what they had to say about what they're working on now big winner and today. then come talk to me nine percent for nvidia today coming up blackrock's larry fink says russia's war is ending decades of globalization talk about if he's right what that means for how you might invest in the future we'll do it next following the money on the half
Are you following the Halftime Report podcast? What are you waiting for? Real debate and actionable advice from the Investment Committee, plus unusual activity and more. Look for us in your favorite podcasting app. Follow the Halftime Podcast now. If BlackRock CEO Larry Fink is correct and the Russian invasion of Ukraine really does mark the end of globalization as we know it, what are the implications for the way we will invest in the years to come? Our Leslie Picker always following the money for us and she has that angle. And look, I thought the most interesting passage in this, in this letter from Mr. Fink uh, was the following, for at least our, our purposes. Companies and governments will also be looking more broadly at their dependencies on other nations, he wrote. This may lead to companies to onshore or nearshore more of their operations, resulting in a faster pullback for some countries. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, as you sort of turn inward, mm -hmm. what the implications for investors would be. It's a great question, and I think investors are really scratching their heads about how this happened so quickly, because... It's one of those situations, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on, you know, or shame on you, shame on you. You don't know the yeah, saying that you. I'm going. But investors right now, if you were invested in Russian securities, their stock market just reopened on a select number of securities for the first time in a month. If you're an investor who traverses in liquid securities, that's, that's devastating for you. That's totally liquid. Same thing with the bonds. You can't find buyers for those bonds if you want to sell them. So if you take Russia as an example of a market and what can happen essentially overnight due to the actor of, of the head of state and, you know, extrapolate that to other areas, it makes investing elsewhere in certain pockets of the world even more risky. I'm even thinking of, you know, if, if there is this turn inward um, from companies here or even, you know, in, in investors, what it, what it does to things like labor costs, mm -hmm. um, the flow of capital. You know, Jim Labenthal, you, you say you completely agree with Larry Fink and you point to things like chips and the, the supply of chips and where we get them from as an example of how things have and will continue to change. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're moving out of Southeast Asia into Ohio, Austin, Texas, and Arizona. It's not just chips. I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to get rare earth elements out of the control of China by uh, producing at the MP site in California. We're going to be building more uranium mines. We're building more electric vehicle battery factories. Just everything is coming back to the U.S. because, frankly, we've found international suppliers to be less than trustworthy. Yeah. Good things to think about. Um, I wish we had more time to discuss it. We're so too. tight on, on time, uh, Les. I appreciate it very much. That's Leslie Picker, and we'll continue to follow this story. I know you will. Final trades are next.
Four o'clock Eastern time in overtime. Jeremy Siegel, Wharton School Professor of Finance. We'll go head to head on the markets. We'll get his current view, what he thinks about this rally, and whether it's about to evaporate. I look forward to speaking with Mr. Siegel later today in overtime. Final trades now. Bryn, first. Devo, it's another high quality dividend cover call strategy. Okay, Jason Snipe. NVIDIA, screaming innovation, really strong investor day, trillion dollar TAM, stay long here. Yeah, big day for that stock, as Josh Brown told you. Josh, speaking of. Uh, Amazon just erased a 20% sell off to start the year. I think the stock has been de risked. Interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Jim Labenthal. Wind Resorts trying to break out. Guys, thank you. Thanks for watching as well. I'll see you in a little bit in overtime. The exchange is now. Thank you, Scott, and welcome to The Exchange, everyone. I'm Morgan Brennan, and for Kelly Evans, here's what's ahead. President Biden meeting in NATO with NATO today in Brussels. NATO promising more troops and aid to Ukraine. The U.S. putting new sanctions on Russia. Can anything they say or do stop Putin's war? And BlackRock's Larry Fink says this war is the beginning of the end of globalization. What does that mean for the big multinational companies? We're going to get a trader's take. And one potential bright spot for housing. Lumber prices, they're down 20% in a month. Is that enough to offset the cost of rising mortgage rates? We're going to get to that, all of that, but we begin with stocks. And for that, we turn to Dom Chu with the numbers. Dom. All right, Morgan, they're in the green. Stocks very much so. If you take a look at what's happening right now, we have solid gains. It's nothing spectacular, but it's still notable. The Dow Industrial is up about 212 points right now. That's more than one half of 1%. To give you some context, at the highs of the session, we were up 279 points in the Dow at the lows, just a mere four points to the downside. You can see we're tilted towards the higher end of the daily trading range right now. The S&P 500 just a little below that 4,500 mark, 41 handles to the upside there, up nearly 1%, and one and a quarter percent gains for the composite, up 175 points, 14,100 the last trade there. Thematically speaking, we are seeing a pause. A pause in the late rally that we've seen in Chinese internet stocks. Take a look at some of those big names that we've seen so far in trading today. Pin Duo Duo down almost 8%. JD.com down 5.5%. Baidu down nearly 4%. Netty's down almost 3.5% as well. And the Crane Shares China CSI Internet ETF down 3%. These four, by the way, Netty's, Baidu, JD, and Pin Duo Duo, four of the worst performers in the large cap NASDAQ 100. So check, check out those. Remember, Big downtrends overall for these names, a bounce near term pulling back again today. One other stock you're going to want to keep a close eye on is what's happening right now with Darden Restaurants. This is the parent company of Olive Garden, the Longhorn Steakhouse. You can see they're up about 2.5% right now, reversing some pre-market losses. They had come out with a quarterly earnings report that was below expectations for both profits and revenues. Restaurant sales at established restaurant locations also coming in slower than some had hoped for. So Darden Restaurant's doing better. They, by the way, also kind of lower their full year outlook. Still, though, what you have seen is the luxury side of things in Capitol Grill driving some of those same store restaurant gains. And then a check on the so-called meme stocks. They've been volatile as of late. Entering today, we saw GameStop riding a seven-day win streak. AMC Entertainment, a four-day win streak. But today, we are seeing a pullback. AMC is down roughly 3% intraday. GameStop down about 5% as well. But you can see there that recent volatility has been to the upside for sure. We'll get a check on those. Keep an eye on GameStop, Morgan, and AMC. I'll send things back over to you. Dom Chu, thank you. Meantime, President Biden is meeting with global leaders in Brussels and speaking at a European Council summit about the war in Ukraine. Kayla Tausche is in Brussels with the latest. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Morgan. President Biden is currently debriefing his team before addressing heads of state from the European Union. This after a morning filled with emergency summits with NATO and the G7 focused on the war in Ukraine, whose president, Volodymyr Zelensky, delivered an impassioned plea to transatlantic leaders to better arm Ukraine with their planes, their tanks and their missiles. You can give us just 1% of all your airplanes, just 1% of your tanks. We cannot simply buy it. Such shipment depends on NATO decisions, political decisions, volley fire systems, anti-ship weapons, air defense systems. How can we survive this war without such equipment? 
As the war enters its second month, allies are increasingly concerned that Russia will resort to using weapons of mass destruction. The White House is currently contingency planning for that possibility with its so-called Tiger Team over the next several months. NATO's Secretary General did not confirm the use of phosphorus bombs in Ukraine by Russia, but said the alliance is equipping Ukraine to detect and protect against chemical attacks and to handle any possible contamination. This as they try to cut off funding for the war. World, world leaders are taking collective action to keep Russia from evading those punishing sanctions. G7 nations restricting Russian transactions using gold. A senior administration official estimating Russia's central bank held more than $100 billion in gold and was using it to prop up the ruble. Leaders will also discuss Europe's energy outlook with Europe still buying energy from Russia. But there are skeptics on accelerating any move away from Russian energy. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz said just yesterday stopping the purchase of Russia's Russian energy would cause a recession. Morgan. It's definitely a key part of this broader conversation, Kayla, uh, which brings me to my question to you. We're starting to see headlines that the EU is set to receive LNG shipments from the U.S. under plans that are being finalized. Is the expectation that we're going to hear more about that over the next 24 hours and that it is, in fact, going to become a reality? Well, that is what we're expecting to happen tomorrow morning, Morgan. Um, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is set to meet with President Biden tomorrow. We've been told by the White House that any potential LNG announcement would come in the wake of that meeting. Von der Leyen has said for her part that she wants the U.S. to commit to shoring up Europe's natural gas supply for the next two winters. Of course, Europe had been getting the majority of its gas from Russia. Uh, as they try to build up their storage supply, they need Russian gas to fill up some of those reserves. Unclear what would happen over the next course of uh, these two winters if they did not have that. Morgan. Kayla, Kayla Tausche, thank you. Well, my next guest says the NATO summit is a great show of unity, but don't expect any breakthroughs for peace in Ukraine. Let's bring in Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School. She's also the great granddaughter of former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Um, professor, it's great to have you on, or back on, I, I should say. Uh, given the fact that you do know these countries as deeply as you do and the history that goes back many centuries, um, is there anything here today in terms of these meetings between world leaders that moves the needle on the conflict as we see it playing out on the ground right now? I don't see it. I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see it. We, in fact, already heard that uh, although there is a danger of using uh, the Kremlin using weapons of mass destruction, potentially chemical weapons, we already heard today that if uh, those weapons may, and hopefully not, but may be used in Ukraine and stay in Ukraine, NATO is not going to interfere. We heard Joe Biden before, uh, even if he uh, was calling Putin the war criminal, saying that he would do anything not to uh, increase the conflict. Uh, uh, John Stoltenberg, uh, uh, Jan Stoltenberg was saying that NATO is not party to that conflict. So it does seem that the showing of unity is important. The sanctions are important to keep to keep pressing for for the West. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky spoke again and asked for uh, no fly zone. Uh, and uh, um, airplanes and tanks and so on. But his foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, said that we are not going to participate in the summit because we already know that NATO is not ready to accept us. So there's a little bit uh, kind of push and pull even from Ukraine. So the unity is there, but uh, the idea that Vladimir Putin at this point can be stopped probably is not there, and I believe it's a correct one. I don't think he's going to pay attention to the NATO summit uh, to see the errors of his way and withdraw from Ukraine at this time. So in light of that, and I've heard this from national security and defense officials here in the U.S. in my conversations and reporting as well, that when you're talking about Vladimir Putin, you're talking about someone who does not see losing as an option. So what would it actually take to stop him? Do we know? Well, uh, the negotiations with Ukraine, and I think Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, said it better than anybody, or probably more often than anybody, that this is the negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. So if they come to some sort of an agreement, which, has, which is going to be incredibly unfortunate for Ukraine, but may stop the war, that is 
the case. And I also think that for Putin, at least if we ask for solutions, for Putin, the more weapons Ukraine gets, the less likely he will stop attacking it. So that's another conundrum that the West and Ukraine need to address, because it does seem that, I mean, it doesn't seem, they need to have more weapons to defend themselves, but the more weapons they get, the, the more forceful Russia becomes in eliminating it. So it is only the agreement uh, that uh, between Ukraine and Russia, and, and Russia, Russia wants uh, incredible amount of concessions. But if that comes to some sort of a, um, a negotiation final point, that may stop and will let uh, troops be withdrawn. What it is for the future of Ukraine, that's another question, because um, uh, with you, will Ukraine exist as an independent nation after those, in, in, the, in the form that it is now, uh, after all these agreements, um, uh, negotiations with Putin would be met? That's a question. Mm. Uh, so no matter how this plays out, I mean, I think it's, it's safe to say the world has changed. We're having this conversation. You have high-profile investors today talking about the end of globalization, for example. Um, where Russia specifically is concerned, now that we've seen these sanctions put in place, we're seeing that economy thrust into, into turmoil as quickly as we are. Uh, what does that look like in Eastern Europe? What does it look like in terms of all of these uh, trade dynamics, potentially, between Europe and Russia and the rest of the world? Well, I mean, w trade dynamics no longer, essentially no longer exist mm -hmm. uh, between Russia and, and in Europe. I mean, of course, there's still gas. And that's another thing. I mean, Putin wanted to show that gas is important uh, uh, for, for Europe and he is the, or Russia is the uh, solid supplier of it. So now, in fact, by actions in Ukraine, he only increased, um, uh, increased the time frame in which other energy supplies will be invented, created, and, and, and whatnot. So that's, that's, that becomes a problem for Russia. But I think, you know, the mood, at least in Russia, in, in official mood in Russia, is that the sanctions were coming anyway. Uh, more and more often we see, we hear from the state officials that what, you, what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now is it, it, it doesn't allow itself to be eliminated from the world map. So it would be would have been eliminated in globalization because that's what the West always wanted. But now it's going to create its own greatness and therefore doesn't need the world. And it does seem uh, to be a problem also for at least for the Russian near abroad, because the Central Asian republics are suffering already tremendously from sanctions and, and mm. un beginning unemployment and whatnot. So I think the ripple effect, uh, if not the, if, if not an explosion, uh, is already here, and then soon we'll uh, we'll see more results uh, and more maybe uh, in in years to come that all countries would start being dependent on themselves rather than others. And we already saw yeah. this trend in COVID, and Putin just exasperated it. Professor, thank you so much for joining us, Nina Khrushchev. Thank you. We've got some breaking news on Apple. Meantime, and Steve Kovac has that story for us. Steve. Hey, Morgan, Apple shares are up just a bit on this Bloomberg report that Apple is considering a iPhone hardware subscription program. Now, this is something investors and analysts have been like really watching for since they started bundling services together. And so in theory, what this does is you pay a yearly or a monthly fee and every year you get a new iPhone and it bundles together with all those services like Apple Music, Apple Fitness and so on. Um, I've reached out to the company, nothing yet from them, but uh, it is moving shares. This is something people have been expecting Apple to do uh, for quite some time. Steve, thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Shares of Apple up 1%. Well, the Russia-Ukraine war is causing big names on Wall Street to believe this will be the end of globalization, as we just touched on. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink saying, quote, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has put an end to the globalization we have experienced over the last three decades. It has left many communities and people feeling isolated and looking inward. I believe this has exacerbated the polarization and extremist behavior we are seeing across society today. If this comes to pass, what does this mean for international investors? Joining me now, Tim Seymour, Chief Investment Officer at Seymour Asset Management and a fast money trader. Tim, it's great to see you. Hey, Morgan. I would argue, okay, perhaps this conflict has um, sort of exacerbated the situation, but I would argue that the pandemic and then before that, the trade war actually sort of triggered this process of deglobalization. As somebody who has invested across the world for many years, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I've been chasing the global trade for a long time, and, and I would argue, sadly, 
that globalization probably peaked at the great financial crisis. And, and you know, when central banks around the world, first of all, uh, had to protect jobs on a sovereign level more than they cared about efficiencies, we had the public sector bail out the private sector. Um, global trade as a percentage of GDP peaked in 2008, and we've been, we've been fighting that. You talk about the pandemic. That, that obviously was a case where uh, look at our drug companies, look at our healthcare system, look at the way that uh, the U.S. and Europe were vaccinated first, look at uh, you know, some of the dynamics around uh, then China with their Made in China 2025. That's not about uh, let's you know, broaden and diversify our economy. It's let's protect China and put China first in terms of the global Internet and cybersecurity and making sure that China is not on the wrong side of nanotechnology. So we've seen this for many years, but uh, Russia, Ukraine is a sad reminder uh, about strategic important sectors. So how do you invest for this new global world order, deglobalized world order, if you will? Well, clearly there, there are negative consequences. Uh, a lot of the, the, the inflationary dynamics that we see in the world are, are ones that we thought were a function of, of uh, uh, COVID or you know, supply chain dynamics. But some of it really, again, started where we have seen the global economy become much more regional. Uh, I think there's higher inflation. I think there's going to be a, a case where investors need to find those strategic sectors. Uh, I, I think in terms of multinationals, they will be more exposed. And, and if you look at small and, and mid-cap companies, they will outperform, I, I believe. And I believe they've actually uh, outperformed over the last 15 years or so during this period where globalization has kind of peaked. So. Um, Strategic sectors, obviously the energy sector has been front and center. And, and as much as people think that this is a trade and that oil will be lower by, you know, whether it's six or 12 months out, I, the lack of investment in the energy sector means that there are structural reasons why oil prices stay high. Uh, the energy sector as an investment is, you know, the energy sector is less than 4% of the S&P and, and of, the, of the, you know, the, the S&P 500. And if you think about where energy peaked in the financial crisis, it was close to 16%. I think this trade's on your side. Obviously, the uranium trade specifically around energy, uh, URA is an ETF, CCJ, both things I own. Um, I think the defense sector obviously also brought into you know, front and center. And then regionally, I think you know, Mexico, for example, is a major beneficiary of, of outsourcing, but regional outsourcing. Mm. Uh, also, they are an oil economy still, and I think there's, there's a lot to say about that. Yeah, nearshoring, um, at least where the U.S. is concerned, sure. which sort of raises the question. You've got central banks tightening around the world. You've got high inflation. You've got a strengthening dollar. And then, of course, you've got this reorganization of supply chains. Where does that leave emerging markets more broadly? It's, it's tough. I, I think investors need to be more... Um, you know, need to not seek out the EEM or the VWO as ETFs to get the entire asset class because that's 40 percent China. Um, and maybe China has bottomed. But I, I think you know, owning the EWZ or owning Brazil, EWW, Mexico, is the way to invest in emerging markets. As someone that's been an emerging market investor much of his career, it, it, I'm not happy to see that if you invested in the EEM versus the, the SPY over the last 15 years, you've continued to make lower lows. So I think you have to pick your parts of this trade because there is higher growth. There are demographics. Mm. Uh, EHEM is not dead. In fact, I, I just think you have to be a lot more selective than, than taking a proxy play approach. Tim, it's great to see you. Tim Seymour. Thanks, Morgan. See you soon. Thanks. Well, coming up, the U.S. already banned Russian oil imports. And now the White House is looking to strike a deal that could reduce Europe's energy dependence on Moscow. What does that mean for crude and nat gas prices, which have rallied since the Ukraine invasion? That's coming up next. Plus, check out some of the housing stocks sliding to new 52-week lows. Whirlpool, Stanley Black & Decker, Fortune Brands, they're all down more than 20% year to date now. Are they the victims of the commodity crunch or a canary in the coal mine for the rest of the market? The exchange is back after this. This is The Exchange on CNBC.
Welcome back to the exchange. More volatility for energy prices with WTI and Brent crude lower for the second time in three sessions. Yet both are still positive for the week and on pace for their best month since November of 2020 as the war in Ukraine disrupts global supply. The White House reportedly closing in on a deal with the European Union to help ease its dependence on Russian energy, including more supply of natural gas. It's an announcement that's expected as soon as tomorrow. What could that mean for consumers and investors? Well, let's ask Paul Sankey, lead analyst at Sankey Research. Paul, great to speak with you today. Hi, thanks for having me. We have seen some volatility in energy prices uh, in the futures market. I do want to get your take on where we go from here between the fact that we've seen inventory depletion here in the U.S. We're having this conversation about uh, Europe potentially weaning itself more off of uh, Russian oil supplies, and then we've seen some other disruptions and issues going on in, in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East as well. Where does that position us going into the warmer months? Well, I mean, obviously, what you're referring to with the warmer months is driving season in the U.S. with mm. very low unemployment. So we're going to see, as we always do, two things. Firstly, you get more demand during the summer, but before summer, the refiners need to switch to make summer-grade gasoline, which tends to tighten the market. But they're actually struggling to make diesel because we're most short of all distillate, which is diesel effectively. And therefore, we may have a gasoline shortage this summer. We're talking about $110 to $140 Brent over the course of this year. So at $120 today, we're kind of in line with where we thought we would be given uh, the disaster in Ukraine. Does the U.S. have natural gas to supply to Europe right now? And what does that do to the pricing dynamic for nat gas? You know, the biggest problem with natural gas in the U.S. isn't the geology, it's the pipelines. You know, what they've got to do is, is much more to facilitate pipelines. Natural gas is responsible for the lowering of U.S. carbon dioxide emissions over the past 20 years as it replaced coal in the balance. So I'm very against lumping uh, natural gas in with coal and calling it fossil fuels. It doesn't make any sense. And, of course, we've seen in, the, in Europe with very aggressive... Um, carbon dioxide reduction emissions targets, they ended up hugely dependent on natural gas, and that's become obviously a huge problem for them. But it's, as you imply, it's very good news for U.S. E&P companies. And right here, we have the Marcellus, uh, which we call the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. So the potential is very much for us to export a lot more natural gas, and it's very good news for the United States of America. So who stands to benefit company-wise and producer-wise? Well, ripping today, uh, EQT is pretty much the biggest U.S. gas producer. Uh, Tellurian is uh, an LNG export play that isn't up and running yet, but is a development company. And the classic is always Chenier, which is the existing major LNG exporter in the U.S. A couple of others that have been beaten up are Shell and Total, major exporters of LNG from the U.S. So there's a number of ways, but not that many. And we think Shell should break up and actually make a standalone LNG company to take advantage of what's going to be a huge future for LNG. Just one add on, on LNG, demand didn't fall during COVID to give you an idea of the structural secular bull case for that particular energy thing. Mm. Yeah, it's a key point. And we talk about it, I mean, it as perhaps as it rightly should be as a bridge fuel, but also when you talk about adoption of hydrogen technologies, natural gas and LNG plays a role potentially in that process as well. Um, you just mentioned the possibility of shortages of gasoline and, and uh, fuel shortages this summer. I mean, how real is that? How do we avoid that? Well, we're just very concerned about inventory levels. And, you know, what we've had this week, which caused oil to go up a lot yesterday, were two things. Firstly, Putin saying that he wants to be paid in rubles, which obviously is having everyone scratch their head, yeah. but also simultaneously reminding everyone what a disaster this dependence on Putin is. Um, that was the first thing. And then secondly, the Russians announced they would block off Kazakh oil exports uh, which is, you know, a million barrels a day of additional lost exports of oil that's not actually sanctioned but has to travel through Russia. So just those things alone are, are kind of scaring the market, and we're pricing the potential for really major problems, particularly as regards that ruble payment thing, which basically Europe can't uh, substitute the amount of Russian gas they use uh, anytime soon. It's just not physically possible, particularly for Germany. So there's a real there's a real problem here, and and you know the market's pricing, as you know, European gas accordingly, essentially trying to destroy as much demand as it possibly can, unfortunately. So effectively, there already is a shortage. Paul Sankey, thank you for your insights. Thank you. Well, still ahead, Alaska Air is outperforming its peers after giving new guidance. The stock is up nearly 30 percent in two weeks after hitting a 16-month low. 
Later on in the show, we'll tell you what the street's excited about and what the CEO is saying about rising fuel prices and airfares as we continue that energy conversation. Plus, this stock is trying to snap an eight-month losing streak. It is the longest since going public. Up next, we'll tell you what it is. And what's weighing on the share is it's down 60%, 68% since last summer. The exchange is back after this. Uh, well, right now we want to bring you to Brussels, to NATO's headquarters, where President Biden is expected to speak momentarily. Uh, once he steps out onto that podium, we will bring you there live uh, for those comments. We will continue to monitor that in the meantime. But welcome back to the exchange. President Biden, as I just mentioned, expected to hold this press conference uh, in just a few moments. The markets right now, though, trading higher. The S&P is up about 1 percent, 44.98, so just below that 4,500 level. The Dow is up 235 points nearing the highs of the session so far of about seven tenths of one percent the nasdaq is the outperformer as we've seen tech stocks uh the best performing sector in general today up about 1.2 percent real estate is the only sector in the red right now uh we're also seeing materials and communication services higher alongside those tech stocks but we're going to take it back over to shepherd smith and President Biden at NATO headquarters. Hi, Chef. Morgan. Thanks very much. Just moments ago, we got the warning that the president will be out in just about two minutes. You know, he's speaking with leaders from all of the NATO countries about how to shore up the sanctions, how to help the Ukrainians militarily, and what to do about the humani humanitarian crisis that's building really by the moment. CBC senior White House correspondent Kayla Tausch is traveling with the president and live with us in Brussels, and we'll hear from her just after the president speaks this afternoon. We have heard from spokespeople today about uh, what exactly has been going on uh, throughout the day. He has five different sessions in which the president is participating. And Jake Sullivan spoke to us earlier in the day about the key points that they were going to be discussing and shoring up the, this align, alliance. They want to present a, a focused and one-voice presence in, in response to Russia in solidification with the Ukrainians and, and throughout the day come to an agreement on what sort of military response would be necessary, for instance, if the Russians escalate this attack. 
if they were to use chemical or biological weapons? What would the NATO response be? We've asked the NATO Secretary General about this matter, who, by the way, was just given another term as the head of NATO. We didn't get specifics from him on that matter. But the hope was that these, that the leaders of the different NATO countries might be able to give a specific answer to what would happen to Vladimir Putin and Russian forces if, in fact, they did escalate and use chemical or biological weapons. Nuclear is not something, we know what na a nuclear would be. Uh, a nuclear attack that infected in any way a NATO ally would mean uh, it's considered an attack on all. At any rate, uh, we're lucky enough to have Kayla Tausche with us live now from Brussels. Kayla, what's the top line on what we expect to hear now from President Biden? Well, you can expect President Biden to talk about the unity of this alliance, how it is unprecedented and how it has been fomented in recent months, despite these circumstances that have brought the world leaders to this point. But I think what's important to remember, Shep, is that behind the flowery language of some of these joint communiques, there is some differences behind the scenes. And it was at the one year press conference where President Biden seemed to slip up about that. Good the president everyone. is coming to the stage right now. With all the press is here, you must be getting very tired. Am I the 16th or 17th? At any rate, all kidding aside, thank you uh, for taking the time. I, uh, today marks one month since Russia began its carnage in Ukraine, the brutal invasion of Ukraine. And uh, we held a NATO summit the very next day. At that time, my overwhelming objective is wanting that summit was to have absolute unity on three key important issues among our NATO and European allies. First was <clears throat> to support Ukraine with military and humanitarian assistance. Second was to impose the most significant, the most significant sanctions, economic sanction regime ever, in order to cripple Putin's economy and punish him for his actions. Third was to fortify the eastern flank of our NATO allies who were obviously very, very concerned and somewhat at worried of what would happen. We accomplished all three of these, and today we're determined to sustain those efforts and to build on them. The United States is committed to provide over $2 billion in military equipment to Ukraine since I became president, anti-air systems, anti-armor systems, ammunition, and our weapons are flowing in Ukraine as I speak. And today, I'm announcing the United States is prepared to commit more than $1 billion in humanitarian assistance to help get relief to millions of Ukrainians affected by the war in Ukraine. Many Ukrainian refugees will, uh, will wish to stay in Europe, closer to their homes. But we also will welcome 100,000 Ukrainians to the United States with a focus on reuniting families. And we will invest $320 million to bolster democratic resilience and defend human rights in Ukraine and neighboring countries. We're also coordinating with the G7 and the European Union on food security as well as energy security. And I'll have more to say about that tomorrow. We're also announcing new sanctions of more than 400 individuals and entities aligned with in alignment with the European Union. More than 300 members of the Duma, oligarchs, and Russian defense companies that fuel the Russian war machine. In addition to the 100,000 U.S. forces now stationed in Europe to defend NATO territory, NATO established, as you already know, four new battle groups in Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Slovakia to reinforce the Eastern Front. Putin was banking on NATO being split. My early conversation with him in December and early January was clear to me he didn't think we could sustain this cohesion. NATO has never, never been more united than it is today. Putin is getting exactly the opposite what he intended to have as a consequence of going into Ukraine. We built that same unity with our European, the European Union and with the leading democracies of the G7, in the G7. So I want to thank you, and I'll be now happy to take your questions. Since there's so many people out there, I'm going to be given a list. Now, how about Chris of the Associated Press? First question. Hi, thank you, Mr. President. 
So you've warned about the real threat of chemical weapons being used. Have you gathered specific intelligence that suggests that President Putin is deploying these weapons, moving them to position, or considering their use? And would the U.S. or NATO respond with military action if he did use chemical weapons? You know, on the first question, I can't answer that. I'm not going to give you intelligence data, number one. Number two, we would respond. We would respond if he uses it. The nature of the response would depend on the nature of the use. Uh, Josh of Bloomberg. Fired your voice. I'd have been elected a lot earlier. I'll give, I'll give it a try. He's got a long arm. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, talk to us about two things, sir? One, since your conversation with President Xi of China, have you seen any indications of action or lack of action from China that has led you to believe whether they will intervene and help Russia either with the sale of arms or, uh, or the provision of supplies to support this war in Ukraine? And secondly, uh, can you say whether this, uh, the conversation today turned to the subject of food shortages and what the U.S. will do to address wheat shortages in particular as a result of this war? Thank you. On the first question relating to uh, President Xi Jinping of China, I had a, uh, a very straightforward conversation with, with Xi uh, now, I guess it's uh, six days ago, seven days ago in that range. And uh, I... Uh, made it clear to him, I made no threats, but I made it clear to him that make sure he understood the consequences of him helping Russia, as had been reported and as, as what it was expected. And uh, I made no threats, but I pointed out the number of American and foreign corporations that left Russia as a consequence of their barbaric behavior. And I indicated that uh, I knew how much he, uh, because we had long discussions in the past about his interest in making sure he had economic relations and economic growth with Europe and the United States, and indicated that he'd be putting himself at significant jeopardy in those, in those aims if, in fact, he were to move forward. I uh, am not going to comment on any detail about what we know or don't know as a consequence of that conversation. But uh, tomorrow is the tomorrow or next Monday that Ursula is having that conference with China. Uh, with she, the, the first a, on, on April first. We've had discussions because I think that um, uh, China understands that uh, its economic future is much more closely tied to the West uh, than it is to Russia. And so uh, I, uh, I, I'm hopeful that he, uh, he does not get engaged. We also did discuss today that there's a need for us to set up, NATO to set up, and, and the EU, to set up a system whereby we have an organization looking at who has violated any of the sanctions and where and when and how they violated them. And that's something we're going to put in train. It's not done yet. So, uh, with regard to uh, um, uh, Xi, I, uh, I have not, nothing more to report. With regard to food shortage, yes, we did re re to talk about food shortages. And, uh, and it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And uh, because both uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the breadbasket of Europe in terms of wheat, for example. Just to give you one example. But <clears throat> we had a long discussion uh, in the G7 with, uh, um, the, uh, with both uh, the United States, which has a, as a significant, the third largest producer of wheat in the world, as well as Canada, which is also a major, major producer. And we both talked about how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food, sh food shortages. In addition to that, we talked about uh, urging all the European countries and everyone else to end trade restrictions on, on sending uh, lim limitations on sending food abroad. And so we are in the process of working out with our European friends what it would be, what it would take to help alleviate the concerns relative to 
of food shortages. We also talked about a significant major U.S. investment, among others, in terms of providing for the need for humanitarian assistance, including food, as we move forward. Um, uh, Tarina of the Wall Street Journal. Watch, watch out, you don't get hit in the head there now. Mr. President, in your view, does President Zelensky need to cede any Ukrainian territory in order to gain a ceasefire with Russia, or is that completely off the table? And then also, do you think uh, that Russia needs to be removed from the G20? On the latter point, my answer is yes. That depends on the G20. Um, I, that, that was raised today. and. Uh, I raise the possibility if that can't be done, if Indonesia and others do not agree, then we should, in my view, ask to have both uh, um, Ukraine uh, be able to attend the meetings, as well as uh, um, basically Ukraine being able to attend the G20 meeting and observe. With regard to, what was the first question? That is a total judgment based on Ukraine. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. I don't believe that they're going to have to do that, but that's a judgment. There's negotiations that are discussions, I should say, that have taken place that I have not been part of, including Ukrainians, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's their judgment to make. Um, Cecilia, ABC. There you are. Oh. oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sir, you've made it very clear in this conflict that you do not want to see World War III. But is it possible that in expressing that so early that you were too quick to rule out direct military intervention in this war, could Putin have been emboldened knowing that you are not going to get involved directly in this conflict? No and no. And to clarify on chemical weapons, could, if chemical weapons were used in Ukraine, would that trigger a military response from NATO? It would, re it would trigger a response in kind, whether or not you're asking whether NATO would cross, we'd make that decision at the time. And my final question, because you're heading to Poland tomorrow, do you think that getting a first-hand look at the effects of this war on these millions of Ukrainians who have fled their country could change the way that you might respond? I don't think so, because I've been to many, many war zones. I've been in re refugee camps. I've been in war zones for the last 15 years. And it's, 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 it's devastating. And uh, but the thing you look at the most is you see these young children. You see children without parents that are in those camps or in, in uh, refugees. You see women and husbands and men and women who are completely lost and have no nose. You see the look, that blank look on their face, that absolute feeling of, my God, where am I? What, what, what's going to happen to me? And so it, what it will do, it will reinforce my commitment to have the United States make sure we are a major piece of dealing with the relocation of all those folks, as well as humanitarian assistance needed both inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine. For example, this is not something that Poland or Romania or Germany should carry on their own. This is an international responsibility. The United States is the leader, one of the leaders in the international community, has an obligation to be engaged, to be engaged and do all we can to ease the suffering and pain of innocent women and children and men, for that matter, throughout, the, th throughout Ukraine and those who have made it across the border. I plan on attempting to see those folks, as well as I hope I'm going to be able to see, I guess I'm not supposed to say where I'm going, am I? But anyway, I hope I get to see a, a lot of people. <laughs> um, Marcus of Der Spiegel. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, there is a presidential election coming up in 2024, and as you You're know, kidding. there are wide yes, <laughs> that's true, uh, and uh, there are widespread concerns in Europe that um, a figure like your predecessor, maybe even your predecessor himself, 
might uh, get elected president again. Um, so um, are there any steps, anything uh, you are trying to do and NATO is trying to do here these days to prevent what you're trying to do uh, becoming undone two years from now? No, I, I, that's not how I think of this. I've been dealing with foreign policy for longer than anybody that's involved in this process right now. I have no concerns about the impact. I, I made a commitment when I ran this time. I wasn't going to run again, and I mean that sincerely. I had no intention of running for president again. And uh, until I saw those folks coming out of the fields in Virginia carrying torches and carrying Nazi banners and literally singing the same vile rhyme that they used in Germany in, in the early 20s, or 30s, I should say. And, um, and then when the gentleman you mentioned was asked what he thought, and a young woman was killed, a protester, and he asked, was asked what he thought, uh, he said, they're very good people on both sides. And that's when I decided I wasn't going to be quiet any longer. And when I ran this time, and I think the American press, whether they look at me favorably or unfavorably, acknowledges, I made a determination. Nothing is worth, no election is worth my not doing exactly what I think is the right thing. Not a joke. I'm too long in the tooth to fool with this any longer. And so we're a long way off in elections, a long way off. My focus, if any election, is on making sure that we retain the House and the United States Senate so that I have the room to continue to do the things that I've been able to do in terms of grow the economy and deal in a rational way with American foreign policy and lead the world, lead, be the leader of the free world. So, uh, um, but it's not, a, it, it's not an illogical question for someone to ask. I say to people at home, Imagine if we sat and watched the, uh, the doors of the Bundestag broken down and police officers killed and hundreds of people storming in. Or imagine if we saw that happening in the British Parliament or whatever. How would we feel? And uh, one of the things that I take some solace from is I don't think you'll find any European leader who uh, thinks that... Uh, I am not up to the job. Um, and I mean that sincerely. It's not like, whoa, it's that's that. The point is that when the first G7 meeting I attended, like the one I did today, was in Great Britain. And I sat down and I said, America's back. And one of, the, one, one of my counterparts, colleagues, the head of state said, for how long? For how long? And so I don't blame, I don't, I don't criticize anybody for asking that question. But... Uh, uh, the next election, I'd be very fortunate if I had that same man running against me. Thank you very, very much. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, yeah, one final question, right. Hey, look, wait, hold on a second, please. I was supposed to be an hour ago at the European Union meeting and to speak. No, no I'm thanking you. Uh, so, so someone I haven't called on before. You. you. Who are you? I'm Christina Arcadia from CBS. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, deterrence didn't work. What makes you think Vladimir Putin will alter course based on the action you've taken today? Let's get something straight. You remember, if you covered me from the very beginning, I did not say that, in fact, the sanctions would deter him. Sanctions never deter. You keep talking about that. Sanctions never deter. The maintenance of sanctions, the maintenance of sanctions, the increasing the pain and the demonstration why I asked for this NATO meeting today is to be sure that after a month we will sustain what we're doing, not just next month, the following month, but for the remainder of this entire year. That's what will stop him. Do you believe the actions today will have an impact on making Russia change course in Ukraine? That's not what I said. You, you, you're, you're playing a game with me. I know. The answer is no. I think what happens is we have to demonstrate the purpose, the single most important thing is for us to stay unified and the world continue to focus on what a brute this guy is and all the innocent people's lives are being lost and ruined and what's going on. That's the important thing. But look, if you're Putin and you think that the 
that Europe is going to crack in a month or six weeks or two months. Why not? You, they can take anything for another month, but we have to demonstrate it. The reason I asked for the meeting, we have to stay fully, totally, thoroughly united. Thank you. President Biden uh, answering questions in Brussels as he continues the NATO summit to try to deter uh, President Putin from continuing his onslaught in Ukraine. Uh, some news on a couple of fronts, I think. Uh, there was this discussion about what would happen if, if uh, the Russians unleashed chemical or biological weapons or got into their nuclear armaments. The president said the United States would, would respond and that the United States would respond uh, in, by a means that are determined by the way they are used. So no real specifics there except to say the United States would respond. In fact, the White House has put together uh, a national security team and intelligence team which is working on all of the options that would happen if something happened with a NATO company, country, if there were a bombing of relief supplies coming into Ukraine. The president also talked about sanctions. Uh, and for the sanctions, especially on members of the parliament there, the Duma in in, uh, in Russia. Let's get to our senior White House correspondent, Kayla Tausche, who's live in Brussels and traveling with the president. Lots of new sanctions imposed today, Kayla. A lot of new sanctions, and I think a little bit of news right there from the president where he said that uh, that NATO allies are united in keeping those sanctions in place as long as it would take President Putin to reverse course. President Biden reiterating that he did not believe that sanctions were meant to deter from the outset, despite what several members of his, his administration said as the basis for that strategy, but said that they are committed to leaving those sanctions in place for up to a year or longer if needed, if that is what it takes to get Putin to back off and withdraw his forces uh, from Ukraine. He also said that he personally supports uh, the withdrawal of Russia from the G20, the group of the 20 largest economies in the world. Uh, of course, you need member countries to vote on that. And Biden suggested that perhaps other members like Indonesia would not agree with the position of the U.S., but that if Russia were kept in the G20, that other countries, he noted Ukraine, should be invited to the table as well. Uh, finally, he was asked about his legacy and his involvement in U.S. foreign policy uh, and the uh, the effort that he has put into rebuilding these alliances, and he was asked uh, very clearly how he would feel if someone else were elected after him and simply ripped up the seeds that he has sown over the last several months. He said he does not think about it that way. He would be happy to run against uh, former President Trump, although he did not say his name, uh, and said that he thinks that European leaders would say that President Biden has done a good job. Chef. Thanks very much, Kayla Tauchi. <clears throat> excuse me, traveling with the president in Brussels. The NATO, NATO is sending four new battalion groups to enforce the Eastern Front. And as the president said just now, $1 billion from the United States in humanitarian assistance for the refugee crisis that is mounting and building even now. Complete coverage of the president's activities in that NATO summit tonight, 7 Eastern, on the news on CNBC. For now, Morgan, back to you. Shepard Smith, thank you. Well, we're turning back to the exchange here. And, of course, we have this conversation around the latest geopolitical happenings with the markets uh, all in the green right now. The S&P up 1 percent, retracing 4,500. We've got concerns about inflation rates and, as I just mentioned, geopolitical risk. My next, my next guest says no matter what happens, value stocks will outperform over the longer term. Joining me now is Eli Salzman, portfolio manager of the Newberger Berman Large Cap Value Fund. Eli, thanks for being on. Um, Lay out the case for me for why value is so, so compelling even now, even after the fact that we have seen some of those value-oriented sectors outperform the market year to date. Sure. You know, we're, we're, thank you for having me. Uh, we're, we're in a very different world now. The world of disinflation that we've been in for the last 30, 35, 40, 45 years is over. We're now entering a world with much more inflation, both on a secular and a cyclical basis. And in an inflationary environment, we're looking at higher interest rates, and we're clearly looking at value over growth. Remember, growth is long duration, value is short duration. As rates rise, you clearly don't want to be long duration. So looking further than the bond market, uh, arguably, to ask the question, what happens if stalling economic growth actually becomes a reality in the coming months and coming years? Does that not actually reignite growth stocks? You know, the, the answer is, um, if the valuations were a little different, it might. But right now, growth is in the 90th percentile relative to value. We've never seen growth valuations quite like this before, including 2000. 
So the, the answer is, um, you know, if economic, if economic growth decelerates here, clearly it's not going to be good for value or growth. Stocks will go down, but value will outperform growth on the downside. And then we believe that value will outperform on the upside when we come back out of the recession. So where do you see the greatest opportunities within value right now? Sure, sure. I mean, so we've been overweight energy for about a year and nine months, year and 10 months. We still love energy. Energy has moved from 20 where we bought it up to where it is today. Um, it's still experiencing a serious deprivation of capital and deprivation of capacity. As long as that's the case, energy is definitely a place to be. Um, uh, materials we're very positive on. Again, it's a sector that's been deprived of capital and capacity. Uh, we are slightly overweight financials. And other than that, we're pretty defensive. We're overweight both staples and healthcare here, two groups that we have been severely underweight for the last two years, and only in the last six months have we changed direction. Eli Salzman, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. Well, that's going to do it for the Exchange Power Lunch. Starts after this quick break. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Power Lunch. I'm Tyler Matheson. We have breaking news at this hour. President Biden speaking just moments ago in Brussels, saying NATO is more united than ever. When asked about the potential use of chemical weapons by Russia, he said the nature of the response will depend on the nature of the use. In other words, a calibrated response. We'll have a live report from Brussels uh, first, but Morgan Brennan joins us today with a check on the markets. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Tyler. That's right. So let's get a check on where the markets stand. We've got tech stocks and materials leading uh, the equity indexes higher right now. You have the Dow up about 246 points, seven-tenths of 1%. The S&P 
hovering just below 4,500 right now, up about 1% as well. And the NASDAQ, the outperformer in large part because of those tech stocks, up one and a quarter percent. The yield on the 10 year moving higher to around 2.34%, though not as high as the levels that were hit yesterday. Oil prices, meantime, pulling back in afternoon trading, perhaps giving a lift to the equity market. President Biden, as we mentioned, speaking just moments ago in Brussels, and Kayla Tausche is there with those headlines. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Morgan. President Biden rearranging his schedule, slightly running a bit behind, and so deciding to move that press conference up. He's on his way to the European Union, but he took a moment to tout the collective deliverables that allies have announced so far. A billion dollars in new humanitarian aid from the U.S., a coordinated sanctions to ban Russia's central bank from being able to transact in gold and prop up the euro, additional sanctions from the U.S. on Russia's lawmaking body, the Duma, and several more elites uh, within Russia to align itself with what Europe is doing. Uh, earlier today, speaking at that press conference, President Biden said uh, the response by NATO has been the opposite of what Putin thought he'd get. Putin was banking on NATO being split. My early conversation with him in December and early January it was clear to me he didn't think we could sustain this cohesion. NATO has never, never been more united than it is today. Putin is getting exactly the opposite of what he intended to have as a consequence of going into Ukraine. President Biden said that allies are also willing to sustain the bruising sanctions that they have implemented so far, not for a month, not for two months, but for more than a year, if that's what's needed to get President Putin to reverse course in Ukraine. As for what happens next in this conflict, President Biden, when he was asked about the possibility that Russia uses chemical weapons, he said the nature of the use would determine the nature of the response, that it would be a measured response in kind based on however that response plays out. The White House has a team that is doing contingency planning for exactly those scenarios. And President Biden has not been willing to share the details of that planning in public. Finally, President Biden also said, as it relates to the international stage, that he would like Russia to be kicked out of the G20. And while other members of the G20, other countries may not agree, if they choose to keep Russia as a member, then Biden thinks Ukraine should be a member too. Guys, back to you. All right, Kayla, thanks very much. Kayla Tausche reporting from Brussels, where it's a little after 8 p.m. this evening. Let's get more on the conflict and any possible resolution. Monica Duffy Toft is an international politics professor at Tufts. Her expertise is in negotiations and conflict resolution. Monica, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, is, uh, can di diplomacy solve this war? Or is the moment not ripe yet for diplomacy to do that? It's a great question. And what I would say is, is diplomacy can help. Uh, but at this point, it doesn't seem as if the Russian Federation under Vladimir Putin is ready to negotiate. Uh, he's still pr staying pretty firm of what he wants, which is a neutralized, demilitarized, denazified uh, Ukraine. Uh, and, and so and then on the Ukrainian side, you know, they're not going to want to roll over. They're actually doing quite well in this war. Um, so diplomacy, where we're going to see it is in signaling. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing with President Biden today in Europe, signaling very clearly that NATO, the European partners and the United States are, are, are fully aligned in this. Uh, so at this point, so long as Russia believes uh, that it can still prevail to some extent on the battlefield and the Ukrainian and understand that they're pushing them back and keeping them at bay, I, I fear that we're not going to see a diplomatic entree uh, in the next couple of days. You know, I guess wars end sometimes in surrender, sometimes in negotiated uh, ceasefires. Uh, it sounds, as you, as you just said, as though the Ukrainians are in no mood, nor do they seem uh, in anywhere close to a position where they'd be forced to surrender. So I guess mm -hmm. then the best possible outcome in the medium term would be some sort of ceasefire in place for the time being. I mean, is it is it a kind of land for peace uh, solution or what? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I've been saying this since the get go because of the level of destruction, the harm to non combatants, and let's not forget the harm to soldiers, right? On both sides. I mean, this is a particularly deadly war. We have five generals dead on the battlefield. We haven't seen those kinds of numbers. That's on the Russian side, those kinds of numbers since World War II. This is a big conflict with armored vehicles, tanks, aircraft, you know, surface to surface missiles, surface to air missiles, uh, and the destruction of industrialized modern cities. Um, and so at this point, neither side really does believe that it's it's not going to uh, prevail, uh, the Ukrainians at least to push the Russians out. And then of course the Russians, what they're trying to do is to get as much land as they possibly can so that when a ceasefire is called, they will have longer lines, right? Longer extended lines and control of more territory that they possibly, we don't know yet, uh, can then negotiate away. It's pretty clear uh, they want a land bridge from uh, Crimea up through the Donbass and Luhansk areas, uh, but it, they are they do keep pushing west, and then of course they're encircling Kyiv, uh, and it's a question of what they're going to do in Lviv. So a ceasefire would be terrific, but at this point, what each side is trying to do is to maximize where they control uh, the land. Uh, the territory so that when a ceasefire comes, if it becomes permanent, uh, then there's something more to negotiate. Of mm -hmm. course, the Ukrainians don't want to give anything up. Uh, I suspect the Russians will have to give something up. Uh, but in any event, a, a ceasefire would be great because it would stop the killing and the destru destruction at this point. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be the case that either side is ready for it. Professor, talk me through the role that sanctions play in this. And I ask because President Biden just a short while ago uh, was very clear in saying that sanctions are not used to deter. They're essentially used to inflict pain, and they're being used as a tool by the U.S., NATO, and its allies uh, to inflict pain over a longer time while projecting a very unified front. So the role that sanctions could play in getting to, say, a ceasefire, especially when historically sanctions haven't always worked. Yeah, so in this case, we do want to point out that these are unprecedented sanctions against a major power and a major economy. We haven't seen this level. Uh, and they're punitive. I mean, that's what they do. They punish, right? They, you could think of them as extraordinarily important coercive tools. So they do two things. The first thing that they do is they signal unity, uh, that the fact that you've got so many states backing this, and in particular our European partners, uh, but then also other states that are backing this. Uh, so that's one is, is that they're, they're imp very important for keeping together uh, the groups of states that want to sort of uh, uh, punish uh, Russia for violating international law by going into Ukraine's territory. And then secondarily, they want to punish the perpetrators of this violence and then the, the people that put these the, the, the perpetrators into power, which is notably the Russian citizens. Now, these, these have been targeted sanctions. You just heard at the top of the hour, the Biden press uh, conference, that there's more individuals being targeted. But we know that they're targeting the banking system, the energy systems. Uh, and so they are trying to persuade and signal to the Russian population as well, as well as to its leadership, obviously, uh, that these are hurting. They're going to take time. And if you're feeling pain now, just imagine in a couple of weeks when your bank accounts, you can't access them, the shelves are further empty, your pocketbooks are empty. Uh, and by the way, those electronics that you love that have Western technology in them, you're not going to be able to get them fixed or replace them. So, so the sanctions play a very, very important role in this, signaling to our partners, but then also to the, the, the Russian leadership and population. Uh, and on top of that, they hurt. I mean, it, it, mm. you, you're, you're, we're hamstringing that economy uh, and its capacity uh, to actually function. And, and with the announcement of additional sanctions, uh, it's going to hurt even more. The problem is they take time. And, yeah. and, and, and in the meantime, you know, we have a pretty brutal uh, war going on. And so it would be great if we could get those sanctions to, to bite a little bit sooner uh, and harder. But they do take time. Yeah. And of course, time's of the essence. Monica Tuffy, Duffy Toft, thanks for joining us. All right, thank the you, war, for thank me. you again. Uh, the war in UK, Ukraine prompting BlackRock's Larry Fink to warn of a permanent shift in the world order and the end of globalization. Other influential investors and thinkers are echoing those same comments. Let's bring in someone who has had a front row seat to globalization over the past 30 years, Carlos Gutierrez, Commerce Secretary under President George W. Bush and the former CEO of Kellogg. Um, Mr. Secretary, welcome back. It's uh, always good to have you, you with us. Uh, what do you say uh, or how do you react to Larry Fink's uh, letter today in which he, he claimed that the era of globalization 
uh, is, is either gone or dying? Well, uh, there's no question there are going to be changes to uh, world architecture, alliances, changes that we can't even foresee today. Uh, I think to talk about permanent changes is always difficult because, uh, you know, things swing. I think there, there, there will be a decline in the level of globalization to the extent that you define it as being everywhere. Um, but look, companies are going to continue doing business around the world. I think what will change is that geopolitics will become a lot more important in, in decision making in, in terms of where businesses invest, how much they invest, who they do business with. I think boards of directors will do a, a lot more scrutiny over that. And, and geopolitics will enter the boardroom in terms of risk analysis. Um, but I don't believe that, you know, everyone's going to pull back to their home country. There will be a decline, no question. What about um, manuf Obviously, um, uh, President Trump was, was big on bringing uh, American manufacturing back to the United States. He, he decried the fact that, that so many countries were manufacturing, whether it was in Mexico or, or in China or elsewhere uh, around the globe. Um, you can give him credit or say he was ahead of the game there. Uh, do you expect that? that trend to continue or maybe accelerate in a world where we can't be, can we, so dependent on China, a frenemy if ever there was one, for such things as silicon chips, uh, consumer goods, iPhones, it's, and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like Nike shoes and, and apparel. Well, look, I, I think the idea of bringing home everything and being self-sufficient I don't believe that will ever be ahead of the game. I, I, I think in, in this day and age, in any day and age, that puts you at a disadvantage. There are still, there's still Mexico, there's Europe, there are other countries around the world. Right now we're talking about a, a conflict in Russia and Ukraine. What boards will be looking at is whether this expands and how far it expands. People talk about this is like the, the Cold War instead of communism and capitalism, it's democracies versus uh, authoritarianism. I think we have to be very careful that we don't um, increase the number of countries that are on Russia's side. Right now, Russia is isolated. And I worry about the rhetoric against China uh, and its public rhetoric. We don't have to scold China in public and tell them that if they support Russia, we're going to apply sanctions. That just makes them more, more um, willing to cement their position. The objective should be to contain Russia, to isolate Russia, and not to increase the number of countries that are on Russia's side. I think it was very telling that both that China actually abstained uh, in, in the uh, United Nations vote. And that is something that we should keep our eye on and I think President Biden's goal right now should be to keep it contained to Russia and don't continue to have the kind of rhetoric that just makes countries uh, sort of fall and be pushed to Russia's side. Well, let, uh, let's set that aside for just a minute. And I don't disagree. That doesn't mean I disagree with you on that or, or, or sure. the tactics of that. But you said a moment ago that boards uh, and shareholders and companies are going to have to decide um, one way or another where they're going to do business, whom they're going to patronize, where they're going to source their goods, and are they going to, to, to source them in democratic countries or in autocratic countries? And the largest autocratic country in the world right now is China. Right. So um, the world is not one big democracy. And I think that's our reality today. Uh, and, and I don't believe that because of Russia, Ukraine, that we should jump to the conclusion mm -hmm. that we should only do business with democracies. There are so many supply chains. There are a lot of markets that, that are in play, that, that are big markets, that are part of companies' global footprints that are not ideal democracies. There are very few ideal democracies. So we, we need to be careful to not start a problem that, uh, that goes beyond the, the problem today, which is Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, I, I don't think that this is um, an opportunity to continue to, 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 to sanction China. 
I think the opportunity here is to separate China from Russia, to mm. find a way to continue to collaborate with China. We're going to compete with China. We're going to fight. We're not going to like everything they do, but we need to prevent uh, China and Russia from forming this massive power block. Mm. Yeah, Secretary Gutierrez, I mean, it, it sort of reminds me of the comments from President Biden just a short while ago, uh, this idea of him saying that China is more economically aligned over the longer term with the U.S. than perhaps Russia when talking about uh, the need to counter Russia. Um, all of this raises a, que a question from an investor standpoint, and that is, does the concept, does the definition then of ESG need to change? to something like defense stocks or companies that are very focused on reshoring or nearshoring or working with trade partners now need to hold more weight for investors that are focused on uh, social issues, for example? Yeah, Morgan, I think that's a great question. And you probably will see uh, an expansion of the definition of ESG. I think you'll see a lot more shareholder scrutiny regarding where you invest. Uh, where you have uh, supply chains, especially immediately in Russia. Um, so you could see that. You could see it in, a, in a similar fashion as you're seeing investors demanding climate change plans, demanding more diversity on boards. I think uh, investors will want to see where companies are investing their money. Um, and that is most likely a trend that we're going to start seeing now. So it's a very good point. Secretary Gutierrez, thank you for joining us today. Great to get your Pleasure. insights. Well, coming up, a longtime market watcher says investors should buy utilities as rates rise. We're going to ask him why and which stocks he's purchasing. And later, Tesla on a tear, the stock breaking through $1,000 up more than 25% in just a month. What's its next stop? Find out when Power Lunch returns. Welcome back to Power Lunch. Utilities, one of the best performing sectors this month. The utilities ETF is up, is up more than 5%. It's on pace for its first positive month of the year. 
Our next guest is betting on the sector even as rates rise. Let's bring in Kevin Mon, President and Chief Investment Officer at Henyon and Walsh Asset Management. Kevin, great to have you on. Why are utilities a buy here? Well, based upon the Fed's updated dot plot chart last week, it is now reasonable to believe that there could be six additional rate hikes this year and up to four additional rate hikes next year. Now, whether you subscribe to the notion that they're going to be that aggressive or not, as we are in that latter camp, it's clear we're in a rising rate environment. So, Morgan, we did the research and we looked back at the last eight rate hike cycles. And what we found, interestingly enough, across those eight rate hike cycles was that the stock market on average rose by 43 percent. And then as we dove further into what sectors outperformed during those periods of rate hikes, we found that the three best performing sectors were technology, energy, and yes, utilities. Utis utilities do have a history of performing relatively well when rates rise, and they also fare relatively well during periods of market volatility, like we're seeing here thus far in 2022. Oh, this is really interesting because it's kind of contrarian to everything you would imagine would take place in terms of these correlations and these relationships in a rising rate environment. So why specifically do utilities uh, tend to outperform or tend to, those stocks tend to rise? And based on that, are there specific names that you like right now, given the situation? Absolutely. And the important part of our research study that we did here at Smart Trust was that utilities are one of the best performing sectors as rates are rising, not after rates have risen. So in this environment where the Fed has only risen rates thus far by 25 basis points, a utility that's paying three, three and a half percent still looks pretty attractive to income oriented investors. So a couple of different names that we like within the portfolio strategies here at Smart Trust involve American Electric Power, Duke Energy, and Exelon. All three of those utilities have yields of 3.3% or more, historically have performed well when the market has pulled back. And in the case of Duke Energy, Duke Energy is one of the, the largest U.S. regulated utilities in the country, and they provide electricity, gas, and also, Morgan, commercial renewables. This is a company that's poised to continue to grow as the economy continues to grow. But if the economy starts to slow, as we expect it will over the next two to three years, utilities will still maintain their ability to produce revenues and also support those dividends. Let me jump in with a couple of questions. Number one, should I try sure. and pick winners within the category or should I just uh, go with, a, with an index fund that represents utility stocks or an ETF that does? Why wouldn't that be smart? Certainly. It's a great question, Tyler. And there are exchange traded funds that allow you to invest in the broad sector of utilities, but I think it requires more in depth research to identify those particular utilities that have low betas, attractive valuations, recognizing that some utilities are trading at excessive PEs right now, a history of growing their earnings and a high dividend payout. And that's what quick, we've done with those three particular names. Very dollars. quick final and quick final answer. How much will a turn to electric vehicles help utilities or will it stress them and hurt them? Well, it depends on the utility itself. If they're providing electrical power, that's just increased demand and that will only allow them to expand their balance sheets and potentially increase their revenues further. But it depends on the utility, Tyler. All right, Kevin, thank you very much. Kevin Mon. My pleasure. We appreciate your time. Quick programming note, Treasury uh, Janet, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen joins Squawk Box tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. She will talk the economy. She probably won't talk much about the Fed, but we said she's going to talk about the <laughs> Fed. So she will, uh, and a lot more. Uh, certainly she'll talk about sanctions and using currencies and uh, uh, crypto uh, to uh, potentially avoid them. All right, ahead on this show now, forget about tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning will come. It'll be fine. It's 8 a.m. Secretary Yellen. Crypto's new king, Ethereum, the blockchain used for building NFTs, continues to grow in popularity, but is Ether Evolving being left behind? Plus, we'll get you the trader's take on two tech giants having a massive run. Tesla, for example, up eight straight days. Power Lunch will be right back.
Welcome back to Power Lunch. I'm Dominic Chu. Now, computer chip stocks are moving higher today with one of the ETFs that tracks those names, the Vanek Vectors Semiconductor ETF. You notice ticker SMH firmly in positive territory, up by 4% in your session highs. Every constituent of that ETF is up a percent or more on the day with some of the biggest names out there, like NVIDIA, which is up roughly 9% at this hour. Also, Intel, AMD, Broadcom, among the best performers there. Keep in mind, the chip makers have not been spared from the tech volatility over the last several months. In fact, nearly every member of this particular ETF, the SMH, is still in negative territory for the year so far. The ETF itself, by the way, is tracking for its worst calendar quarter since the first quarter of 2020, down roughly 10% so far this year. So keep an eye on those chip stocks. Tyler, I'll send things back over to you. All right, Dominic, I'm sure we'll see you later. Thank you, sir. Let's go to uh, Rahel Solomon for a news update. Hi, Rahel. Hi, Tyler. Here's what's happening at this hour. Legal experts are praising Judge Katanji Brown Jackson during the last day of Senate hearings on her nomination for the Supreme Court. The American Bar Association giving Jackson its highest rating of well qualified, saying that she has a sterling reputation and exceptional competence to sit on the nation's highest court. A new poll finds that Americans are not rallying around President Biden's leadership opposing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Associated Press found that 43 percent of people polled approve of President Biden and a similar amount agree with his handling of the relationship with Russia. We should, however, say, though, that both figures are little changed from before the invasion began. And the University of Michigan reaching an agreement to settle a sex abuse lawsuit brought by students. So the deal creates a standing committee charged with protecting people at the university from sexual abuse. And it comes just two months after the school agreed to pay $490 million to hundreds of people who claim that they were sexually abused by a campus doctor. For an update, Morgan, I'll send it back to you. For Hal Solomon, thank you. Well, head on Power Lunch, Movado facing a host of the same issues impacting the global economy, labor and material shortages, rising costs, more. The CEO joins us next to discuss how they're navigating those challenges and posting record results.
All right, folks, time for the power rundown with 90 minutes left in the trading day. And we want to get you caught up on all the market stocks, bonds, commodities, all the rest. We'll talk to the CEO of Movado about supply chain and cost challenges. Let's begin with Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Bob. Hello, Tyler. Uh, a lot of what's been working before working today, and those are commodity stocks, helped by a nice rally in tech, particularly the semiconductors. Take a look at the... Uh, the new high list, it's the same as the old high list. This, these names are permanently embedded on the lists for the last week or so. Conoco, Marathon, Nucor, Freeport, McMoran, uh, any of the other uh, higher beta energy names like Devon also on the new high list as well. Uh, Dom mentioned the semis breaking out, but it's really been quite noticeable. I mean, uh, besides the Wall Street Journal doing a great story on NVIDIA today, Intel was was 42 or so, just 43, just two weeks ago. Look at it, 51 today. We're talking about 15, 16% gain in just about two weeks. Broadcom's had a great run. Teradyne's had a great run. This is a big support uh, for the market because these are uh, very big market capitalizations. Move the S&P 500. Builders still aren't doing anything besides disappointing numbers on, on, the, on the, the housing report. We had disappointing earnings commentary and earnings uh, from these companies. So these are all down about 25% so far this year. No energy at all in this group. No bounce off the lows. Finally, I just want to note the VIX is down again today. We're at the lowest level since early February right now. Does that matter at all? Yeah, it matters because there's a lot of momentum traders out there, Tyler, who uh, like commodity trading advisors, they're willing to take much more risk when the VIX is lower. So yes, that does help the market. Guys, back to all you. Right, Bob, thank you very much. Let's go to the bond market now. The 10-year yield rising, but not quite back to that multi-year high from yesterday. Rick Santelli, I want to get your thoughts on the bond market. I don't know whether you heard our discussion with Carlos Gutierrez about the ebbing of globalization, but I'm interested in your thoughts here. It's an area of passion for you. you know, oh, absolutely. You know, back when I used to have Santelli exchanges, I did many of them regarding the end of globalization right as China's behavior started to change around 2016. And indeed, we used to import prior to that nothing but disinflation as just-in-time inventory pushed everybody's prices down. But philosophical differences got the best of all these large global economies, and now we import inflation. And just-in-time inventory, well, it's kind of like the dodo bird. I think it's gone, and I don't see it coming back anytime soon and much of that of course will continue to play havoc with markets and might even make international interest rates higher than they normally would be when we get past all these nasty chapters we're in post covid and of course post russian invasion now as you look at week to day chart we have come back but we haven't overtaken the 238 high close or the wednesday 241 intraday high high for the entire cycle look at the end of july for tens Look at how psychological that 2% area is. Hey, we're at three-year highs and fives. We're at seven-and-a-half-year highs in the five-year overseas. Boon yields for the five-year are at 26 basis points. Tyler, they closed the year at minus 45. Back to you. Bonds and more. Rick Santelli, thank you very much. Uh, oil closing for the day down slightly as the markets digest world events. That's basically all they've been doing over the past few weeks, Pippa Stevens. Hey, Tyler. Yeah, pause today for oil after the EU did not agree to sanction Russian crude, but oil is still holding firmly above 110. Meantime, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm saying this morning that discussions are ongoing around another emergency stockpile release. All tools are on the table, she said, at an IEA ministerial meeting. Now, this would be on top of the 60 million barrel release announced earlier this month. Looking ahead to tomorrow, President Biden is meeting with EU officials. The focus expected to be LNG and how the U.S. can shore up Europe's gas supply. The U.S. is already sending record amounts of LNG to Europe. But as Goldman noted, that's largely because of price dynamics rather than policy support. Prices were higher in Europe than in Asia, so ships went to Europe. Let's check in on prices here. WTI down 3% at 111.64. Brent crude also falling 3% to 118. Tyler, back to you. All right, Pippa, thank you very much. Let's get a pulse now of the global consumer Movado Group dealing with a trifecta of headwinds from supply chain and labor challenges to inflationary pressure, not to mention what's going on in Russia and elsewhere in the world. But in spite of all that, shares of the watchmaker jumping today after the company reported record fourth quarter results. Here now is Ephraim Grinberg, chairman and CEO of the Movado Group. He's also a new face to CNBC. Ephraim, welcome. Good to have you with us. 
Uh, thank, thank you for having me, Tyler. We are delighted. Let me begin by asking you what you are doing with respect to selling product in Russia or Belarus, uh, and was that, is that a, a material part of your business? So, so it was not a, a material part of our business, but we actually immediately, about three or four days into the invasion, decided that we would no longer ship into Russia, either on, from our websites or to our retail customers there, um, and then quickly followed on with uh, Belarus as well. Um, we knew that that was, uh, it's important to me personally, but it's also uh, would be important to our, to our consumers and our uh, employees as well. You know, you had a wonderful quarter and uh, you're a global brand and a global manufacturer of watches and other products for other brands that uh, carry other names, but you're the, you're the manufacturer. We've been talking a lot this hour, Ephraim, about globalization and the global markets uh, and whether that phenomenon has peaked and whether there's going to be a return to something sort of less globalized. I'd like to get your thoughts on that because obviously you have built your brands on a global basis. Uh, you've benefited from that trend, I'm sure, in terms of manufacturing and distribution. Um, what do you think? So, so we're a global company, and, and I, don't, I think that you'll see changes, but that you're not going to see dramatic changes. So over 50% of our business is internationally, um, and um, we have um, probably close to as many employees overseas as, as we do in, in the United States. Um, our brands are global, so brands uh, like Coach, Calvin Klein, which we're launching now, uh, Movado, uh, and, and I think that that's here to stay. There may be markets that come and go, but, uh, but that's going to continue to, to, we're going to continue to operate in a global world. Ephraim, it's Morgan. I mean, I realize record quarter stocks trading higher on the heels of those results. You did delay some product launches. You are having some labor and supply chain challenges. How long would you expect those to persist? How can you counter them with higher prices? Well, so, so you know, we see inflationary pressures really on, on today. Everybody's cost of living has gone up. We have to pay people more and we want to pay people more. So we do believe that we're able to pass uh, some of that along within our, our brands and in, in price increases. We implemented some towards the latter half of last year and have implemented um, some during uh, this year. Our, our teams stay really close uh, to, to our supply chain and um, have great long partnerships and relationships. And so we've been able to manage the supply chain over the last two years extremely well, especially if you go back um, to the beginning of the pandemic, uh, supply chain ceased um, as they started up, markets closed, and, and we were able to really, through excellent communication, um, restart really quickly, and, and today are in pretty good shape. So quickly, how would you gauge the health of the consumer currently? Uh, I think the consumer is healthy. I think we are lapping stimulus in, in the first uh, quarter of this year, which will probably have some effect on, on retail. Um, but again, stimulus occurred in, in the U.S. It didn't occur in, in other markets, I think. Uh, and you're also seeing uh, people return to travel and, and restaurants and experiences. So that also will put, uh, will put some added pressure on things they buy. Ephraim Grinberg, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Morgan. Up next, Ether outperforming Bitcoin as hype builds for a new and improved Ethereum 2.0. We're going to explain what that means for the crypto space and investors next.
Welcome back. Cryptocurrency is higher today and actually having a strong week. Ether up 10% in the past week, Bitcoin up 7 And a new version of Ether could actually help that outperformance continue. Kate Rooney joins us now to explain. Hi, Kate. Hey, Morgan. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, Morgan. The uh, Ether outperformance comes amid some progress and a long-awaited software update. This is sometimes called Ethereum 2.0. It hasn't happened yet. I'm told to expect the full upgrade later this year. But the recent developments are sparking a more bullish sentiment around that cryptocurrency. A couple big things underway here. For one, the Ethereum network should become more efficient. It should be cheaper to create new cryptocurrencies and use a lot less energy in that process. The energy part is key here. Crypto's carbon footprint has been one of the main critiques of that industry. And in order for this upgrade to happen, Ethereum has to merge onto a parallel test network that's been set up on the side and the most recent test appears to have gone pretty well. It's also the last test before the actual merge, which we should see later this year. And meanwhile, there's some other potentially bearish news going on when it comes to Ethereum. Analysts are pointing out an overall slowdown in network activity, which tends to be a leading indicator of prices. But Fundstrat says despite that metric, the upgrade and that software upgrade should be viewed as, quote, universally uh, viewed as a price catalyst and seeing some upside there. Also possible that Ether can perform, quote, remarkably well through the rest of this year, regardless of what's going on in the broader market. Back to you. So, Kate, when you, when you talk about this merge actually planned for later this year, is, is this a situation where we're basically seeing buy the rumor because there's still a ways to go here until it becomes reality? That seems to be the case. And it, it depends on who you ask in terms of when this is actually going to happen. The, uh, the goal line looks to, to be moving back here a little bit. I'm told Q3 or Q4, but we heard the same thing last year. So like you said, could be a little bit of a buy the rumor moment. And that upgrade is really getting priced in. But it's helping sort of the sentiment around Ethereum and that network in general. And the narrative and sentiment we've seen in the past is really important for cryptocurrencies. That's sort of we've seen this bearish narrative play out this year. So any sort of turnaround is important. But there's other factors, too. You know, Ethereum and Ether was really oversold in some technical analysis. And then there's other factors, too. As this market really matures and looks a little bit more like Bitcoin, you've got things like the futures markets that also tend to impact prices. So things like short squeezes that we see in traditional markets as these assets become more mature, you see some of the same factors uh, weighing into the price there. All right, thank you very much. Kate, we appreciate it. Up next, Apple and Tesla continue to climb despite growing risks to tech. So should investors believe what they see or could there be risks under the surface? Our market detective, Steve Grasso.
Welcome back. Two big companies making big moves in the past few days. Take a look. Shares of Apple are up 7% uh, in the past week and actually up another one and a quarter percent right now, crossing the $1,000 mark for the first time. That's not Apple, that's Tesla. So that's Apple. It's up 172.43 is the level there with those shares. But also take a look at Tesla, which is crossing the $1,000 mark again, and that's up 1% today. Both names still negative for the year, though, and so is the rally, just getting started. How do you trade these names if it is? Let's bring in Steve Grasso. He is the CEO of Grasso Global and a CNBC contributor. Steve, thanks for being with us. Let's start with Apple. As I mentioned, it's actually been up for eight straight days. You hold Apple, if I'm not mistaken. What do you think of the stock here? Yeah, I think, you know, the most overused line, Morgan, is you don't trade Apple. You just invest, you buy, and you just hold it. You don't go back and forth. You don't try to pick the bottom. You don't try to pick the top. It's just a steady, eddy type of performer that people want for their portfolio. So for me, I'm going to stay long it. I'm going to hold it. But I think the, the, what you touched on in the intro is that the marketplace was looking for, depending on rates moving higher, and then we got thrown a curveball with Russia. So what happens with the overall market volatility in a word? And when you look at high growth uh, tech names, those were the first to sell off during uh, periods of rising rate environment. So now that we've heard from Chairman Powell, people are starting to think, investors are starting to think, hey, let me get back in there in some of these safer names. So is the way to think about an Apple that it is essentially a defensive play within the broader tech sector? Sure. And, and I think that the... <laughs> The best way to think about it, that, that's it in a nutshell. And, and then when, if you're a trader of this market, you have to look at the safest things go last. So before the sell-off, you know, all of those high multiple names are going to go first. And then your Apples and your Googles are going to go last. Once they go, the, the, the flip side of that, though, Morgan, is once people get back in the market, it's the first thing that they buy. So Apple was the first thing that people bought. All right, so speaking of growth and speaking of other tech names that have also been momentum plays, Tesla. I don't believe you currently own Tesla, but what do you think of the trading action we have seen here? And I guess across the broader EV space, which is higher today. Yeah, so this one you have to have a, a, an iron cast stomach. I'm in, I'm in Rivian, and that one has been just all over the map from 106 to basically $175, back all the way around tripped, and then some. They've been ma major debacles. The flip side of that stock has been Tesla. Tesla is actually seen as the stable EV company. And if you look at the recent volatility in this name, it's at a recent high of over $1,200 and a recent low of $700. So that is not for the faint of heart. And if you're in the name, I'd probably stay in it at this point. If I look on my chart uh, right now, uh, the number that comes up is $971. And that's the 50% retracement from the recent high to the recent low. People use that as the barometer of success and failure. So uh, it might sound like it's a long way away, but it was just there two days ago. So if it breaks below that, <laughs> I would think about liquidating your position. Otherwise, you're good. Understood. Why do you like Rivian? I like Rivian because I think they're, they're really gaining a lot of a mental market share. And I think one day it's going to be something that people really want to jump into. The pre-orders were great. And just anecdotally, people around the neighborhood want to buy Rivian. They want something new. They don't want a Tesla anymore. They want something new. Tesla is becoming more of a Ford or GM, more stable, more investable. Rivian is really becoming your beta play, your high risk, or pl high you know, risk play. I, I don't disagree with you at all on that, Steve. I mean, <laughs> uh, because I, I've noticed in my town in New Jersey, they go through certain official cars of the town that I live in. <laughs> A long time ago, it was the Volvo. Then it became the Prius in the 2007, 2000. Then it became the Subaru. Now it is the Tesla. It is the, it is the, the default yeah. car in my town. So it, it's lost a little Great. bit of that panache. Thank you, sir. I like it. Maybe one day we'll see you in a Rivian. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks. All righty. Up next, the widening gap between men and women when it comes to retirement savings. More Power Lunch is next.
Well, more than a third of men say they are confident they can retire without running out of money. That's nearly twice the percentage of women who express that same confidence. Dom Chu is joining us now with more on this story. All right, so we've talked a lot, guys, over the last couple of years about the K-shaped recovery in the U.S. economy since the depths of the pandemic, this notion that those who are more well-off, better in life, are in the wake of the pandemic, got even better off, and those in lower parts of the income and asset spectrum became worse off. So that similar phenomenon is happening between women and men overall when it comes to retirement. So this is according to a survey of over 3,000 adults conducted by TIAA. Just 19% of women actually feel confident about being on track to retire without running out of money compared to 35% of that in men. So that's a 16 percentage point gap. By comparison, back in 2013, men still felt better, more on track for retirement than women, but that gap was closer, just about 9%. So over the last decade, women have become less secure in their retirement prospects. What's even worse is that 31% of women say they were not even able to save for retirement at all during this whole process. So this is something that a lot of financial planners are looking at right now, especially in the wake of the pandemic. Guys. I think it goes to the, to the income gap, obviously, that women are, are lesser paid than men. I think there's also a confidence gap. I think men are inclined uh, because of our, our oversized egos, some to be, sometimes to be a little more confident than we should be. Or, or maybe take risks where we shouldn't be yes. sometimes. Dominic Chu, an egoless man. Nah. Thanks for watching Power Lunch. Closing bell right now. Stocks are near session highs with the NASDAQ leading the pack. The most important hour of trading starts now. Welcome to Closing Bell, everyone. I'm Sarah Eisen. Here's where we stand in the market. A 1% gain, at least, for the S&P, for the NASDAQ, which, as I said, leading up 1.3%. The Dow is up a healthy three-quarters of a percent, 242 points, and small caps also rebound. The only sector lower right now in the S&P is energy. Technology is the best-performing sector. Materials, communication services, healthcare, oil is weaker. Bitcoin's at a three-week high. And treasuries are slumping again, sending yields higher. Here are my top takeaways on today's biggest stories. Is the economy really slowing down? It is the topic du jour on Wall Street. The widely followed Atlanta GDP tracker out today says expect only 0.9% growth in the first quarter. And that is a markdown from a week ago. We knew Omicron hit us in Q1, but it does make it harder to stage a full-fledged rebound for the rest of the year, especially with Fed hikes and high food and gas prices. A soft landing by the Fed is going to be tricky. The dramatic up and down moves in the market continue for stocks. So what comes next? Jim Cramer spotlighting some interesting technical analysis showing the S&P has successfully retraced 50% of its big decline. In the last 21 times that's happened since the Great Depression, it's meant the decline is over every single time. Do you believe in chart history? And the metric to watch this earnings season, margins. That will show how companies are being squeezed on higher costs from commodities to labor and who can pass it on to consumers like Nike. Berenberg today, Cut forecast on consumer giants Kimberly Clark, Danone, and Unilever says they are vulnerable to inflation hits and shrinking margins. Let's get straight to our top story. Stocks rallying while allies meet in Europe. President Biden speaking this afternoon in Brussels and the White House earlier announcing a new round of sanctions on Russian elites and corporations. Joining us now, CNBC senior White House correspondent Kayla Tausche, live in Brussels with the president. CNBC senior markets commentator Mike Santoli and Bank of America head of global commodity research Francisco Blanche on the oil story. First, Kayla, we, we heard from President Biden. He wants to boot Russia from G20, wants to convey a sense of unity among NATO members. What did they accomplish at this meeting? Well, the U.S. this morning announced a series of new sanctions that essentially just put it in alignment with what Europe and the U.K. had already done. That is slapping sanctions on all 300-plus members of Russia's lawmaking body, the Duma, uh, sanctioning several state-owned defense companies in Russia, and also the G7 taking a coordinated action to keep Russia from being able to evade sanctions by having its central bank uh, pay for transactions in gold. That will now be banned. A senior administration official estimated that Russia had more than 100 
$1.5 billion of its central bank reserves stored in gold. So that cuts off a very large source of potential funding funding for President Putin as this war becomes even more protracted. Just how protracted, Sarah? Well, at the press conference this afternoon, President Biden was asked about uh, the fact that sanctions so far have not deterred Putin. And Biden said that the alliance is not willing to change course in a few weeks, in a few months. He said that it will be important to sustain this level of sanctions for the better part of this year, if not the entire year, uh, to make sure that they get the actions from Putin that they want. And that is a withdrawal from Ukraine and sovereignty there restored. Sarah. Yeah, and Francisco, the, the other message to come out of Brussels has been a threat to Putin, or at least, you know, strengthening the NATO alliance in case Putin uses biological, chemical, or nuclear warfare. That is not a zero percent probability. How would the market react to any escalation like that? Well, look, I, th I think the uh, the oil market obviously would be uh, would be very uh, concerned upon that kind of escalation because um, the, the the threat of sanctions on energy could potentially materialize if if uh, uh, the conflict were to escalate. So I think. I think that the direct consequence would be potentially uh, some, some sanctions on energy, which, as you know, uh, Europe has been avoiding so far because of the risks to the European economy and European consumers. So what's priced into oil at this point? We're down three and a quarter percent, but still above 110 on the price of WTI. H how long is the market expecting these Russian barrels to be offline? And, and what does it expect as far as potential further sanctions? Well, I think I think the market is pricing in a scenario, which is uh, our, our baseline scenario, the, what we call the, the bad scenario, that we'll probably lose about a million barrels a day of Russian supplies in, in, uh, throughout this year. Um, and, uh, and also, we're looking at potentially some relocation of, of Russian barrels away from Europe and, and the U.S. into India and China. Uh, that's what's been priced in. But I, I don't think the market is pricing in a major uh, disruption or, or beyond a million barrels a day. Uh, there are scenarios, w which is our, our ugly scenario, that if uh, supplies were to drop by 4 million barrels a day from Russia, remember Russia exports about 8 million barrels a day in a 100 million barrel a day market, uh, we could see prices potentially rising by 6 to 75 dollars a barrel on top of the current levels, scratching 200 dollars a barrel. Um, again, that would be a scenario where Europe uh, would be actively trying to block uh, Russian barrels uh, into their economy. Um, a difficult one to see, but, but one that could happen under an escalation in, of, of the war in, in the Ukraine. $200 per barrel, Mike. I mean, the, the possibilities here, is the, and then we're up another 1% on the S&P. Is the market underestimating how long this could last and, and how much worse it could get? Because we've, we've now wiped away most of the game, most of the losses yes. on the S&P since the war began. We're well up from when uh, the actual invasion took place. I don't know that the market's underestimating. I do know the market is not going to over anticipate the move to two hundred dollars a barrel uh, unless the oil market actually shows a sign of getting there uh, soon. So uh, I would look at today as as a day when uh, of all the things the market is concerned with, it, it asks, are there fresh additional reasons to be worried today? Either on the situation in Ukraine, it seems like it's a very short-term equilibrium. Uh, on oil, it's pretty steady today. Yields aren't doing very much. Fed speak, we've already absorbed the message. So I just feel as if what we're left with is investors having felt a little bit off sides, a little bit underinvested with this huge surge that took place over six days. And so they go back and buy the leaders of 2021, which is the big tech stocks. It's pretty, it's pretty much happening independent of the, the geopolitical story, at least for today. I would also note that energy stocks are pretty much much flat yeah. despite a 3% loss for oil. So holding up better than the commodity. Kayla, Mike, Francisco, thank you all for joining me. After the break, we'll talk to NYSE Chair Sharon Bowen about her path to the top of the exchange and her outlook for the, large, the lagging IPO market this year. Dow's up about 248 points. You're watching Closing Bell on CNBC.
Another rebound day here on Wall Street. S&P is up 1% as we head into the close. Every sector higher, except for energy, which is sort of flattish. The Nasdaq in the lead once again up 1.5%. Joining us here at Post 9, the New York Stock Exchange, is the chair of the New York Stock Exchange, Sharon Bowen. She was a CFTC commissioner, spent three decades practicing business law, and is newly instated chairwoman. Welcome. Thank you so much or for should, having you me. You should say welcome. To yes, me, welcome. Yes, welcome exchange. to my house. No. Um, you, you joined here as chair at a pretty volatile time in, in December. This war has broken out. There's been a ton of volatility. What, what has that been like, what, witnessing the markets yeah. now from, from this front row? So the good news is this market is, this, this exchange is built for volatility. And so I've been impressed with uh, the resiliency of the market. You know, you're right. We had most volatile days during the pandemic, now with the, with the crisis in uh, Ukraine. Um, and so the, the good news is our markets are doing what they're supposed to do. We're not having any IPOs, though. It's been a really long stretch, and it's been yeah. very quiet. How, how do you bring companies back? Yeah. What is the big fear? Well, you know, 2019 and 2020 were pretty slow first quarters as well, and, and both of those years were record years for us. Um, you know, uncertain times, you know, means that companies will pause a bit before they come, you know, come to market. Um, but the pipeline's really robust, and so I think it's just more of a question of timing, um, you know, not just the war, but also uncertainty around interest rates, inflation, um, that kind of volatility makes people pause for a moment. I wonder if also the underperformance of the newly listed companies last year, we had so many go public, and they, they haven't done all that well, if that has held back the pipeline. Is that what you're hearing? I have not heard that, um, but, but you're right. There has been some sell-off, uh, particularly with some of the, the tech stocks. So the, I think today some of them are rebounding. Um, and so I think the market sentiment really has a big effect on you know, whether the market is up or down. You, have, you are the first person of color, woman of color, to, to lead the New York Stock Exchange, chair the New York Stock Exchange. And I know it's something that you talk about and you promote diversity. How are you going to, in this role, promote mm -hmm. that within public companies? Well, the good news is I, I get to combine my passion with the financial markets, with my passion with diversity, and inclusion, and ESG. So one of the things I plan to do is to use my platform to help our listed companies um, along their ESG journeys. You know, not everyone is, you know, at the same path rate. Um, the other way we're, we're helping is, you know, we founded the New York Stock Exchange Advisory Board Council. And the purpose of that was to increase the number of women and diverse candidates who are board ready. And so we found that was the best solution for companies, particularly listed companies who are looking for diversity on their boards. What about what the NASDAQ is doing, which is instituting a law now that the SEC is backing where companies have to disclose gender and diversity of its board members and explain why if they don't have that? What, would the stock exchange, would the New York Stock Exchange go so far as to make a rule like that as well? Well, you know, today, 95% of our companies already have at least two women on their boards, and 88% have more than 20% women on their boards. And so we found that our solutions-driven approach was the more appropriate way to address diversity. Um, although I do applaud, you know, any, any type of activities that's going to promote diversity uh, in the financial markets. And on that note, too, you said you're focused on ESG. I was wondering what you were thinking of the SEC's new proposed rule that we got this week that would require companies to disclose carbon emissions of their operations. Right. Is that a step too far to, to require that disclosure, or do you support it? Well, we obviously are taking a look at the proposal, and um, we have a good relationship with the SEC. And I, I personally look forward to working with the commission and uh, with our issuers uh, and market participants. Uh, there will be a, a two-month comment period, at least two months. And that's what's you know great about our markets is we get the the opportunity to hear from different people and different viewpoints. And I'm pretty sure we'll hear from different people <laughs> on this subject as well. But do you worry that that a rules-based approach like this could dissuade companies from going public and increase their costs? You know, I think we have to see how this process works out. I mean, again, I, I think that's the whole purpose of having a public and comment period um, is to weigh the pros and cons and. You know, as a former regulator, I always welcome collaboration and getting insights from those who would be affected. And so I, I'm really excited about the process that it will work. 
and I'm sure we'll get all kinds of input from, from the investing public as well. The other thing I wanted to ask you is I noticed the, the Russian stock market, the exchange opened today, sort of, for the first time in weeks and, and actually went up, but they have bans on short selling and all sorts of limits from, for selling. How does an exchange like that get back to any sort of normal? Is it possible? You know, I, that's a really hard question, really, to kind of answer um, in that sense. I mean, I know here we did halt um, the three Russian listed stocks, and we have a regulatory oversight ability to kind of look at the markets, but it's, it's kind of hard to gauge um, you know, what that really means. Is there a threshold that you could bring back those, the Russian listed stocks here at the exchange? Well, we just halted, we just halted the trading, and again, market regulation, which is you know, independent, We'll take a look at the facts and circumstances that, you know, at the time to, to make that decision. Understood. Sharon, thank you. It was good to talk to you. Thank you so much Sharon for having me. Thank Chair of you. the New York Stock Exchange. Give you a check of the markets here. We are moving higher, 271 on the Dow, near session highs right now. S&P, a nice 1.1%. Again, technology is in the lead. It's up more than 2%. Materials also going strong. So you've got a mix of, of sort of tech cyclical sectors. The banks are doing a little bit better today, up half a percent. Yields are rising again today. NASDAQ up one and a half percent. BlackRock's Larry Fink warning the war in Ukraine is ushering in the end of globalization. But that call might be a little late. Mike Santoli with a chart to explain why next. And check out some of today's top search tickers on CNBC.com. Ten-year yield back on top where it usually is. Prices go down, yields go up. NVIDIA rising again on the back of its investor day. Look at that, a 9.3% rise. Tesla holds its gains from earlier in the week, up another 1% or so. The Moscow exchange, as I mentioned, finishing higher today. Although a lot of people think that's a charade. And Nikola announcing production up 3.5%. We'll be right back.
Building on the gains up 306 on the Dow. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink saying today the Russia-Ukraine war has put an end to globalization in a letter to shareholders. Mike Santoli taking a closer look at why that call, Mike, might be a little late. It what are you watching? Well, it seems like deglobalization has been a theme for a little bit, a little while. And this proxy for globalization, which is the amount of global trade relative to global GDP, it peaked before the global financial crisis right here, 07, 08. Then, of course, you had the Trump trade war and you had COVID. So all of these things, I think, built upon this idea that we might have seen the peak in this, you know, outsourcing, uh, arbitraging low labor costs around the world, looking to import things as opposed to making them domestically. So. It's fair to argue that the Ukraine war and the commodity disruptions and all the supply chain stuff is accelerating that process and maybe is a more definitive end. But I, I don't think necessarily the markets are uh, caught blindsided by this idea. Well, no, it's, it's just highlighted. First COVID, now this. Yeah. How dependent we are on places like Russia and Ukraine yeah. and China for supply chain. I guess my question is, what are the implications for global growth? Right. If we are, because globalization was considered a boon for growth. Right. It was a boon for growth. It was a force for disinflation around the world uh, and arguably productivity or at least efficiency in corporate operations. So right now it's more about, you know, secure your own supplies, do things domestically, maybe pay wages, uh, pay higher wages uh, and essentially have redundancy in the system as opposed to relying on faraway suppliers to uh, to meet your needs. Take time. Yeah. Like some like time building semiconductor plants yeah. here. Up next, Mike, thanks. Bernstein's Tony Sakanagi weighs in on a report that Apple is developing an iPhone hardware subscription service. How that could impact the stock. On when closing bell comes back, session highs on the markets.
Apple is said to be considering a subscription service for its iPhones and other hardware products. That's according to a new report. This will be a further push into automatically recurring sales for the company. Joining us now is Tony Saganagi, Bernstein Senior Analyst, covers Apple. Tony, vintage 2016, Tony Saganagi note writes about Apple doing, I think, hardware subscriptions, a la Netflix and Spotify. Here it is. We dug it up. Apple as a service. So, so they're finally listening to you, maybe, according to a report. What would it mean for this company? Uh, well, thanks for having me on, Sarah. Look, I, I, you know, back in 2016, Apple was trading at 11 times earnings, and, and the knock on it was that it was a hardware company, and it was cyclical. If you had a good iPhone cycle, things would be good. If you had a bad iPhone cycle, things wouldn't be good. And to the company's credit, they built up a number of subscription and recurring services and products over the ensuing um, you know, five or six years since then. And now the stock's trading at 26 times earnings. So, so good on them. The, the issue is, can they take this further? And Apple is still, there are still investors who worry that there is hardware cyclicality to this, to this company. 2019, 2020 were not great iPhone cycles. Last year, the iPhone 12 was great. So far this year, the iPhone 13 is pretty good. But, but clearly there's a worry always that we could have a poor cycle and Apple's earnings could, could suffer. So if Apple were able to convince more people to have a subscription and basically say, you get an iPhone, we give you a new one every two years, you pay a fixed amount, maybe we throw in additional things like free Apple TV Plus or a discount on iCloud, um, I, I think that could go a long way to smoothing out the financial profile of the company. And that's something that investors love, uh, more predictability and more consistency in terms of revenues and profits. So it would cause you to rethink your rating on the stock? I think you're at a market perform. Where are you? Around, around 170, where we are right now? Correct. So look, we, we've talked in the past about how we would view a widespread and successful services offering as being something that could meaningfully boost the multiple of Apple. And so we would certainly view that positively. You know, the key questions, of course, are how broad can this offering be? I think when we when we thought about it in the past, the question is, could Apple put together a really attractive bundle of a number of different things for a whole household? You know, households are used to paying hundred to two hundred dollars for cable service per month or paying two hundred dollars a hundred to two hundred dollars for internet access per month you know could apple put together a bundle where maybe there's a mac and there's an ipad and there's an iphone and there's icloud and there's apple tv plus and there's apple music and i think the more that apple could put into that bundle much like amazon prime does in terms of not only providing two-day free shipping but obviously having access to video and music. I think the more extensive and more compelling that bundle could be, the more attractive it would be. So the devil's in the detail. We'll see ultimately what Apple does. But if they are able to successfully engage more people in a subscription type model, that's very good for the stock. That's very good for the multiple potentially. We've seen that in so many other stocks that as soon as they go to a subscription model and recurring revenue, it changes the whole multiple. Tony, are you surprised to see how resilient Apple's stock has been? It, it, it's up now, I think, eight days in a row. It's at a five-week high. It's outperformed pretty much all of FANG and, and the NASDAQ lately, given some of the concerns around supply chain with Shenzhen and a COVID lockdown and demand from China and, and everywhere else globally right now with inflation? Right. Great question, Sarah. Look, I, I think those are all considerations, but at the same time, more data is emerging that Apple is having a pretty good iPhone cycle, that supply chain, while still a factor, is less of a factor than it has been uh, over the last two quarters. And in times of uncertainty, people move towards stock, stocks where they have good visibility and when they have attractive cash flow, and, and Apple fits that bill to a T. So it, it is an attractive, you know, in many investors' eyes, an attractive stock at this current time. I think the big question ultimately is, Apple is riding high. It had an incredible year last year. Operating profit dollars went from you know, 68 billion to 110 billion, an enormous, enormous increase. 
And so the question is, did they effectively pull forward demand over ensuing years, and can they keep it up for the next couple of years? But for right now, they're, they're executing very well, and data points generally around the iPhone cycle are good. Up another almost 2% today. Tony Saganagi, thank you for joining us. Thanks for about having 19 me. points to the Dow. Here's where we stand overall in the markets. We are near session highs as we head into the close. The Dow is up almost a full percent, 317 points. The only stocks lower are Nike, Home Depot, Chevron, and Cisco. Every sector in the S&P 500 is higher right now. Technology leads the charge, hence the Nasdaq now almost 1.7 percent gain. Wall Street is buzzing about Uber, turning some foes into friends. And the stock is popping on that news. Details next. And as we had a break, check out Fertilizer stocks, Mosaic and CF Industries hitting multi-year highs again today. Every single day, these stocks hit new highs. Russia is the world's top fertilizer exporter, accounting for 23% of ammonia exports, 14% of urea exports, 10% of phosphate exports, and 21% of phos potash exports, all going into fertilizer. Prices are skyrocketing, and those companies are feeling the impact. We'll be right back. What's Wall Street buzzing about today? Uber teaming up with a bitter rival, New York City Taxis. It's a new agreement to list taxis on its app. Uber expects to launch this new offering later this spring. And under the deal, taxi drivers would get the same fare as Uber drivers. And while there are still some questions about the pay structure, 
The move stands to benefit Uber in a big way. Last year, the company acquired a taxi hailing app in Hong Kong, and according to Uber's global mobility chief, 35% of people who started using the app to hail taxis went on to use other Uber products like food delivery. It's also a creative way around the labor shortage as the company just added a big number of drivers to its fleet. Let's hope it also moderates the sky-high fares that we as consumers are seeing. Uber shares are up on the news. Coming up, NVIDIA shares surging to the top of the S&P 500 today, up more than 9% and more than 30% since last Monday. We'll talk to a top analyst about what's pushing it higher. That story and more next in the Market Zone. And a reminder, we have a podcast. You can listen to Closing Bell on the go by following the Closing Bell podcast on your favorite app. The Dow is up just about 300 points. We are near session highs. Closing Bell back in a moment. Twenty minutes until the close. We are now in the closing bell market zone. CNBC senior markets commentator Mike Santoli here to break down these crucial moments of the trading day. Plus, Cowan's Matt Ramsey on today's big chip rally, a standout. BDA Capital Partners Barbara Duran on the oversold tech names she is buying. But first up, look at this rebound. A big sell off yesterday, and now we're climbing back again. Currently near session highs, gaining steam in this final hour of trade. Back to that old pattern, Mike. And energy is now higher, which means every sector in the market is higher. Some of the other standouts, I mentioned the chips and technology, software names, materials, basically anything tied to commodities except for oil. So steel, Nucor, a lot of the steel names 
higher today. Freeport McMoran, I mentioned the fertilizers as well. What is the narrative, given we're seeing yields continuing to rise? and inflation and Fed concerns continuing to be out there. Yeah, I would say yields continuing to rise, but really modestly today, not too new highs. So we're still in the range. Today's action, the S&P 500, almost exactly just retaking what was lost yesterday. The message to me is markets on firmer footing, a lot less volatile day to day. Last week's uh, options expiration on Friday cleared away a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the overhang, I think, that was causing some of the jumpiness day to day. And of course, once you've had a, an eight, 10 percent rebound off the low, the market is going to be a little bit less twitchy. And I think we're benefiting from that and people are able to wade back in and say what stocks are still down a lot from their highs where the fundamental story hasn't changed very much. So you mentioned the chips, a lot of the other technology leaders in there, Apple's up another, you know, percent or two. So all that stuff seems to be more about people working under the assumption that maybe the market's fever has broken for now, in which case, you know, we're still down six or seven percent from the highs, but seemingly, you know, not as uh, slippery underfoot. Just want to rip up the script for a minute and hit the pot stocks because just in the last few minutes they've taken a leg higher looking at names like Tilray, Aurora, the, the cannabis ETF shooting up just in the last few moments. Some potential news out of Washington, Mike. Is that what's moving these names? What have you heard? It seems in the afternoon, yes. Headlines about the House potentially taking up uh, a proposal to, you know, decriminalize uh, marijuana. So th this has been the story for a very, very long time. Everybody just focused intently in this area on the prospects for some action at the national level. Now, nobody's, I don't think, saying that there's somehow a clear path uh, to a national legalization or, or market opening up there. But I would point out, if you look at a one-year chart, exactly, of the MJ ETF, it looks just like ARC. It looks just like sports betting. It looks just like solar. It looks like a lot of the thematic kind of buzzy groups in the market that really got uh, wild to the upside in early 2021 and then have had a major uh, come up. And so it's coming from a depressed base. Well, we mentioned the chips. NVIDIA is now the best performer in the S&P 500. Check out the Vanex Semiconductor ETF, SMH, up about 4% on the back of strong performances from not just NVIDIA, but AMD. Intel is up more than 6% today. Let's bring in Cowan Semiconductor Analyst Matt Ramsey. Matt, did these names just get beat, beat up too hard? No, Sarah, thanks for having me on. I think it, it is um, kind of interesting to look at. At the beginning of last week, we did a bunch of analysis and some of the best companies that we cover, you mentioned a few, NVIDIA, AMD, Marvell, Monolithic Power, those moved since Thanksgiving down about 30% while the earnings estimates for the out year went up about 10. So we had basically the top companies in growth semis cut in half from a valuation perspective. And I think that's part of, of what we're seeing now is that um, we had some events from NVIDIA earlier in the week to talk about their long-term growth profile. I think investors realizing it. the long-term growth stories haven't really been dented here, but the valuation certainly had been. NVIDIA, with a move today at more than 9%, is that a, you think it's a delayed reaction to the investor day? What did we learn? What was the big takeaway? Yeah, I think the, the, the big three takeaways uh, that, that our team had from the investor day were one, the really strong hardware position NVIDIA is in. They launched their new um, Hopper GPU, which is um, important for all across their businesses, particularly data center. Um, they gave us some hints at expanding, not just to GPUs, but into the, the CPU market with ARM-based CPUs to um, DPUs, which come from their Mellanox acquisition and offering a much, much broader and more diverse set of services to their, to their data center customers. And, the biggest point from the analyst day, they laid out a trillion dollar TAM, which um, take with a grain of salt, but um, Total a, third of it, a third of it was software. And investors really wanted to hear the early innings of their software strategy that they can think they can monetize over the coming decades across um, services into the car in their drive platform, um, the Omniverse into their simulation platform, a bunch of enterprise software features and GeForce Now for over-the-air streaming gaming services. That's a couple hundred million dollars in revenue for NVIDIA today. We forecast it out to, to some really strong growth, of maybe up to 20% uh, of the company, $30 billion business at the end of the decade. So we got some, some breadcrumbs to start modeling a, a software business that can be margin accretive and much more sustainable um, long-term for NVIDIA that's leading in the hardware AI space today. So, so given the, the fact that it's getting into software and it's becoming more software-like, 
What, what kind of valuation does it deserve? Trading about 50 times next year's earnings, which which is higher than some of the other competitors like an AMD, which is all, which have also done well. What sort of premium valuation does Nvidia deserve, and is it is it your favorite pick? It is our top pick as of last week. I mean, the stocks moved 30 percent in I think eight trading days. So uh, we're kind of always reevaluating this stuff. But yeah, it is our it is our top pick currently. AMD and Monolithic Power are the other two in our, our list of three. And I think um, as you, we model business out to 25% earnings growth, give or take, through the end of the decade, driven by uh, uh, all of their businesses. And I think um, the market's assigning the valuation of a company that can take earnings up from 550 or so today towards 30 bucks in earnings by the end of the decade and um, pricing in more of a compounder than something just on near-term earnings power. But there's going to be a material premium assigned to the company, and I think they've earned it. Well, they're all working today, but NVIDIA is up 9.5%. Number two is Intel, up 6.6%. And then Monolithic Power, your other favorite, up 6.5%. Matt Ramsey, thank you, from Cowan. Huh. Lots of news to hit in the EV space today. Nikola shares seeing a pop on news it started production on its commercial truck this week. Remember, it had previously expected to begin full production in the second quarter. Mizuho cutting its price target on Rivian to $95 from $100, saying it could see significant manufacturing headwinds that would impact production ramps. And NIO gearing up to report Q4 results after the bell. Wall Street analysts are expecting the Chinese automaker to post a loss. Let's bring in Phil LeBeau to digest all these headlines. And Phil, these stocks have had a pretty rough start to the year. What are the analysts saying? Have they hit bottom? I think it's too soon, Sarah, to say that it's a definitive bottom, primarily because the supply chain, especially when it comes to things like semiconductors, that's going to remain under pressure for some time. So there's not a lot of certainty there. And remember, when it comes to the EV stocks, there are a lot of questions that will be lingering. This the supply and the pricing of raw materials that go into making battery cells and battery packs. So encouraging news today, no doubt, but still too early to say it's a definitive bottom. Mike, what do, you, what do you see in Tesla's chart, which is which is rising again and holding its gain? It also outperformed yesterday in a down market. I mean, you're seeing the, some of the kind of adrenaline stocks start to move again. I see that's part of it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Tesla has, you know, some good cover stories going forward, obviously, uh, when it seems like the proposition for owning an EV looks a little bit incrementally better relative to internal combustion, given where fuel prices are. But it's always kind of a, it, it's, it's, it's amusing that Tesla can get a bump when it says it's going to build a plant in Germany, then it builds a plant in Germany, it breaks ground, then it says we're about to start producing cars, then one rolls off the line. They get credit each time, uh, and that just shows you that the big picture story is still in control, and the stock did not really go down to serious lows. It's bottomed twice in the 700s, and so it seems like it's more game on as opposed to people having a you know particularly fine-tuned projection on exactly where its market share is going in the next year or two. Phil, where does Tesla stand uh, versus the competition? Some of the smaller ones like a, like a Nikola, which we mentioned, or Rivian, or, or some of the Ford and GMs when it comes to accessing the materials and the battery materials that it needs to make these cars and meet demand. Right. They're far ahead of the competition when it comes to the supply chain. And they've shown that. Look at what happened when the supply chain was stressed because of semiconductors. It hit the others much faster than it hit Tesla because they were very nimble and they made the adjustments there. And when you talk with people in the industry about the EV supply chain, Tesla is ranked almost always near the top in terms of having it under control better than others. Phil Lebeau, Phil, thank you. Want to point out Beyond Meat. It's been volatile in today's session. A pair of headlines moving this stock first. The company announced it has partnered with the Chinese company, Pinduoduo, to launch an online store on the Chinese e-commerce giant's grocery platform. Beyond Meat had previously made deals with JD.com and Chinese e-retailer Tmall as demand for vegan goods in China grows. And then separately, Beyond Meat stock was under pressure earlier after BTIG put out a note saying channel checks it's been doing indicate the sales of the McPlant Beyond offering at McDonald's have underperformed what franchisees were expecting. Mike, the stock is actually a pretty ugly chart if, if you zoom out and look over the last few years. And there are some real questions about whether it's been a fad. Yeah. You know, because everything in grocery worked so well during COVID. And now that we're coming out, a lot of those food sales are, are still elevated. Beyond meat, not so much. No, and whether or not the 
plant-based meat uh, substitutes are a fad? Probably not. I mean, I think that that's always going to be uh, an item in every, you know, uh, grocery case. The issue is the stock, which traded above $230 at one point, you know, two and a half years ago, had almost all, like I said at the time, all the enthusiasm for the entire sector was running through this one ticker because there weren't other options as a pure play. And then there's been a, just a series of, well, maybe they can't figure out production. Their costs are going up even as those for animal protein are going up. And it's just not that much of a kind of immediate uh, gratification of, of sales growth and, and a path toward real profitable sales growth, I think. So that's been the issue. It, it isn't necessarily that people have, you know, tried it and turned away from it. It's that it got too much credit initially for how big it was going to become. It's down about 25% this year. They, they did get a pop earlier when they announced the new jerky product, which was the joint venture between Pepsi and Beyond Meat. A lot of expectations for this. So I, I wonder, we're, we're past the point, Mike, where they're rallying off of the news and it, it feels like you know we were at a point where every time they made a deal with a big cpg company or a restaurant the stock rallied now it's really the proof of how how these partnerships are going in terms of sales because i know there was reports about duncan being underwhelming and now this mcdonald i, I feel like we've gotten point, past the headline excitement Right. I mean, the, the company has done really no, nothing but a, a constant stream of marketing partnerships and, and announcements. And like, what is it? A, you know, it's still a few billion dollar market cap. It's not like it's some, you know, tiny, insignificant company. But, uh, yeah, you need to see results. And people get tired of, of waiting. It's three years as a public company uh, at this point. And, you know, we've moved on to, uh, you know, to other kind of buzzy sounding consumer products. Stocks, I just want to point out, are at session highs. We continue to build on the gains throughout this final hour of trade. Let's bring in Barbara Duran. She is CIO at BD8 Capital Partners. And, Barb, you've been adding to some beaten-down tech positions. Tell us what you've been buying. Yeah, Sarah, thanks. I've been, I've been adding, actually, since February. Um, we know the reasons for the sell-off. Things were oversold. Um, you had people worried about the Ukraine situation, inflation, when is peak inflation, what the Fed is doing. And of course, since the Fed eased, we've been moving in. But when you look at the individual names, you had Amazon, um, Microsoft, um, Alphabet, NVIDIA was just talked about. NVIDIA was down almost 30 percent. And these other names were down in the high teens. And yes, it was a P.E. revaluation because we all know that forward earnings get discounted when interest rates go up, but it was way overdone. And these are great names with each one has an individual story but they go into big, growing, secular markets, and that has not changed. So to me, these were ideal opportunities to add, particularly NVIDIA, which, you know, it's, uh, you've seen what's happened since. It's back actually beyond its, its uh, the start of the year high, but that is exactly why. And I also added um, a few um, reopening plays, and I had talked about Uber another time, or Booking Holdings, which is an online travel play. Mm. And I also wanted a, a good defensive healthcare play, which is a core holding, but I wanted to add to it because that also was down almost 10%, and that's United Healthcare. And that is a solid core holding. You don't get many opportunities to add that cheaper than it, than it currently is. So, Barb, are you not afraid of the Fed go, going all in on the inflation fight, potentially 50, 50 basis points of hikes at, at upcoming <laughs> meetings, a, a hike at every meeting, the trimming of the balance sheet, all the things that it's planning to do which could pressure growth and valuations. Yeah, well, you know what? I, it already It's already in the stocks, and we see how the market's behaving. This is well known. In fact, it was leading up to the Fed meeting where people thought the Fed has to raise rates, has to raise rates, and then they, then they announced that they were. Then the market started to take off. So I think this has been more than discounted in the stocks. You know, we've got six maybe hikes ahead. That could slow things down a little bit, although this is a bit different. In the past, consumers had a lot more debt, and they were borrowing. They're not so much. They still have excess savings. I think where the difference could be, at least in the, for the short term, <clears throat> excuse me, is in housing. You know, because you've seen mortgage rates go up 100 bips. That could cause a little bit of a stutter step, and we've already seen that a bit in the refinancing, et cetera. But we should also remember there, there was a housing boom when mortgage rates, the 30-year, was at 6%. So, you know, I think the consumer is going to keep spending, and I think these companies are going to thrive. And we've seen this for the last couple of years. They, these names are great sources of profit-taking, and you rotate into other names. This time it's been energy. It's been metals. You know, so it's been the cybersecurity. So people have come back to fantastic long-term stories. Every sector higher now in the S&P 500. Technology in the lead, led by the chips. Materials doing very well, tied to commodities, Barb. You mentioned cybersecurity. Those stocks have held, held up well. I think that you're trimming 
your position there, though. Why, why yes. now? Just as, well, just as we're getting all sorts of threats from the White House that, that cyber attacks are coming from Russia. I know. You hate to trim and see it go up even higher, but frankly, it's just a risk management. I mean, I have owned Palo Alto as a core holding in, in uh, all my portfolios for some time, and it was getting to be a very high percentage in some portfolios. So that was why I thought this is a great time to trim, because the stock, you know, will come back down to earth. I think, you know, we've got a little bit, maybe we can go higher, but it's a bit ahead of itself at this moment. So, you know, I'm, but I'm very content. I have uh, large core holdings in this. But as it far as will tech not stay farm, here. <clears throat> yes. I just want to hit it again because the Nasdaq 100 is zooming here. It's up 2%. It's still 12% off of its highs, but it's, it has made up a lot of ground. Now down about 9.5% for the year. So the chart's looking a lot better. You, you mentioned you were buying some of the biggest market cap stocks.